Recorded Books presents an unabridged recording of A Magnificent Catastrophe, the tumultuous election of 1800, America's first presidential campaign, by Edward J. Larson, narrated by Henry Strozier, and directed by Jenny Selig. This book is copyrighted 2007 by Edward J. Larson. This recording is copyrighted 2007 by Recorded Books. The election of 1800 was America's first true presidential campaign, giving birth to our two-party system and indelibly etching the lines of partisanship that have so profoundly shaped American politics ever since. The contest featured two of our most beloved founding fathers, once warm friends, facing off as the heads of their two still-forming parties, the hot-tempered but sharp-minded John Adams, and the eloquent yet enigmatic Thomas Jefferson, flanked by the brilliant tacticians Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr, who later settled their own differences in a duel. But as this contest unfolded, the stakes for this fragile young republic could not have been higher. And now, a magnificent catastrophe. Introduction Independence Day, July 4th, 1776 They could write like angels and scheme like demons. Trained as attorneys, they thoroughly mastered that craft only to turn their formidable legal skills toward statecraft. Both men preferred farming to law or politics, but the year was 1776 and their respective colonies, North America's two most populous British domains, had sent them to Philadelphia as delegates to the Second Continental Congress. When all reasonable hope of reconciliation with Britain expired, the Assembly named them to a special five-member committee charged with drafting a formal Declaration of Independence for the United Colonies. Standing shoulder to shoulder with delegates from the thirteen self-proclaimed sovereign states on that first fourth of July, John Adams of Massachusetts and Thomas Jefferson of Virginia signed the subtly eloquent document that their committee had crafted. Among the delegates, Adams had argued longest and most effectively for independence. Within the committee... Jefferson had taken the lead in writing the Declaration itself. John Trumbull's celebratory painting of the signing ceremony puts Adams and Jefferson front and center, with Benjamin Franklin prominently at their side, and the other two committee members obscurely in the rear. Lanky and lean, with an unruly sandy red mane, Jefferson, at a youthful thirty-three, stood head and shoulders above the balding, rotund, but square-shouldered Adams, then a prematurely old forty. My good man is so very fat, Abigail Adams had written about her husband a decade earlier, and he had only grown stouter with age. Regarding his own portrait, Adams once commented, he should be painted looking like a short, thick archbishop, and writing from Philadelphia in November 1775, had characterized himself as a morose philosopher and a surly politician. These comments expose the inner man. Adams always relished a spirited argument, including with himself, and he inevitably remained his own most astute critic, with his adoring and adored wife a close second. Vanity, he wrote, is my cardinal vice. At over six feet two inches tall, with high cheekbones and deep-set eyes, Jefferson towered over most men of his time even when he slouched, which he often did, especially when seated. Standing, he typically folded his arms tightly across his chest and often had a faraway look. Here, Jefferson's body language betrayed his character as someone who avoided direct confrontation, even with himself. Although Adams's proud combativeness competed with Jefferson's detached coldness in putting off new acquaintances, both men gained the respect of friends and foes alike for their intense self-discipline, studied brilliance, 
and seriousness of purpose. Along with Franklin and George Washington, they were the central figures in the American revolutionary leadership. On that fateful July 4th, John Hancock, speaking as president of the Continental Congress, and the nearest thing to an elected leader for the aligned but not yet amalgamated states, warned his fellow delegates, We must be unanimous. There must be no pulling different ways. We must all hang together. Wise and worldly, Franklin reportedly added, Yes, we must indeed all hang together. Or most assuredly, we shall all hang separately. As always, Franklin's quip carried more than a kernel of truth. In July 1776, the Patriot cause looked bleak. Britain had launched the largest foreign military force in its history against its rebellious American colonies. That force would soon smash the ill-trained and ill-equipped Patriot troops in New York and drive them from the field. Philadelphia could have fallen that same year, sending the delegates running for their lives. It did fall a year later. When signing the Declaration of Independence, Benjamin Harrison darkly joked to Elbridge Gerry, I shall have a great advantage over you, Mr. Gerry, when we are all hung for what we are now doing. From the size and weight of my body I shall die in a few minutes. But from the lightness of your body you will dance in the air an hour or two before you are dead. Harrison, a rotund Virginia planter and direct ancestor of two presidents, and Gary, a slender Massachusetts merchant and future vice president, were family men of substance, not desperate people devoid of hope. The words that Adams spoke and Jefferson wrote in Philadelphia emboldened Americans like Harrison and Gary to take a historic stand, to stake their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor on the cause of freedom. Success or failure turned in large part on how the Patriot leaders responded to the challenges they faced in birthing a nation. For two decades, Adams and Jefferson followed the advice of Hancock and Franklin. They pulled together in war and peace, became friends, and helped to forge a sovereign nation from thirteen dependent colonies. During those fateful years, Adams continued his distinguished service in the Continental Congress, drafted his state's new constitution, joined Franklin as a wartime diplomat in France, and became America's first post-war ambassador to Britain. Although Jefferson left Congress in 1776, he revised Virginia's legal code and served two terms as governor before returning to Congress in 1783 and then joining Franklin and Adams as an American commissioner in Paris. Jefferson became the country's ambassador to France in 1785, after Franklin retired from that post and Adams moved on to London. Returning home as national heroes following the ratification of a new federal constitution in 1788, Adams was elected America's first vice president, and Jefferson became its first secretary of state. The common goals of national independence and sovereignty that united patriot leaders during the revolutionary era gave way to differing views on domestic and foreign policy during Washington's second term as president. After 1797, when Adams succeeded Washington as president and Jefferson became leader of the opposition as vice president, these differences widened into open antagonisms, fed by tensions at home and war abroad. The factions led by Adams and Jefferson crystallized into two distinct political parties with competing visions for America's future. They became the public personifications of the warring camps. By 1800, the remnants of their former friendship had ended in a tangle of mutual suspicions and partisan animosities. Adams and many in his Federalist Party feared that Jeffersonian rule would bring political, social, and religious upheaval. 
Jefferson and his most ardent followers in the Republican Party doubted whether the nation's democratic institutions could survive another four years with Adams at the helm. For both sides, freedom, as they conceived it, hung in the balance. America's two greatest surviving revolutionary leaders had separated, and the country was coming apart. One election took on extraordinary meaning. Partisans worried that it might be the young republic's last. Chapter 1 From Friends to Rivals Although the friendship between Adams and Jefferson took root in Philadelphia during the opening days of the American Revolution, it blossomed in Paris at war's end. Again, the scene included Franklin. For the scene in Philadelphia, John Trumbull created the enduring image of the trio in his monumental painting, The Declaration of Independence. They stood together, seemingly larger than life, at the focal point of attention amid a sea of delegates at the Continental Congress, their purposeful eyes gazing forward as if into the future. A war with Britain lay ahead, and the task of building a new nation. They had changed by the time the war finally ended, and they could begin building on the promise of peace. Already the oldest signer of the Declaration in 1776, Franklin was seventy-eight in 1784, stooped with gout and kidney stones, when Jefferson reached Paris to augment the American diplomatic delegation there. Shortly after declaring the nation's independence, Congress had dispatched Franklin to seek French support for the Revolution. Adams joined him in 1778, and although Franklin had obtained an alliance with France by then, they worked together with a shifting array of American diplomats to secure loans from the Dutch, peace with Britain, and commercial treaties with other nations. Of middling height and decidedly square-shouldered, Adams had added to his girth on a diplomat's diet. Tall for his day, Jefferson had grown into his height by 1784, and typically held himself more upright than before. When the three patriot leaders reunited as diplomats in Paris, the physical contrast between them had become almost comical. Upon making their initial joint appearance at the royal court in Versailles, one bemused observer likened them to a cannonball, a teapot, and a candlestick. America, however, never enjoyed abler representation in a foreign capital. Franklin arrived in France already a celebrity, and enhanced his reputation further while there. Hailed as the Newton of his day for his discoveries in electricity, and renowned also as an inventor, writer, practical philosopher and statesman, Franklin vied only with Voltaire as the public face of the Enlightenment, which then dominated French culture and influenced thought throughout Europe and America. When the two senior savants embraced at a public meeting of the French Academy of Sciences in 1778, it seemed as if all Europe cheered, or so Adams reported with evident envy. Qu'il est toi charmant, he caustically commented in two languages. How charming it was. The sage of Philadelphia became a fixture in the finest salons of Paris, and continued his scientific studies even as he served as America's senior diplomat in Europe. Ladies of the court particularly favored him, and he them which gave Franklin access to the inner workings of pre-revolutionary French society. These activities complemented each other by reinforcing Franklin's already legendary stature. Born in poverty on the edge of civilization, and content to play the part of an American rustic by wearing a bearskin cap in fashion-conscious Paris, Franklin received honors and tributes from across Europe. A gifted diplomat, he secured what America needed from France to win the revolution and secure its independence. 
While in France, Adams always served in Franklin's shadow. At first he accepted the shade. The attention of the court seems most to Franklin, and no wonder. His long and great reputation is enough to account for this, Adams wrote during his first year in Paris. Adding to his aggravation, however, was that Europeans seemingly took pains to distinguish him from his better-known cousin, the revolutionary firebrand Samuel Adams. It was a settled point at Paris and in the English newspapers that I was not the famous Adams, the proud New Englander complained, and therefore the consequence was settled absolutely and unalterably that I was a man of whom nobody ever heard before, a perfect cipher. Gradually Adams turned his rancor on Franklin, which soured their relationship. Except for John Jay, who joined them in negotiating peace with Britain, prior to Jefferson, none of the diplomats sent by Congress to work with Franklin and Adams could bridge the growing divide. The life of Mr. Franklin was a scene of continued dissipation. I could never obtain the favor of his company, Adams observed bitterly. It was late when he breakfasted, and as soon as breakfast was over, a crowd of carriages came to his lodgings, with all sorts of people, some philosophers, academicians, and economists. But by far the greater part were women and children who came to see the great Franklin. Then came formal dinners, parties, and concerts. I should have been happy to have done all the business, or rather all the drudgery, if I could have been favored with a few moments in a day to receive his advice, Adams complained. But this condescension was not attainable. Yet Franklin managed a triumph at every turn, despite, or perhaps because of, his socializing, which rankled the Puritan in Adams. The only respite came in 1779, when, after Franklin secured the alliance with France and became America's sole ambassador to the French court, Adams returned to Massachusetts. He was back in Europe before year's end, however, assigned to work with Franklin and Jay in negotiating peace with Britain. Despite their animosities, Franklin and Adams labored on with amazing success, each putting his nation's interests above his own. Always blunt and sometimes explosive, Adams was an unnatural diplomat at best. The odd couple blend of Franklin's tact and Adams's tirades produced results. The alliance with France held. Britain conceded a generous peace, and America gained and maintained its independence from both of those grasping world powers. Between the two men, however, their personal relationship never recovered. Franklin's characterization of Adams stuck to him like tar and stained him forever. Always an honest man, often a wise one, but sometimes, in some things, absolutely out of his senses. Both men rejoiced in 1784 when Jefferson arrived in Paris to join them in seeking post-war treaties of commerce and friendship with the various European nations. For Franklin, the attraction was obvious, a scientist and philosopher in his own right. Jefferson shared Franklin's enlightenment values and religious beliefs. As fellow deists, they acknowledged a divine creator. But, as Jefferson once wrote, they trusted in the sufficiency of human reason for the care of human affairs. If they prayed for anything from God, it was for wisdom to seek answers, rather than for the answers themselves. Better yet for their relationship, Jefferson accepted Franklin's greatness without a trace of envy. In 1785, when Congress granted Franklin's long-standing request to retire and tapped Jefferson to serve as America's ambassador in Paris, 
the Virginian stressed that he would merely succeed Franklin. No one could replace him. Adam seemed as happy as Franklin to receive Jefferson. His appointment gives me great pleasure, Adams exulted at the time. He is an old friend, in whose abilities and steadiness I always found great cause to confide. Best of all for Adams, Jefferson readily deferred to him and treated him as a senior colleague. Jefferson is an excellent hand, Adams soon wrote. He appears to me to be infected with no party passions or natural prejudices or any partialities but for his own country. Adams highly valued these traits. He accepted a political hierarchy founded on talent and believed in disinterested service by the elite. Jefferson seemed to exemplify these characteristics. Adams now spoke of the utmost harmony that reigned within the American delegation. My new partner is an old friend and coadjutor, whose character I studied nine or ten years ago, and which I do not perceive to be altered. The same industry, integrity, and talents remain without diminution, Adams observed. Although Adams may not have noticed it at first, Jefferson had, however, changed. He now carried his height with dignity and hid his insecurities behind an ever more inscrutable facade. Never as self-confident as Adams, Jefferson learned to ignore the type of slights that often enraged Adams. In 1776, frustrations with public life and concerns about his wife's health led Jefferson to resign from Congress and decline appointment as a commissioner to France. He needed time at his beloved Monticello plantation. Once home, Jefferson reclaimed his seat in the Virginia legislature, worked to reform state laws to foster such Republican values as voting and property rights, the separation of church and state, and public education, and served two troubled one-year terms as governor during the darkest days of the Revolution. After his wife, Martha, died following a difficult childbirth in 1782, Jefferson agreed once more to represent Virginia in Congress, and two years later accepted the renewed offer to represent America in Paris. With his wife gone, he needed to leave Monticello as much as he once needed to be there. He grieved for her greatly and kept the vow purportedly made by him to her on her deathbed, never to remarry. During the week that Jefferson arrived, Adams's wife and three younger children joined Adams and their two older children in Paris after five painful years of separation. The Adamses welcomed the lonely Virginian into their happy home. For Jefferson, Abigail Adams became a trusted source of personal and family advice from a woman who was his intellectual equal. She also took Jefferson's two surviving children under her wing at times. He reciprocated in a manner that led John Adams to comment later to Jefferson that in Paris, young John Quincy appeared to me to be almost as much your boy as mine. Upon Adams's departure from Paris in 1785 to become the first American ambassador to Britain, Abigail expressed her regret about leaving Jefferson, whom she described as the only person with whom my companion could associate with perfect freedom and unreserve. To Adams, Jefferson wrote, The departure of your family has left me in the dumps. My afternoons hang heavy on me. With both Franklin and Adams gone, however, Jefferson came into his own as the leading American diplomat on the European continent. Immersing himself in French culture as Adams never did, he became attached to the French people and hoped for their freedom from monarchic despotism and Catholic clericalism. I do love this people with all my heart and think that with a better religion and a better form of government, their condition and country would be most enviable, Jefferson wrote to Abigail Adams in 1785. 
The French royals, personified by some by the debauched Queen Marie Antoinette, and many French aristocrats and church leaders lived in splendid isolation from the grinding poverty of the forgotten masses. For a time, the friendship between Adams and Jefferson survived their separation. In 1787, for example, after Jefferson's closest political ally and confidant in Virginia, James Madison, questioned Adams's character, Jefferson, while conceding Adams's vanity and irritability, replied, He is so amiable that I pronounce you will love him if ever you become acquainted with him. Two years later, Adams concluded a letter to Jefferson with the words, I am with an affection that can never die, your friend and servant. At heart, however, it was a friendship between political allies fixed in time and place. In both Philadelphia and Paris, Adams and Jefferson represented similar or the same interests far from home and did so with extraordinary passion and ability. This united them. As their political goals for America diverged, however, their ideological zeal drove them apart. These were serious, ambitious men with deep beliefs and grand ideas. Whenever and wherever their paths crossed, Adams and Jefferson were destined to become either fast friends or formidable foes. During their early lives in the mid-1700s, no one could have guessed that the paths of Adams and Jefferson would ever cross, much less assume overlapping courses during the late 1700s and then collide in 1800. Prior to the coming of the American Revolution, the northern and southern colonies might as well have occupied separate continents. A Virginian and a New Englander even two such cosmopolitan lawyers as Adams and Jefferson, would have little occasion to meet each other, except perhaps in London on imperial business. Instead, they met in Philadelphia at the Second Continental Congress in 1775 with the shared goal of freeing the colonies from Britain's yoke. Their ambitions for themselves and their new nation became the basis for their special friendship. Ambition marked these men. Both were the first sons in rising families at a time when social custom and inheritance law placed special opportunities and obligations on the eldest male heir. Jefferson's industrious father had greatly expanded the family's land and slave holdings in central Virginia, and passed them to his eldest boy along with a lively intellect, a craving for material possessions, and a fierce streak of independent self-reliance. Adams's father was also driven, but in a pious Puritan sense, that pushed him to expand his modest Massachusetts farm, accept positions of trust within his local church and community, and sacrifice to send his firstborn son to Harvard College, with a hope that through formal education— the son could outshine the father in every good and virtuous endeavor. Like his father, Adams tried to live well within his means. Indeed, he enjoyed nothing more than being with his family and smoking a good cigar, both of which he did as often as he could. Adams and Jefferson drank in their father's ambitions and made them their own. Reputation ought to be the perpetual subject of my thoughts and the aim of my behavior, Adams chided himself in his diary, while still a young lawyer in 1759. He soon wrote to a friend, I am not ashamed to own that a prospect of an immortality in the memories of all the worthy to the end of time would be a high gratification to my wishes. To achieve this goal, he devoted himself to study far beyond the requirements of his profession. Indeed, few colonists of his day could boast of as deep or broad a legal education as Adams's, except perhaps Thomas Jefferson. At the College of William and Mary, Jefferson chose study over social life, in a manner wholly foreign to the convivial spirit of that place 
as a finishing school for the planter elite. He could tear himself away from his dearest friends and fly to his studies, one classmate recalled. Others estimated that Jefferson worked fifteen hours a day. He wanted to learn the law, Jefferson admitted, so that he would be admired. Simply becoming a lawyer and planter was not enough, however, because he continued his bookish studies long after passing the bar and inheriting his father's plantation. Indeed, in 1767, he counseled a young lawyer about the advantage of ongoing study and recommended reading science and theology before breakfast, the law during the forenoon, politics at lunch, history in the afternoon, and literature, criticism, and rhetoric from dark to bedtime. Jefferson imposed just such a regimen on himself as a young lawyer, and continued a disciplined program of self-education throughout his long life. Determined never to be idle, no person will have occasion to complain of want of time who never loses any. It is wonderful how much may be done if we are always doing, he wrote to his daughter Martha in 1787. A mind always employed is always happy. As young lawyers, the greatest challenge faced by Adams and Jefferson lay in gaining sufficient scope for their ambitions. No American colony could provide a suitable stage to display their talents, and the British Empire offered only bit parts to colonial actors. Thinking back in later life about their prospects as ambitious young men, both Adams and Jefferson recall that initially they could conceive of no higher positions for themselves than appointment to the King's Council, or Senate, for their respective colonies. Perhaps that fed their disillusionment with the imperial regime. They wanted so much more than the king would allow his colonists. Vain to a fault, Adams never hid his ambitions. In 1760, for example, before the first stirrings of the American Revolution, he wrote prophetically to a friend, When heaven designs an extraordinary character— one that shall distinguish his path through the world by any great effects. It never fails to furnish the proper means and opportunities. But the common herd of mankind, who are to be born and eat and sleep and die and be forgotten, is thrown into the world, as it were, at random. Adam saw himself in the former class, as did Jefferson. But colonial America could not offer him a proper means to glory. Not content with waiting upon heaven to supply the means, Adams examined his options. How shall I gain reputation? he wrote in a 1759 diary entry. Shall I patiently build my law practice? Or shall I look out for a cause to speak to, and exert all the soul and all the body I own to cut a flash? In short, shall I walk a lingering heavy pace, or shall I take one bold, determined leap? He chose to leap. In 1765, new stamp taxes on newspapers and other printed matter, imposed by Britain solely on American colonists, gave Adams his first chance to attach himself to a larger cause. He began testing his revolutionary rhetoric, by denouncing the new taxes as fabricated by the British Parliament for battering down all the rights and liberties in America. This assault appeared in Adams's private diary, however. Although he met frequently with patriot leaders and drafted stern instructions from his town to the colonial legislature condemning taxation without representation, Adams mostly pulled his punches in public, or published his words anonymously, perhaps in part to protect his growing legal practice. When Britain repealed the repressive levy in response to widespread colonial protests, Adams envied the glory heaped upon more visible patriots, including his fiery cousin Samuel. 
By the time of the Townsend Duties Crisis in 1768, which erupted after Britain imposed added tariffs on American imports, Adams wrote privately that his legal career will neither lead me to fame, fortune, or power, nor to the service of my friends, clients, or country. Determined to make his mark, increasingly he became the public leader of the Patriot cause in Massachusetts, through his writings, speeches, and government service. He became an early advocate of independence, at a time when most Americans still thought that they could work out their differences with Britain amicably. In comparison with his public service, the private practice of law became a desultory life for Adams. He called it dull, tedious, and irksome. Jefferson gradually reached the same conclusion as Adams about the law and his career. He privately dismissed legal literature as mere jargon as early as 1763, and abandoned his law practice altogether in 1774, after receiving a sizable inheritance following his father-in-law's death. Almost immediately, Jefferson emerged within the Virginia colonial legislature as a prominent critic of British rule. He had a bearing and intellectual depth that commanded respect, even awe. Drawing on their years of training and practice, Adams and Jefferson turned from defending private clients to prosecuting the American Revolution. They had found their path to glory and a stage equal to their ambitions and abilities. The United States of America Adams went to the First Continental Congress in 1774 as a committed proponent of independence. Jefferson joined him a year later at the Second Continental Congress, which met continuously during the American Revolution. They shared a resolve to break with the mother country, making them staunch allies. Their kindred spirits, at once philosophical and practical, also made them friends who could converse and conspire in confidence. In Congress, both men quickly gained the respect and influence that naturally flows to members with firm convictions, superior intelligence, and an ability to persuade others. Although Jefferson spoke little in formal sessions of Congress, Adams recalled that from their first encounters he found the Virginian so prompt, frank, explicit, and decisive upon committees and in conversation, that he soon won my heart, almost like a younger brother or an adult son. Together they pushed and prodded their fellow delegates to accept the inevitability of independence. First, Congress adopted as its own the New England Militia, besieging the British Army in Boston following the battles of Lexington and Concord. Then Adams led the effort to further nationalize these patriot troops by placing George Washington, a Virginian, in overall command. Finally, after the five-member drafting committee delegated the job of crafting the Declaration of Independence to the two men, Adams asked Jefferson to pen the first draft, again hoping to bind the South to the patriot cause. The Virginian succeeded brilliantly in that task, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable, that all men are created equal and independent, that from that equal creation they derive rights inherent and unalienable, among which are the preservation of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these ends governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government shall become destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. Although the committee and Congress made various changes to Jefferson's text, the soaring words and lyrical structure survived. Adams could not have written a first draft more suited to his views. Indeed, the visionary affirmation that all men are created equal sounded more like the words of a Massachusetts Puritan 
than those of a Virginia slaveholder. The expansive pursuit of happiness passage, however, was pure Jefferson. The British political philosopher John Locke had spoken of natural rights to life, liberty, and property. But the pursuit of happiness struck Jefferson as so much nobler than simply the acquisition of property, even though Jefferson himself had an insatiable appetite for physical possessions. Indeed, Jefferson's words often soared beyond his actions, leading to enigmatic inconsistencies in his personality that some saw as hypocritical. Their work together in Philadelphia for a Declaration of Independence had scarcely ended when Adams and Jefferson parted company. In September 1776, Jefferson left Congress to be with his ailing wife and young children in Virginia. There he threw himself into efforts to liberalize the state's aristocratic legal code and to end state support for the Anglican Church. He declined the first summons from Congress to serve with Franklin in France, writing to the senior statesman in 1777, I wish my domestic situation had rendered it possible for me to have joined you in the very honorable charge confided to you. Jefferson fully appreciated the importance of that charge. Securing French support for America's revolution would likely decide the war's outcome. After refusing that call, Adams begged Jefferson to return to Congress. We want your industry and abilities here extremely, he wrote in May 1777. Your country is not yet quite secure enough to excuse your retreat to the delights of domestic life. Still, Jefferson remained at home. Adams ultimately served in France in Jefferson's stead arriving after Franklin had secured the needed military alliance. Jefferson joined them there in 1784. After Franklin returned home in 1785, for the next three years, Adam served in London and Jefferson in Paris as America's two ranking foreign diplomats. It was a particularly difficult time to serve the country abroad. America had secured its political independence with the signing in 1783 of a peace treaty with Britain. Under the Articles of Confederation, the country remained a loose confederation of states, however, until ratification of the Constitution in 1788. Without an effective national government to represent, Adams and Jefferson could accomplish little. Although they secured a critically needed loan from Dutch bankers, Britain refused to honor its treaty obligation with the United States to evacuate its forts in the Great Lakes region, and France descended toward revolutionary turmoil. After generations of oppression, and with the government on the verge of bankruptcy, the people of France arose against their leaders with unexpected violence. Tensions continued between the United States and its former colonial master. America's recent ally, France, could no longer offer any effective assistance. America stood alone in a hostile world, and neither Adams nor Jefferson could do much about it as ambassadors. From their posts in Europe, they watched during 1787 through 88 as delegates to the Constitutional Convention framed and the states ratified the new national charter. Success remained in doubt until the end. Concerns over representation in Congress divided the small and large states. The issue of slavery already split north from south. The convention repeatedly bogged down in factional strife, and the ratification process became highly contentious in some states. Concerns about the document reached Americans in Europe and were avidly debated there. Jefferson feared that the Constitution gave too much power to the president, who was chosen by electors. Adams worried that it gave too much power to the Senate, whose members were appointed by the state legislatures. Both thought that it should include a Bill of Rights. You are afraid of the one, I the few, 
Adams wrote to Jefferson in 1787. We agree perfectly that the many should have full, fair, and perfect representation. You are apprehensive of monarchy, I of aristocracy. Despite their reservations about the compromise document that emerged from the divided convention, Adams urged that Massachusetts ratify it while Jefferson expressed his qualified support for ratification in Virginia. Having seen what he perceived as the benefits of strong monarchies in Europe, Adams thought that only an effective central government, led by a powerful president, could forge a stable, secure nation from a multitude of weak, wrangling states. He supported the new Constitution as a means toward that end and therefore gained prominence among those proponents of ratification and a strong national government who called themselves Federalists. Jefferson, in contrast, saw representative democracy and states' rights as the bulwarks of liberty, as against the potential corruption and tyranny of a powerful executive, and he stressed those aspects of the new constitutional union. Although Jefferson did not oppose ratification, he became a leading voice within the faction that included both anti-federalists who had opposed ratification and more moderate critics of a strong national government. Collectively, its members became known as Republicans, or later, Democrats. These differences in emphasis and constitutional interpretation between Adams and Jefferson sharpened as the government took shape following ratification. As patriot leaders representing differing factions within the broad constitutional consensus, both men returned to America and took leadership positions in the new government. Serving under President Washington, Adams was elected vice president, and Jefferson was named secretary of state. Together with others, they endeavored to form a unity government embracing a broad spectrum of Federalist Republican opinion. They were convinced that well-meaning leaders could draw together in establishing the Union, just as they had once united to fight for independence. Based on their wartime experience of suppressing political differences for the common good, the new government's leaders uniformly condemned factionalism and opposed the formation of political parties. Individuals in Congress and the executive branch should address each issue on its merits, they thought, rather than take partisan positions. For this reason, despite their growing differences, Adams and Jefferson tried to get along. Upon hearing of Adams's election as vice president, Jefferson warmly congratulated him. No man on earth pays more cordial homage to your worth, nor wishes more fervently your happiness. Adams, in turn, hailed Jefferson's appointment as the first Secretary of State. The differences dividing Adams and Jefferson reflected a deepening ideological rift that divided mainstream Americans into factions. As the nascent government took shape under the Constitution, the people and their chosen representatives vigorously debated various issues regarding the authority of the national government and the balance of power among its branches and between it and the states. Whether the national government could charter a bank and thus create a national banking system became especially heated, for example. Many doubted if the new national government would long survive. Adams and those calling themselves Federalists saw a strong central government led by a powerful president as vital for a prosperous, secure nation. Extremists in this camp, like Alexander Hamilton, who favored transferring virtually all power to the national government and consolidating it in a strong executive and aristocratic senate, became known as the ultra- or high federalists. At the Constitutional Convention, Hamilton had unabashedly depicted the monarchical British government as the best in the world, and famously proposed life tenure for the United States President and Senators. Jefferson and his emerging Republican faction 
viewed such thinking as inimical to freedom. A devotee of Enlightenment science, which emphasized reason and natural law over revelation and authoritarian regimes, Jefferson trusted popular rule and distrusted elite institutions. Indeed, like French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Jefferson instinctively revered man in nature. Those who labor in the earth, such as farmers and frontiersmen, possess substantial and genuine virtue, he wrote in his 1787 book, Notes on the State of Virginia. The will of the majority, the natural law of every society, is the only sure guardian of the rights of men, Jefferson affirmed three years later. He instinctively favored the people over any institution. In contrast, Adams and the Federalists tended to distrust the common people, and instead to place their faith in the empowerment of what they saw as a natural aristocracy, though one that should be restrained by civil institutions, such as those provided by a written constitution, with checks and balances. The voice of the people has been said to be the voice of God, and however generally this maxim has been quoted and believed, it is not true. Hamilton reportedly told the Constitutional Convention regarding a popularly elected legislature. The people are turbulent and changing. They seldom judge or determine right. Give, therefore, to the first or upper house a distinct permanent share in the government. They will check the unsteadiness of the second or lower house. Although more moderate in his federalism than Hamilton, but still unlike the Republican Jefferson. Adams thought that every nation needed a single strong leader who could rise above and control self-interested factions of all classes and types. Neither an aristocratic Senate nor a democratic House of Representatives would safeguard individual rights, he believed. Indeed, Adams once complained to Jefferson about the avarice, the unbounded ambition, and the unfeeling cruelty of a majority in those in all nations who are allowed an aristocratic influence, and the stupidity with which the more numerous multitude not only become their dupes, but even love to be taken in by their tricks. Only a disinterested chief executive, the fabled philosopher king of old, would protect liberty and justice for all. Adams thus combined a Calvinist view of humanity's innate sinfulness with an Old Testament faith that a Moses-like leader could guide even such a fallen people through the wilderness into the promised land of freedom. Due to these beliefs, Adams supported a strong American presidency. Although Adams always preferred an elected supreme leader to a hereditary one, his thinking leaned too much toward monarchism for Jefferson to stomach, especially when others in positions of power around Adams, most notably Alexander Hamilton, openly praised the balanced British Constitution with its hereditary House of Lords, representative House of Commons, and still powerful King. As Washington's Treasury Secretary, Hamilton pushed a centralizing pro-business program of internal taxes, protective tariffs, a national bank, and close trading ties with Britain. He viewed them as essential for national power, prestige, and prosperity. Jefferson opposed all these policies as destructive of individual liberty and equality of opportunity. Even more, he feared that they would undermine popular rule by creating an aristocracy of wealth in America, a homegrown elite. He did not want the United States simply to become a better Britain, with its concentrated wealth and power. He dreamed of something new under the sun in America, a land of free, prosperous farmers and workers. His support for their rights was staunch and heartfelt. The differences between Adams and Jefferson became clear in their responses to Shays' Rebellion, a widely publicized anti-government protest in Adams's home state of Massachusetts.
1786, hundreds of western Massachusetts farmers, led by Revolutionary War officer Daniel Shays, briefly took arms against high taxes and strict foreclosure laws during the economic recession that followed the American Revolution. Massive deflation threatened these protesters with the loss of their property and jobs, while the state government only made matters worse for them by raising taxes to repay bondholders for Revolutionary-era debts. When news of the uprising reached him in Paris, Jefferson used a metaphor from science to convey his reaction in a letter to Abigail Adams, who was then in London with her husband. I like a little revolution now and then. It is like a storm in the atmosphere, Jefferson wrote. She was horrified. Speaking for herself and probably her husband, she told Jefferson her views on Shays' rebellion in no uncertain terms. Ignorant, restless desperados, without conscience or principles, have led a deluded multitude to follow their standard under pretense of grievances which have no existence but in their imaginations. Jefferson came to see the episode as significant. From his post in London, John Adams did not sufficiently appreciate the protesters' dire plight, Jefferson later wrote. He feared that Adams took the uprising to mean that even the absence of want and oppression was not a sufficient guarantee of order against popular revolts stirred by a demagogue. This disagreement over Shays' rebellion, however mild it seemed at the time, began to fray the relationship between Jefferson and the Adamses. It was a foretaste of the bitter divisions to come. The divisions between Adams and Jefferson were exasperated by the more extreme views expressed by some of their partisans, particularly the high Federalist led by Hamilton, on what was becoming known as the political right, and the so-called Democratic wing of the Republican Party on the left, associated with New York Governor George Clinton and Pennsylvania legislator Albert Gallatin, among others. Proud of his humble origins, Adams always had reservations about Hamilton's elitist agenda. He particularly questioned the wisdom of a national bank, and never warmed to Britain. Those reservations were lost on Jefferson, however, who reacted against the whole and all of its parts. Adams supported the basic outlines of the Federalist program, and Jefferson resented it. By 1792, Madison, who always acted on Jefferson's behalf in such matters, was calling for a Republican Party to oppose Hamilton and the Federalists. For his part, Adams never thought Jefferson did enough to restrain the extreme Democrats among his supporters. On both sides, the outlines of party organizations emerged in the rise of partisan newspapers, the coordination of voting by members of Congress, and party endorsements for political candidates. Washington and Adams were not the primary targets of the Republicans, but they came under fire to the extent that they supported Hamilton's projects. The Republicans embraced policies that favored popular sovereignty, individual freedoms, low taxes, farms over factories, and a limited national government. During the next three decades, the party's name would evolve from Republican into Democratic, leaving the former label for a later indirect descendant of the Federalist faction. Adams's actions as vice president unwittingly further fed Jefferson's fears that the Federalist would subvert democracy. In 1789, Adams urged Congress to confer a regal title on the president, such as His Most Benign Highness, or better yet, simply Majesty, which Jefferson dismissed as the most superlatively ridiculous thing I ever heard of. Expressing his Republican sentiments, Jefferson added, I hope the terms of Excellency, Honor, Worship, and Esquire forever disappear from among us. 
Then, in 1790 through 91, Adams published Discourses on Davila, a series of historical essays warning against the dangers of human passion and unchecked democracy. They raised Adams's standing with high Federalists, but lowered it among Republicans. In the final essay, he attributed the persistence of monarchism in almost all the nations on the earth to the failings of popular rule. They had tried all possible experiments of elections of governors and senates, Adams wrote, but found so many rivalries among the principal men, such divisions, confusions, and miseries, that they had almost unanimously been convinced that hereditary succession was attended with fewer evils than frequent elections. Adams's words seemed to support a British-type system, in which only the legislative lower house was elected. Certainly Jefferson read them that way. Mr. Adams had originally been a Republican, Jefferson later wrote, the glare of royalty and nobility during his missions to England had made him believe their fascination a necessary ingredient in government. Jefferson engaged Adams privately about the essays, freely calling him a heretic to his face for the anti-Republican sentiments expressed in them. A strong presidency, independent of checks imposed by the elected House of Representatives, inevitably threatened democracy, Jefferson argued, especially if the president took on regal heirs. A hereditary monarch was much worse. Adams maintained that the essays simply chronicled the European experience. They did not endorse an American king. The dispute went public when Thomas Paine's blistering defense of radical democracy in revolutionary France, the rights of man, appeared in the United States in April 1791. It bore an endorsement from Jefferson expressing his pleasure that something is at length to be publicly said against the political heresies which have sprung up among us. Politicians read Jefferson's words as a direct assault on Adams's Davila, which they were. A published attack by the Secretary of State on the Vice President threatened to split the administration and clearly irritated Washington. Jefferson apologized for the public affront by saying that he never intended or expected his endorsement to appear in print. Of course, I had in my view discourses on Davila, and Adams's apostasy to hereditary monarchy and nobility. Jefferson explained in a letter to the President. But I am sincerely mortified to be thus brought forward on the public stage. To Adams, Jefferson wrote, that you and I differ in our ideas of the best form of government is well known to both of us. But we have differed as friends should do, respecting the purity of each other's motives and confining our differences of opinion to private conversation. In his response, Adams formally accepted Jefferson's apology, but protested that the damage to his reputation had already been done. The friendship, which has subsisted for fifteen years between us without the slightest interruption, and until this occasion without the slightest suspicion, ever has been and still is very dear to my heart, Adams wrote. In fact, it was all but over. The long-time friends had become political rivals. During the early 1790s, a raging and widespread war between royalists and republicans in Europe greatly intensified these partisan tensions in America, which further strained the relationship between Adams and Jefferson. The European war had its roots in the violent fall of the monarchy and rise of republican rule in France, which sent tremors through the royal houses of Europe. France's absolutist ancien regime began to totter in 1788 with the calling of a legislative assembly for the first time in over 150 years. Every French king since Louis XIV 
had claimed absolute power, but an unprecedented financial crisis, caused in part by helping to fund the American Revolution, forced Louis XVI to convene the Old Estates General in order to obtain its consent to raise new taxes. This body consisted of three branches, one each for nobles, clerics, and commoners, with the consent of all three needed to institute any meaningful reforms. The commoners had distinct grievances against the government, however, with the largely disenfranchised masses suffering under heavy taxes and often living in abject poverty following a series of poor harvests. Soon after it convened, the commoners' third estate declared itself the sole legislative authority in France, and absorbing the other two estates, renamed itself the National Assembly. At first, members of the other two estates resisted, but violent protests in support of the commoners and the threat of a nationwide popular insurrection forced the nobles, the clerics, and the king to comply. The army could not control the protesters, and in some places actually sided with the people. A revolution was clearly underway, even if the extent of it remained in doubt. The king had lost his claim to absolute power, and many sensed that the nobility and established church were vulnerable as well. Ineptly, Louis XVI began playing the various sides against the others in an effort to survive as a limited monarch. On hand as the American ambassador in Paris, Jefferson welcomed these developments despite the worsening violence. The revolution of France has gone on with the most unexampled success hitherto, he blithely wrote to Madison in May 1789 after hundreds had died in mass protests and military reactions in Paris and other cities. Countless thousands more were dying from starvation and disease as the economy collapsed under the stress of political disorder and repeated poor harvests. Some of the riots started out as nothing more than mass cries for food from government granaries, then ended in slaughter as troops attacked and protesters reacted. The Queen's alleged response to the masses pleading for bread, let them eat cake, would seal her fate. She never uttered the famous phrase, but it fit her popular image, and rumors that she said it circulated widely at the time. Jefferson remained in Paris long enough to witness the fall of the Royal Bastille prison to the revolutionaries on July 14, 1789. They took all the arms— discharged the prisoners, and carried the prison's governor and lieutenant governor to the Greve, the place of public execution, cut off their heads, and set them through the city in triumph, Jefferson wrote excitedly in his official report. The decapitation of Governor de Launay worked powerfully through the night on the whole aristocratical party, insomuch that in the morning those of the greatest influence— accepted the absolute necessity that the king should give up everything. Impressed by this popular uprising, Jefferson contributed to the fund for the families of those slain storming the Bastille. He naively predicted that a constitutional monarchy respecting individual rights would quickly emerge from the ashes of absolutist rule. Jefferson believed that nobles and clerics would readily relinquish power to the people, and he personally urged his friends in the aristocracy to do so. Viewing events through the lens of the American Revolution, Jefferson saw only better times ahead for France. We cannot suppose this paroxysm confined to Paris alone, he noted. The whole country must pass successively through it and happy if they get through it as soon and as well as Paris has done. To Madison, Jefferson added, This scene is too interesting to be left at present. His daughters had grown, however, and he wanted to take them home. Upon arriving with them in America late in 1789, and still planning to return to France without them, he learned that Washington had named him the first Secretary of State. Jefferson never again left the country. 
As Secretary of State, Jefferson continued steadfastly to side with the revolutionaries in France, even as violence there spiraled out of control. Priests were massacred or driven from the realm for their loyalty to the Roman Catholic Church. Nobles fled too, and their property was confiscated. Protesters fell by the thousands in military reactions. In 1792, partisans pulled Jefferson's friend, the reform-minded Duc de la Rochefoucauld, from his coach and killed him, in full view of his mother and wife. Nevertheless, in 1793, Jefferson wrote of the revolution in France, The liberty of the whole earth was depending on the issue of the contest, and was ever such a prize won with so little innocent blood. My own affections have been deeply wounded by some of the martyrs to this cause, but rather than it should fail, I would have seen half the earth desolated." He saw the scene much like the English romantic poet William Wordsworth depicted it. France standing on the top of golden hours, and human nature seeming born again. It was a bloody birth. In contrast, the events in France horrified Federalists in the United States. Growing ever more radical and powerful, the French National Assembly reconstituting itself first as the Legislative Assembly, and then as the Convention under successive constitutions, took command of the armed forces, nationalized the Church, abolished noble titles and privileges, and made the King virtually its prisoner, holed up and under growing threat first at Versailles, and then, by the Assembly's command, at the Tuileries Palace in Paris. Of the Assembly and its impact on France, Hamilton wrote, It has served as the engine to subvert all her ancient institutions, civil and religious, with all the checks that serve to mitigate the rigor of authority. Royalist regimes in Europe, led by Prussia and Austria, responded to these developments by invading France in 1791 to restore the old order. The invasion served only to radicalize the assembly still further and precipitate a vicious counterattack. The French people rallied to defend their nation even if they did not otherwise support the revolution. After riding the whirlwind of revolution for four years, Louis XVI fell from his increasingly titular post as king after fleeing the besieged Tuileries Palace on August 10, 1792 paving the way for the convention to impose republican rule on France six weeks later. Citizen Louis Capet, as the revolutionaries delighted in calling the former king, was imprisoned in the temple fortress by the radical Paris Commune, along with his widely despised wife, Marie Antoinette. I'll tell you what, John Adams reportedly commented, the French Republic will not last three months. Although proved wrong, Adams's prediction surely expressed the hope of many in his party, some of whom favored revising the Constitution to provide a constitutional monarchy for the United States. Inspired by Republican visions of liberty, equality, and fraternity, the French armies pushed back invading royalist forces and began spreading democracy to neighboring lands at gunpoint. On this day began a new era in the history of the world. German philosopher Johann Wolfgang von Goethe famously wrote, after watching French Republican forces rout Prussian imperial troops at Valmy in France on September 20th, 1792. After he heard of the battle, Jefferson exulted, our news from France continues to be good, and promises a continuance. The extent of the revolution there is now little doubted of, even by its enemies. Jefferson had hardly written these words before the convention tried and guillotined the former king, closed Christian churches, and conscripted the entire population into the war effort. Although the revolutionary government had already nationalized the Catholic Church in France, 
and deported or killed priests who would not swear their allegiance to the new order, radicals in the convention still feared churches as rallying points for reactionaries. Soon the former queen followed her husband to the scaffold. A new constitution proposed limiting private property and enshrining the right of revolution. By mid-1793, the convention's most radical faction, the Jacobins, assumed control. Pressed by opponents from within and without, Jacobins instituted a reign of terror to purge France of counter-revolutionaries. Thousands died in public executions, often on mere suspicion of disloyalty, including many of the leading revolutionaries themselves. The differing views of Federalists and Republicans in America regarding the bloody course of events in France made any attempt at nonpartisan governance by the Washington administration virtually futile. Bitter domestic disputes over national power, informed as they now were by analogies to the affairs in Europe, worsened the situation. By the end of Washington's first term in 1793, the unity government that he had so carefully assembled lay in shambles. Jefferson and Hamilton fought privately for influence within the administration, while their respective factions battled openly in Congress and the press. As vice president, Adams played virtually no part in executive branch deliberations, and was silenced in the Senate, over which he presided, by a new rule limiting debate to senators. Adams grew increasingly distant from both Jefferson and Hamilton, whom he viewed as grasping rivals for power. He had also learned, to his dismay, that Hamilton had secretly discouraged some electors from voting for him in the first presidential election, a slight that Adams neither forgot nor forgave. Jefferson and Hamilton soon resigned from the cabinet, but Hamilton— with a stronger stomach for direct confrontation, stayed long enough to fill the still-forming executive branch with his followers. Though a more moderate revolutionary government in France relaxed the terror in July 1794, as Washington's second term progressed, international tensions continued to dominate partisan debate in the United States. In Europe, France's armies pushed the offense especially after the rise in the mid-1790s of a young Corsican general, Napoleon Bonaparte. Britain joined the European alliance against France, and with their far-flung empires drawn into the inferno, the whole world seemed at war. None can deny that the cause of France has been stained by excesses, Hamilton observed at the time. Yet many find apologies and extenuations with which they satisfy themselves. They still see in the cause of France the cause of liberty. Others, on the contrary, discern no adequate apology for the horrid and disgusting scenes which have been and continue to be acted. Jefferson fit in the former camp. Hamilton placed himself in the latter one. For many Christians... Jefferson's sympathy for Jacobin assaults on organized religion compounded the suspicions raised by his deist beliefs. Hamilton and the Federalists repeatedly warned that Republican rule might lead to similar attacks on churches in America. The specter of militant Jacobin anticlericalism turned religion into a heated partisan issue in American politics. Although many Federalists favored Britain and the Royalist Alliance, while most Republicans supported France and its allies, virtually all Americans hoped that their country could remain neutral in the European conflict and continue trading with both sides. That would prove a great challenge. Europe's leading imperial powers, Britain and France, had fought off and on for over a century. But ideological differences and France's military aggression now increased the bitterness of the battle. Both sides demanded support from other nations, and retaliated against those that refused aid. Washington tried to maintain American neutrality. But following Jefferson's resignation as Secretary of State in 1793, 
his administration increasingly came under the control of Hamilton's pro-British High Federalists. Although suspicious of Britain's designs on the United States, Adams abhorred the revolutionary regime in France and did little to right the balance. After stepping down as Secretary of State, Jefferson continued working privately with Madison and a growing interstate network of Republicans to oppose the high Federalist pro-Britain, pro-business policies. Although Jefferson claimed to want out of public life, Adams saw his retirement from the cabinet differently. Jefferson thinks by this step to get a reputation as an humble, modest, meek man, wholly without ambition or vanity. He may even have deceived himself in this belief, Adams noted at the time. But if the prospect opens, the world will see and he will feel that he is as ambitious as Oliver Cromwell, who usurped royal authority during the English Civil War. When Madison followed Jefferson into early retirement, Adams added, It seems the mode of becoming great is to retire from public scrutiny, upon the same principle that no man is a hero to his wife or valet de chambre. Jefferson and Madison so actively organized and led the Republican reaction to Hamilton's programs that Federalists began calling them the Generalissimo and General of the Opposition. Adding to the tension, British naval vessels began intercepting American ships bound to or from French ports and impressing American sailors for service in the Royal Navy. Washington dispatched Chief Justice John Jay to resolve differences between the United States and Britain. But bargaining from a weak position, Jay's controversial British treaty did little more than accept British limits on American trade with France in exchange for Britain finally evacuating the last of its pre-Revolutionary War forts on U.S. territory. It even failed to stop the British from intercepting American merchant ships and impressing American sailors. The agreement outraged both Republicans at home and the French government, which retaliated by authorizing the capture of American ships trading with Britain. The fledgling United States had no means to protect its merchant fleet, which was now regular prey to both the British and the French. For the first time, Washington's popularity sagged. Jay reportedly said that he could travel from Boston to Philadelphia solely by the light of his burning effigies. In 1796, at age 64, Washington announced that he would not accept a third term as president. The posturing for succession quickly evolved into a strange sort of behind-the-scenes competition for office. For the first two elections, no one opposed Washington for the presidency. Now the seat was open. The two emerging partisan factions had not yet evolved into institutionalized parties, and they did not yet have mechanisms for formally nominating presidential candidates. They did, however, have clear leading contenders for that office. Adams was in from the start. Although he once described the vice presidency as the most insignificant office that ever the invention of man contrived, he nevertheless saw it as a stepping stone to the presidency. I am heir apparent, you know, and a succession is soon to take place, he wrote to his wife in January 1796. After eight tedious years as the Prince of Wales as he termed the vice-president's position, Adams never would have voluntarily relinquished his claimed right to inherit the throne. Hamilton may have coveted the presidency for himself, or preferred a loyal high federalist for the post over the more moderate Adams. But the vice-president's status made it unlikely that any other federalist could displace him without fatally dividing the party's electoral vote. Jefferson was the obvious Republican contender. Nobody within his party seriously challenged him. No candidates openly campaigned for the presidency in 1796, 
or even publicly declared their interest in holding the job. Washington had acted that way in 1788 and 1792, and his would-be successors were careful to emulate him. Jefferson remained in Monticello. Adams went home to his farm near Boston. Others conspired on their behalf, typically without consulting them. As it turned out, Adams secured votes from 71 of the 139 electors, or one more vote than he needed for the requisite majority, and what was to be the last old-style presidential election. Jefferson was the runner-up with votes from 68 electors, and, as the Constitution then stipulated, he became the vice president. Adams swept the northern states, gaining votes from every elector in New England, New York, and New Jersey. Delaware also went for Adams. Jefferson carried the South and West, except for votes for Adams from one elector in Virginia and another in North Carolina. The two nascent parties had secured regional bases of support, where they dominated state and local politics as well. The middle states of Pennsylvania and Maryland split their votes and emerged as key political battlegrounds of the future. For the only time in American history, partisan opponents served together as president and vice president. Immediately after his election in 1796, Adams reached out to the Republicans. He suggested that Madison lead a bipartisan mission to negotiate an end to the trade dispute with France, and that as vice president, Jefferson serve in the cabinet. Although he accepted the vice presidency, Jefferson declined to work with Adams or support the Federalist agenda. The division between Adams and Jefferson, and their respective factions, had grown too wide to bridge by such means. Jefferson would preside over the Senate as the Constitution prescribed, and use that position to rally the Republican opposition. My letters inform me that Mr. Adams speaks of me with great friendship, and with satisfaction in the prospect of administering the government in concurrence with me. Jefferson wrote to Madison after the election results became known. If by that he meant my participating in the executive cabinet, both duty and inclination will shut that door. The Constitution will know me only as a member of a legislative body. Adams ultimately filled his cabinet with holdovers from the Washington administration. Most of them were high Federalists, and more devoted to Hamilton than to their new president. This would cause Adams a great deal of consternation in the coming years. Adams and Jefferson acted respectfully toward each other during their term together, but always at a distance. Partisan differences had become too fierce for their friendship to survive. As they were walking home together after a pre-inauguration dinner with Washington, Adams raised the issue of his peace mission to France. He informed Jefferson that Federalist legislators had insisted that only their partisans be sent on the mission. The two old friends soon reached an intersection, where our road separated, Jefferson later recalled, his being down Market Street, mine off along Fifth Street, and we took leave and he never after that said one word to me on the subject, or ever consulted me as to any measures of the government. From that point forward, their paths and those of their parties diverged ever more sharply. The threat from France consumed the Adams administration from the outset, and mired it in partisanship throughout. By the time Adams took office in March 1797, French naval vessels and privateers had intercepted hundreds of American merchant ships, and France had substantially restricted trade by the United States in retaliation for Jay's Treaty. All this impacted mainly the commercial Northeast, a Federalist bastion, fueling anger at France in that region. 
Yet many Americans, especially in the agrarian South, where republicanism held sway, were still most leery of Britain and remained positively disposed toward France and its revolution. Within days after he became president, Adams learned that the revolutionary regime in France had refused to receive the new American ambassador named by Washington, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, an aristocratic former Revolutionary War general from South Carolina with sympathies toward France's old royalist government, and who was also the brother of Federalist leader Thomas Pinckney. In a bellicose address to Congress two months later, Adams urged Americans to prepare for war, even as he reiterated his determination to send a peace mission to France. Reactions to the president's policy followed party lines, with the Republican press becoming especially vitriolic in condemning an alleged rush to war. When Adams pushed ahead with efforts to resolve differences with France, he was, as he had told Jefferson he would be, blocked by leaders of his own party from including Republicans in the peace delegation. Ultimately, Adams chose to send back Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, along with Virginia Federalist John Marshall and Massachusetts politician Elbridge Gerry, a political independent and close friend of the president. In March 1798, however, Americans heard that French officials refused to receive the delegation without the United States making an advance payment, which amounted to tribute or a bribe simply to begin negotiations. Americans felt humiliated by the stipulation, which was not how respectful adversaries were presumed to act at the time. The demand was made by three French officials— whom Adams diplomatically identified simply as Agents X, Y, and Z, and the incident became known in America as the XYZ Affair. In response, war fever gripped the nation. Rumors spread of an imminent invasion by France, possibly using freed blacks from the French West Indies as troops. The threat seemed realistic to some frightened Americans, though not to Adams and never to leading Republicans. By that time, France's revolutionary armies had overrun much of Europe, dislodging long-established political, economic, and religious institutions as they went. America was next, high Federalists ominously warned. To counter the already crippling impact of French attacks on American shipping, Adams proposed building a navy and raising war taxes. Addressing the purported risk of a Jacobin invasion, in July 1798, Federalists in Congress also passed legislation tripling the size of the regular army from about 4,000 soldiers who were stationed mainly on the western frontier to deal with threats from Native Americans to nearly 15,000 soldiers with the new troops to be stationed in the eastern states. Adams considered this so-called additional army unnecessary, and Republicans viewed it as potentially dangerous. Deeply suspicious of high Federalist intentions to create a strong central government, Republicans saw a domestic standing army as a clear and present threat to states' rights and individual liberty. Despite his reservations about it, Adams signed the legislation for the army along with bills for his navy and the war taxes. These measures steeled the Republicans against him. In 1798, after debating a declaration of outright war against France, which was backed by high Federalists but vigorously opposed by Republicans, Congress enacted a lesser measure authorizing U.S. warships to engage French vessels in international waters. The resulting naval battles of 1799 and 1800 between American and French ships became known as the Quasi-War. Hamilton pronounced himself delighted with Adams's performance in the mounting crisis, while Jefferson privately denounced it as insane. Fearing the worst from France, Americans initially rallied to the president and his party. For the first time in his career, 
Adams became genuinely popular, and he loved it. The partisan clashes over the American policy toward France intensified in 1798, when high Federalists in Congress turned to matters of internal security in wartime. The high Federalists claimed that the French government might actually whip up support among its American sympathizers, especially among Republicans and recent immigrants from Europe. Indeed, the French armies had relied on resident aliens and local Republicans for help in conquering European territory. France's ambassador, Citizen Genet, once even appealed for public support in the United States to try to overturn Washington's neutrality proclamation. Some Federalists charged that in an invasion, France might successfully rally internal opposition to the government though the Republicans in Congress dismissed this as impossible in America and feared that the Federalists sought simply to clamp down on them. The high Federalists took aim at both foreigners within the country and critics of the government in the ever more partisan and vitriolic press. By this time, a number of openly Republican newspapers had gained popularity, most notably the Aurora in Philadelphia offering some measure of balance against the traditionally pro-Federalist press. In mid-1798, High Federalist pushed through Congress and Adams signed the Naturalization, Alien, and Sedition Acts. These laws raised the bar for citizenship, authorized the deportation of foreigners, and outlawed false and malicious criticism of the government in the press or by individuals, including by opposition politicians. A Federalist judge could readily stretch the interpretation of the Sedition Act to reach virtually any form of negative editorial comment in Republican newspapers, and even many Federalists viewed the measure as a blatant move to suppress the freedom of the press and domestic opposition. These acts were war measures, Adams later explained, and tended altogether against the advocates of the French and peace with France. Presiding over the Senate when they passed, Jefferson strenuously opposed the acts in both public and private, as extreme encroachments on liberty, as did Republicans generally. At first, however, these measures proved popular with the frightened public and Federalists rode them and America's fears of France to victory in the 1798 congressional midterm elections. In the last two years of his term, however, Adams's popularity seemingly waned, and the Republican opposition gained traction. The naval war with France, which proved exceedingly costly and further disrupted foreign trade, led to a soaring national debt and the collection of ever more taxes, which many Americans resented. Republican attacks on the Adams administration took their toll, as the public began to realize that despite the ongoing naval clashes, France was not going to mount an invasion of America. Before long, the Sedition Act and additional army began to seem unnecessary and unwise. Republicans painted them as calculated steps toward imposing an authoritarian regime in the United States, perhaps even to instituting an American monarchy. Rather than help to diffuse partisan differences and unite the country, the proximity of Adams and Jefferson in office as president and vice president served to personalize every clash and to excite the sense that an epic confrontation between them was imminent in the next presidential contest. The stage was set for the election of 1800, America's first and most transformative presidential campaign. Chapter 2 Crossing the Bar he mounted his horse under a lead-gray sky on the morning of Thursday, December 12, 1799, for his daily ride about Mount Vernon, his vast Potomac plantation. Washington may have retired from the presidency nearly three years earlier, 
but he had not stopped working. He owned thousands of acres in Virginia, and over three hundred slaves, many of whom worked as skilled laborers in the plantation's many mills, distilleries, and other craft enterprises. Overseers managed Mount Vernon during his many years of public service, commanding Patriot forces during the Revolution, presiding over the Constitutional Convention, and leading the nation as its first president. Washington, however, resumed control of his plantation whenever he returned home. He believed that Mount Vernon required his active management to remain profitable and provide a suitable income for himself and his wife Martha. Mount Vernon's depleted soils could no longer grow tobacco, which made it a constant challenge to reap a profit from farming. Corn whiskey and wheat flour became the plantation's main cash crops. Washington regularly inspected various parts of his plantation to keep abreast of its operations. Indeed, three months after stepping down as president at age 65, Washington commented about his labors at Mount Vernon. I've been occupied from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, and the work had not diminished with the passing of time. On that gray December day in 1799, he remained outside on plantation business in ever-worsening weather for over five hours. The preceding night Washington had observed a bright halo around the moon, which he took to forecast an approaching storm. The temperature hovered in the low thirties at dawn and dropped during the day. He donned his greatcoat, but not a hat for his ride that morning. Standing nearly six feet three inches tall with the stature of a stately oak tree, Washington's commanding physical presence contributed to his already legendary charisma. Mounting a large horse simply added to his luster. At a time when people equated equestrian skills with athleticism, Washington was a superb horseman, and it still showed at age sixty-seven. Although his last surviving brother had died three months earlier, and none of his close male relatives had reached age seventy, Washington seemed fit. I was the first, and now am the last, of my father's children by the second marriage who remained he observed upon learning of his youngest brother's death in September 1799. When I shall be called upon to follow them is known only to the giver of life. Washington did not expect to hear that call any time soon. Indeed, he had recently reported on his own good health to a Federalist supporter, and was planning an ambitious trip to inspect his frontier properties in western Virginia during the upcoming spring. Eighteen months earlier, as fears of a French invasion were sweeping the country, Washington had even accepted formal command of the expanded army, a largely titular post that he filled without leaving home. Now, on his rounds that December day, the general carried a four-year plan for enhancing Mount Vernon's profitability. After eight years as the nation's president, however, Washington could not refrain from being drawn into national political battles after his retirement. He said that he abhorred partisanship, and he probably believed that all elected officials could rise above factional self-interest and unite on fundamental issues. Yet he readily took sides in partisan clashes, which usually put him in the company of Federalists. Even as president— Washington increasingly let Hamilton set the tone for the administration, especially after Jefferson left the cabinet in despair over the government's elitist pro-British tilt. From the moment of my retiring from the administration, the Federalists got unchecked hold of General Washington, Jefferson later observed. The opposition, too, of the Republicans to the British Treaty and the zealous support of the Federalists in that unpopular but favorite measure of theirs had made him all their own. Following Washington's retirement, Jefferson came to eye Mount Vernon as a haven for high Federalist intrigue in Republican Virginia. Washington had grown particularly close to Hamilton during his presidency, 
treating him almost as the son he'd never had. And that relationship continued after Washington left office. An Anglican, monarchical, and aristocratical party has sprung up, whose avowed object is to draw over us the substance, as they have already done the forms, of the British government. Jefferson intemperately wrote to a foreign confidant, Philip Matze, in 1796. It would give you a fever were I to name to you the apostates who have gone over to these heresies, men who were Samsons in the field and Solomons in the council, but who have had their heads shorn by the harlot England. Jefferson clearly intended to include Washington among the apostates. After the letter became public a year later, Washington grew to distrust Jefferson in kind. Washington remained the most popular person in the country as the 1800 election approached. Presumably, he could have regained the presidency if he would accept it. Some high Federalists quietly began pushing for just that. They had become angry with Adams when earlier in 1799... He had reached out again for peace with France by sending a new team of negotiators to Paris in response to assurances that French officials would receive them honorably. Some leaders within Adams's party began actively conspiring to draft Washington for a third term. Adams, whose popularity appeared to falter as the nation's war fever cooled, could not win re-election, they argued and his politics were too timid. The disillusionment with Adams went back further for some high Federalists. Hamilton in particular distrusted Adams as too moderate to lead the nation effectively. He had tried to depress the electoral vote for Adams in 1789, claiming that he did not want anyone to compete with Washington for the presidency. After learning of the effort, Adams suspected that Hamilton may have had more sinister motivations, such as humiliating him in public and perhaps keeping him from becoming vice president. Later events reinforced Adams's suspicions. In 1796, Hamilton had made a bolder move against Adams, a harbinger of the intra-party conflict that would break out among Federalists in 1800. He tried to manipulate the electoral college system to deprive Adams of the presidency and get his own favored Federalist, Thomas Pinckney, elected to the position instead. Hamilton's scheme took advantage of the complex and sometimes seemingly perverse mechanics of the original electoral system. In their conception of the electoral college, the framers foresaw an elite group of well-qualified electors, exercising their collective judgment in picking the best qualified president and vice president from an open field of leading figures from across the country. Through this process, the framers hoped to avoid both the formation of national political parties, which were never mentioned in the Constitution, and the development of coordinated partisan voting. As the framers designed the system, each elector would cast two equal votes— presumably for their top two choices for president. The most highly favored candidate would become president, and the second most highly favored candidate would be placed in line for succession as vice president. Electors were not permitted to designate on their ballots one vote for president and another for vice president, however, nor could they vote for two candidates from their own state. The framers included these peculiar stipulations to prevent state loyalties from overwhelming national interests in choosing the president. They worried that so many electors might favor in-state candidates in balloting that unless they were forced to vote for someone from outside their own state, no truly national candidate could win the election. But they did not want to bar electors from voting for any in-state candidate. Thus, they gave each elector two votes. Even if each elector cast his first vote for his home state favorite, a national candidate could still emerge out of electors' second votes. 
to further assure that the president would have broad national support, to win the post, a candidate would need to receive votes from a majority of the electors. If none did, the House of Representatives would elect the president by a majority vote from among the five candidates with the most electoral votes. The framers' vision of how the process would work now seems quaint. Independent electors meeting in collegiate settings and using their own judgment in casting their ballots for two individuals whom they deemed best qualified to lead the nation. But the process actually operated much as the framers intended in 1789 and 1792, when Washington was the clear favorite among all the electors. Aside from Franklin, who died in 1790, Washington was America's only true national hero, the one indispensable person in forming the new government. No party nominated him for president, and he never campaigned for the office. Every elector cast one vote for him on both occasions, and he tried to assemble a nonpartisan administration. In both of those elections, John Adams obtained the second highest number of electoral votes, despite Hamilton's efforts to suppress votes for him in 1789, giving him the vice presidency. In 1796, Adams and Jefferson continued the tradition of not campaigning for president, but much else changed. The nation's two ideological factions had been evolving steadily into more organized political parties, and their leaders were working ever more assiduously to induce electors aligned with their party to vote for what amounted to a partisan ticket of two candidates designated by the party's caucus in Congress. Presumably, electors would cast their first vote for the party's preferred presidential candidate and their second vote for its suggested vice presidential pick, even though they could not designate their votes as such. In 1796, the Federalists had agreed on Adams for president and South Carolinian Thomas Pinckney for vice president. In their caucus, the Republicans in Congress while uniformly for Jefferson as president, apparently discussed four candidates for vice president without settling on one of them for the post. Hamilton saw an opportunity in the rise of party ticket voting to unseat Adams. He calculated that if there were two leading contenders for president, each with strong support in one party, as with Adams and Jefferson, then the first votes of electors might be nearly evenly divided between them. There then being 139 electors casting a total of 278 votes, this might leave one candidate with anywhere from 70 to 75 first votes versus from 65 to 70 first votes for the other, with at least one candidate needing a minimum of 70 votes to gain the required majority. In this scenario, a vice presidential candidate who had strong party backing for the second votes from Federalists in the North, where that party held sway, and also strong state or regional support in the Republican-dominated South, so that he could also pull second votes there, might actually outpoll both presidential candidates. That was Hamilton's plan for Pinckney, who, as a popular Federalist from South Carolina, had strong support both in his home state and among Federalists generally. Hamilton expected that Pinckney would get votes from all of South Carolina's electors, even if they preferred the Republican Jefferson for president. Some other Southern electors might also favor Pinckney for their second votes. So long as Federalist electors in the North duly gave their second votes to Pinckney, those votes combined with Pinckney's votes from Southern electors should bring the South Carolinian in first, with something over 75 votes. In the end, the plan backfired. Eighteen pro-Adams Federalist electors in New England, who had discerned Hamilton's scheme, decided not to vote for Pinckney, instead dropping their votes from him 
by casting them for either U.S. Chief Justice Oliver Ellsworth of Connecticut or Governor John Jay of New York, who they knew had no chance of becoming either president or vice president. In order to drop votes and not inadvertently hurt their favored candidate, electors needed to cast their second votes for someone who had no chance of winning. Ultimately, Pinckney came in third in the overall voting, even though, as expected, South Carolina's eight electors voted for him and Jefferson. Jefferson, Hamilton's old adversary, became vice president instead of Pinckney, which made Hamilton's frustration with the failure of his scheme even worse. Now, heading into the 1800 election, Hamilton was still set on displacing Adams. He was one of those urging Washington to run, and orchestrating a chorus of like-minded high Federalists. Unless you consent to stand for the office, Federalist Governor Jonathan Trumbull of Connecticut wrote to Washington in June 1799, the next election of president, I fear, will have a very ill-fated issue. Adams had barely beaten Jefferson in 1796. Republicans now hated Adams even more than then, and high Federalists distrusted him as a trimmer. Trumbull's letter carried an enclosure suggesting that he wrote on behalf of other high Federalists, including at least one member of Adams's cabinet, Oliver Walcott. Hamilton naturally concurred. Washington replied disingenuously that party rather than personality would prevail in the next election and that he would receive no more electoral votes than Adams. Trumbull rightly responded, My fears, and those of other well-wishers to our country, are that neither Adams, nor any other who could be named, will be likely to secure with certainty that decided and necessary totality of votes, which are to be wished, unless it be you. As an evangelical Christian ruling over a virtual theocracy in Connecticut, Trumbull deeply distrusted Jefferson for his alleged deism and anti-clericalism. At Hamilton's urging, Federalist senior statesman Governor Morris took up the plea in a December 9 letter to the general. The leading federal characters, even in Massachusetts, consider Mr. Adams as unfit for the office he now holds, Morris wrote. You must be convinced, however painful the conviction, that should you decline, then no man will be chosen whom you wish to see in that high office. Morris's letter recited a litany of reasons why Washington, for the sake of his country and his own reputation, must consent to serve. Ponder this, I pray, Morris concluded. Although Adams did not know the extent of the cabal against him, he certainly felt the high Federalist's anger. Washington never received Morris's letter. On December 12th, four days before the letter reached Mount Vernon, he returned from his five-hour ride wet and cold. About one o'clock it began to snow, the general recorded in his diary for that day, soon after to hail, and then turned to a subtle cold rain. Snow hung from his hair when he finally re-entered the mansion house after 3 p.m. The heavy snowfall and his physical condition prevented Washington from riding on Friday, December 13th. He had taken cold, undoubtedly from being so much exposed the day before and complained of having a sore throat, the general's personal secretary, Tobias Lear, wrote in his journal. He had a hoarseness which increased in the evening, but he made light of it, as he would never take anything to carry off a cold, always observing, let it go as it came. That afternoon, after it stopped snowing, Washington walked outside to mark some trees for removal. In the evening he asked Lear to read aloud from the transcript of recent debates in the Virginia legislature. What he heard upset him. Republicans in the legislature had selected James Monroe, a neighbor and close political ally of Jefferson and Madison, as the state's next governor. 
That choice had stacked the deck for Jefferson in the upcoming contest for Virginia's presidential electors. The general surely went to bed in a sour mood. For Washington, the upcountry triumvirate of Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe had become the very personification of partisanship, and to him, partisanship represented the gravest threat to freedom. Strong parties might help check and balance the excesses of monarchical power in the old world, Washington conceded, but would likely subvert the American constitutional union of institutionalized checks and balances. In this sense, Washington observed in his farewell address as president, it is that your union ought to be considered as a main prop of your liberty. Factionalism, he warned, tends to put in place of the delegated will of the nation, the will of a party. Jefferson and the Republicans, in contrast, worried that Federalists had already swept away any meaningful institutional checks contained in the Constitution. Against us are the executive and the judiciary, the legislature, all the officers of the government, all who want to be officers— all timid men who preferred the calm of despotism to the boisterous sea of liberty, British merchants and Americans trading on British capitals, and speculators and holders in the banks and public funds, Jefferson wrote during the waning days of Washington's second term. The naval war with France, the creation of the additional army, and the enactment of the Sedition Act, had served only to confirm Republicans' worst fears of the Federalists' supposed authoritarian agenda. Now, in the run-up to the 1800 election, Republicans mobilized with a new vigor to counter this Federalist hegemony. Their emergence as an ever more organized party deeply distressed Washington, who tended to see Federalists as disinterested patriots and Republicans as little more than domestic Jacobins. Indeed, Washington and other Federalists took to using that French label for their partisan opponents. Comparing the situation when he left office in 1797 with circumstances in 1799, Washington wrote, At that time the line between parties was not so clearly drawn, and the views of the opposition not so clearly delineated as they are at present. By the opposition he meant the Republicans and he went on to lament, Let that party set up a broomstick and call it a true son of liberty, a Democrat, or give it any other epithet that will suit their purpose, and it will command their votes in toto. In a subsequent letter to the same Federalist correspondent, Washington complained that the Republican faction, in its increasingly harsh attacks in the press, is hanging upon the wheels of government, opposing measures calculated solely for internal defense, and is endeavoring to defeat all the laws which have been passed for this purpose by rendering them obnoxious. To him the Republicans stood against security, while of course the Republicans saw themselves as standing for liberty. By selecting Monroe as their state's governor in 1799, Republicans in the Virginia legislature could not have made a more partisan pick, nor one more calculated to enrage Washington and the Federalists. Virginia's misfortune may be comprised in one short sentence, the Virginia Federalist reported. Monroe is elected. The bad blood between Washington and Monroe went back to 1794 and the negotiation of Jay's Treaty with Britain. At the time, as a young Republican senator from Virginia, Monroe had led calls to retaliate against Britain for imposing unilateral restrictions on American trade with France. Instead of retaliating, however, Washington had decided to send John Jay to negotiate peace with Britain at almost any price. Then, to keep France from immediately striking back at the United States— Washington asked Monroe to replace America's pro-royalist ambassador in Paris, Governor Morris. Monroe naively served Washington's purposes in deflecting French attention from Jay's negotiations with Britain 
by indiscreetly embracing the Republican regime in France. Once the treaty took effect, Washington promptly recalled Monroe from Paris and replaced him with Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, who, like his younger brother Thomas Pinckney, was a wealthy South Carolina lawyer and planter with ties to French royalists. Feeling that Washington and the Federalists had poorly used him, Monroe returned to the United States intent on setting the record straight. He published an intemperate pamphlet that denounced Jay's treaty as a calculated surrender to Britain and criticized Washington by name. Washington had retired to Mount Vernon by that time, and unaccustomed to such treatment, he could scarcely restrain himself from lashing back in kind. Now he faced the prospect of this insolent partisan becoming his governor. The entire episode must have come back to the general as he listened to Lear read from the legislative transcript. He appeared much affected and spoke with some degree of asperity on the subject, Lear reported in his diary. Madison's warm praise of Monroe's character particularly angered Washington. His sworn enemies were at the gate— and he was growing old. Washington awoke in the early hours of Saturday morning, struggling for breath. His sore throat had developed into something much worse. It was as if someone were strangling him. Martha wanted to call for help immediately, but the general asked her to wait until dawn. Apparently he feared that she might catch a cold getting out of bed on such a chilly night. By morning Washington could barely utter a sound and never again spoke above a whisper. "'Tis very sore,' the general said of his throat. Lear sent for Washington's physician, James Craik. Even before Craik arrived, two other doctors were summoned as well. Awaiting their arrival, Washington asked for a bleeding by George Rawlins, the overseer who generally treated Mount Vernon's slaves. In line with standard medical practice of the day, Washington believed that removing some blood might reduce the pressure in his throat. Don't be afraid, the general counseled his reluctant overseer. More, he demanded when Rawlins tried to stop. In all, the overseer removed half a pint of blood, but the bleeding did not help. Dr. Craig repeated the procedure after he arrived, and also prescribed a sage tea and vinegar gargle, steam, and a cantharidian blister to draw the swelling to the surface. When none of these reduced the internal inflammation in Washington's neck, Craik bled the patient for a third time and administered two laxatives, which produced a dramatic bowel movement. After the other doctors arrived in the afternoon, they prescribed a fourth bleeding. The blood came very slow, Lear noted this time was thick. Washington could barely swallow or breathe. He asked to review his two wills, and had one of them destroyed. I find I am going, he whispered to Lear. My breath cannot continue long. I believed from the first attack it would be fatal. Washington called his illness an ague. Craig diagnosed it as inflammatory quinsy. The medical team ultimately termed it Sinanchi trachealis. During the late eighteenth century, these were just words tied to particular symptoms without any effective treatments linked to them. The youngest doctor in attendance suggested a tracheotomy, which might have helped Washington to breathe. But the other doctors vetoed the procedure as too risky. In all likelihood, Washington had contracted epiglottitis from a bacterial infection in his larynx. If so, then no available medical procedure could have cured him. Indeed, at the time and ever after, critics have charged that the bleedings, blisters, and purges inflicted upon Washington only made matters worse. Clearly, they did not help him. Let me go off quickly. I cannot last long, he told his doctors at dusk. To Craik, the general added, Doctor, I die hard, but I am not afraid to go.
The physicians continued to treat Washington with blisters and poultices into the evening, but they gave up on his life. About ten o'clock, he made several attempts to speak to me before he could effect it, Lear noted. At length, he said, I am going. Have me decently buried, and do not let my body be put in the vault in less than two days after I am dead. Once he was certain that Lear understood his request, the general spoke for the last time. Tis well. After feeling his own pulse, Washington's hand fell from his wrist, and he died. Tis well, Martha echoed. I have no more trials to pass through. I shall soon follow him. Twenty-nine months later, grieving still and feeling very much alone, she did. Lear formally notified President Adams of the General's passing. His last scene corresponded with the whole tenor of this life, Lear wrote, with perfect resignation and a full possession of his reason. He closed his well-spent life. News of the unexpected death shocked Americans and precipitated an outpouring of grief unprecedented in the young nation's history. Every paper we received from towns which have heard of Washington's death are enveloped in mourning, reported Boston's Columbian Sentinel on December 28, 1799. Every city, town, village, and hamlet has exhibited spontaneous tokens of poignant sorrow. President Adams set the tone for many. He grieved openly, but in a subtly partisan manner, responding publicly to a memorial message from Congress describing Washington as the country's father, for example. Adams stressed that among those still in the national government, only he had served with the general at the First Continental Congress where the independence movement began. I feel myself alone, bereaved of my last brother, Adams wrote. By dating the independence movement from the First Congress in 1774, two years before the Declaration of Independence, Adams deftly excluded Jefferson from the band of founding brothers. On the eve of the 1800 presidential campaign, no one in government could have missed Adams's subtext, especially because he sent his response to the Senate, where Jefferson presided. Adams was now the undisputed head of the Federalist Party, despite the opposition from high Federalists within the party. Washington's death threw off the efforts of Hamilton and his allies who had been trying to persuade Washington to run in Adams's stead. With no Federalist other than Adams enjoying a national reputation, except, of course, the widely unpopular Hamilton, high Federalists recognized that they now had to support Adams for a second term, at least in public. Privately, however, some continued their scheming to drop him in the end. Four days after Washington died, his body was entombed in the family's Mount Vernon burial vault. People assembled from miles around to watch, as to the sound of solemn music and muffled drums, a military procession carried the casket from the mansion house to the vault. A riderless horse with boots reversed in the stirrups followed the bier. After the eulogy, artillery cannons fired a salute. Everyone wore black insignia, with many choosing a darkened badge of the Society of the Cincinnati an elite organization of former Revolutionary War officers whose badge had come to symbolize the Federalist Party. As president, Adams ordered that all military stations observe similar funeral honors for Washington, which the Army interpreted to mean military processions, gun salutes, solemn music, and spoken eulogies. Hundreds of communities followed suit with funerary processions and eulogies of their own, which enabled countless Americans to mourn Washington's passing in a public way. Perhaps the largest such ceremony occurred on December 26th in Philadelphia, which was still the nation's capital. 
Congress designated Federalist Representative Henry Lee of Virginia to deliver the eulogy at the event. There he spoke the words that many still use to characterize Washington. First in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. At the time, some Federalists sought to take partisan advantage of the sincere and widespread emotional response to Washington's passing. They planned and led the ceremony in Philadelphia, for example, and Lee's eulogy repeated the Federalist mantra, Liberty and Order. Republicans, in contrast, stood simply for liberty, and took the American Revolution's liberty cap, liberty pole, and liberty tree as their symbols. For many conservative Americans, however, the riotous revolutionaries in France had appropriated these symbols and equated them with a reign of terror. Federalists thus stressed the need for ordered or civil liberty, and equated the Republicans' notion of liberty with licentiousness and Jacobin mob rule. Civil liberty, explained Federalist leader John Jay, who then served as New York's governor, consists not in a right to every man to do just as he pleases, but it consists in an equal right to do whatever the equal and constitutional laws of the country admit to be consistent with the public good. Their firm stand for civil order in turbulent times represented a principal appeal of the Federalist in the 1790s. Stressing this theme in his eulogy, Lee mourned Washington's death coming at a time when the civilized world shakes to its center, and when every moment gives birth to strange and momentous changes. He claimed to be hearing Washington plead from beyond the grave, Let liberty and order be inseparable companions. Taking up two other Federalist election themes, Lee also claimed to be hearing Washington ask Americans to reverence religion and control party spirit, the bane of free government. Federalists freely denounced Jefferson as a deist or atheist, while calling on America's Protestant majority to support their party's God-fearing candidates. Privately, Washington and Adams inclined toward deism or Unitarianism, too but at least they publicly invoked God's blessing on America through displays of civil religion and attended Protestant services. Despite the inroads of Enlightenment thought, particularly among the elites, evangelical Protestantism remained strong in the United States, and most Americans valued the role of religion in civil society. Federalists also equated Republicans with self-interested partisanship, and themselves with disinterested public service. A natural aristocracy of virtuous and wise leaders should rule on the call of the people in elections devoid of partisanship, Federalists maintained, and the people should follow. To them, Washington's tenure as president exemplified the ideal, personality over party. In contrast, the Jacobins appear to be completely organized throughout the United States, one prominent Federalist complained about the Republicans in 1800. The whole body act with a union to be expected only from men in whom no moral principles exist. For their part, Federalists tended to shun party discipline as inappropriate for public servants, leading one Federalist congressman to observe in 1800, the Federalists hardly deserve the name of party. Their association is a loose one. Similar themes to those heard in Philadelphia were sounded in the eulogy for Washington delivered in New York City by the state's incoming Federalist senator, Governor Morris. The 1800 census would show that New York had finally surpassed Philadelphia as the nation's largest city and both sides viewed New York State's electoral votes as critical to winning the presidency. New York Federalists organized a massive public commemoration of Washington's death for December 31, 1799. Hamilton, who had become like a son to Washington, 
assumed a central position in the funerary procession, riding after the military contingents and before representatives of various civic associations. Morris's eulogy cursed the rise of a partisan faction in American politics, and praised leaders like Washington of decided temper who devoted to the people overlooked prudential considerations, as opposed to cautious men with whom popularity was an object. As Washington's former pro-royalist ambassador to Paris, Morris even included a bizarre reference to King Louis XVI as the protector of the rights of mankind, an apparent slap at Jefferson and the Republicans, who defended the revolutionaries who first toppled and then guillotined the French monarch. Let us raise a standard to which the wise and the honest can repair, Morris proclaimed. Privately, the New Yorker attributed Jefferson's appeal to the people's irresponsible intoxication with popular rule. When the people have been drunk long enough, they will get sober, he assured a fellow Federalist. But while the frolic lasts, to reason with them is useless. Some Republicans resisted efforts to transform memorial ceremonies for Washington into thinly-veiled Federalist campaign rallies. The whole United States mourned for him as a father, observed Benjamin Rush, a renowned physician with Republican ties who attended the ceremony in Philadelphia, and afterward critiqued Lee's partisan eulogy as moderate but deficient in elocution. Philadelphia's leading Republican newspaper, the Aurora, reported on various Republican contingents joining the funerary procession for Washington. Many will join in ye form that cared little about him, complained Philadelphia diarist Elizabeth Drinker, a candid and insightful Federalist sympathizer. Republicans also took part in the ceremony in New York where all manner of partisan groups accepted the organizers' open invitation for public bodies to join the grand procession honoring the former president. Hamilton must have watched his back as his mounted suite paraded directly in front of partisans from the working-class Tammany Society, the very heart of republicanism in New York City, who held aloft a liberty cap veiled in crepe. We mourn Washington, too, the Tammanyites seemed to say, and to us he stood simply for liberty. The contest over the meaning of Washington's life began that last day of 1799, if not before. One of the points of fiercest contention was the additional army. In many major cities the new troops featured prominently in ceremonies honoring their fallen commander. This seemed appropriate given Washington's military credentials and his role as its head, but it also invited a polarizing partisan response from both Federalists and Republicans. Congress had largely disbanded the nation's military forces following the Revolutionary War, relying instead on state militias for military purposes. When following the XYZ affair, Congress prepared the nation for war by creating a navy and greatly expanding the army, many people had viewed the additional army as peculiarly a high Federalist force. Indeed, Adams, believing that the true danger to American interests lay at sea, had not requested any added troops, and Republicans had generally opposed the idea. There is no more prospect of seeing a French army here as there is in heaven, Adams once cautioned his hawkish, High Federalist Secretary of War, Oliver Walcott. Privately, Washington agreed with Adams's assessment of the military situation, but nevertheless accepted the commission as the Army's leader. He insisted on appointing his own officer corps, and over Adams's strenuous objections, named Hamilton as his Inspector General, the second in command. Two other Federalist politicians with wartime experience, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney and Henry Lee, became major generals. But Hamilton largely organized and led the troops while Washington remained at home. 
Republicans had vehemently criticized the domestic military build-up, fearing with some justification that Hamilton might turn the new army against them. Jefferson in particular worried about a military coup to maintain Federalist hegemony. Even Adams became concerned about Hamilton's intentions when shown private letters from the Inspector General suggesting that he might use the army to suppress anti-government resistance in Virginia and take possession of Florida and Louisiana from France's ally, Spain. This man is stark mad, or I am. Adams later claimed to have said about Hamilton upon reading these and other confidential letters outlining his plans. As it became increasingly apparent that France would not invade the United States, the additional army lost much of its public support. That army, Adams later commented, was as unpopular as if it had been a wild beast let loose upon the nation to devour it. In newspapers, in pamphlets, and in common conversation, they were called cannibals. Cost was one consideration, of course, but the thought of armed young men from various regions and camped in bases scattered across the eastern seaboard worried many Americans who lived quiet lives in insular communities. Feeding these sentiments, Republican newspapers had spread stories of looting and rapes committed by idle soldiers who had no real worry of ever facing French invaders. By 1799, the army had, on balance, become a decided political liability for Federalists. Therefore, the prominent role of the additional army in so many of the ceremonies marking Washington's death made it a visible symbol of both the partisan gulf separating Federalists and Republicans and the intra-party rift between so-called Adamsites and Hamiltonians. It had always been Hamilton's army and strictly a high Federalist force. And so it still appeared at the memorial services for Washington. With the need for the army disputed from the start and negotiations now underway with France, Military recruiting, always slow, ground to a halt, with the force never reaching even half of its authorized size. A festooned officer corps comprised largely of aging high Federalist politicians commanded just enough troops to make for impressive dress parades at Washington's many funerary processions. Though many Republicans participated in the national outpouring of grief, not all of them joined in extravagantly mourning Washington's death. Republican essayist, poet, and newspaper editor Philip Freneau ridiculed the blasphemous panegyrics that praised Washington as a god. Emphasizing simple Republican virtues, Freneau now wrote of Washington, he was the upright, honest man. This was his glory. For their part, Jefferson and Madison kept a low profile. Even though Jefferson, as the sitting vice president, was listed on the official program for Washington's funerary procession in Philadelphia, he did not attend. Although he surely knew about the ceremony, Jefferson did not return to Philadelphia for the winter session of Congress until two days afterward. Indeed, Dumas Malone, Jefferson's most comprehensive biographer, determined that the man who had once served as Washington's Secretary of State said nothing in public and appears to have said nothing in private about Washington's death. His silence spoke for him, and his conspicuous absence from the funerary procession provoked widespread criticism by Federalists. But he probably preferred that to their possible charges of hypocrisy for marching in it, Dumas observed. Only much later, after the election of 1800, did Jefferson make a private courtesy call on Washington's widow at Mount Vernon. Jefferson was not the only prominent Republican leader to miss the Philadelphia Memorial Ceremony for Washington. The recently elected Republican governor of Pennsylvania, Thomas McKean, also skipped the event. Two weeks later, he pointedly refused to attend a similar funerary procession for Washington, organized by Federalists in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. 
Tongues wagged throughout the state as partisans debated the political significance of McKean's actions in light of the coming presidential election. Had this party magistrate possessed one spark of American patriotism, the Federalist Gazette of the United States fumed, other considerations would not have prevented him from joining in the general sorrow and affliction of the occasion. Overwrought partisan opponents could plausibly criticize the impulsive and temperamental McKean as a dark and foul-minded champion of disorganization, as the Gazette article did, but hardly for a lack of patriotism. In the mold of Samuel Adams and Patrick Henry, McKean was an early and ardent patriot. As a Delaware colonial legislator, he boldly condemned the Stamp Act in 1765 and the Townsend duties in 1768. Elected to the First and Second Continental Congresses, McKean joined Adams in advocating American independence before doing so was either prudent or popular, and he proudly signed the Declaration of Independence. He later co-authored both the Delaware and Pennsylvania state constitutions, and simultaneously served as Member of Congress from Delaware and Chief Justice of Pennsylvania. His estate straddled the state line. Originally a Federalist, McKean so hated Britain from his days as a Patriot leader that he gradually broke with Washington over Jay's treaty and Hamilton's Anglophile policies. Adams's naval war with France clinched McKean's switch to the Republican Party, and with the enthusiasm of a late convert, he had agreed at age sixty-five to stand as its candidate for Pennsylvania governor in October 1799. At the time, partisans on both sides viewed that state's legislative and gubernatorial elections that autumn as virtually the opening round of the 1800 presidential contest. Already known as the Keystone State for its geographic and political centrality, Pennsylvania certainly appeared key to the election of 1800. The North would go for Adams, most political observers forecast, while Jefferson would carry the South, except perhaps for South Carolina, where there were still Federalist bastions loyal to Thomas and Charles Coatsworth Pinckney. The Middle States, from New York to Maryland, held the balance of power. In 1796, the votes from these states had split between the two leading candidates, with all 22 electors from New York, New Jersey, and Delaware voting for Adams, 14 of Pennsylvania's 15 electors voting for Jefferson, and Maryland's 10 electors casting seven votes for Adams and four for Jefferson. Adams's slender margin of victory had come from the votes of two rogue Southern electors one from Virginia and one from North Carolina. If either candidate could secure more electoral votes from the Middle States this time, he would almost surely win. Pennsylvania, with its fifteen electoral votes, stood out as the most populous of these Middle States. It was also amid a transformation from leaning Federalist to Republican. Looking ahead to the 1800 presidential election in light of the 1799 governor's race, America's flagship Federalist newspaper, Gazette of the United States, predicted, The effects then of the election of governor will be incalculable. The governor's role in the presidential election might be substantial, because Pennsylvania did not at this time have a set method of picking its electors fixed in law and the governor could therefore have a significant role in designing that process. Depending how events played out, he might even be the kingmaker. The Constitution had left each state free to decide how it would select its electors. Most states initially opted to have state legislators appoint electors. As party lines hardened, these legislative choices became ever more partisan. Typically, each party's caucus in the state legislature would put forward a full slate of elector candidates who, if appointed, would support the party ticket. The party with the most legislators would get all the state's electors.
From the outset, a few states allowed voters to choose electors in direct popular elections. Some of these states employed district elections, with voters in each electoral district typically choosing one elector from between two partisan candidates. This approach tended to split a state's electors between the parties, as some districts leaned toward the Federalist and some leaned toward the Republicans. Other states used a general ballot, so that all of the state's electors were chosen by voters from across the state, often from candidates running on two partisan slates. That approach favored all of the state's electors supporting whichever party and voting for whichever presidential candidate attracted the most voters statewide. Further, to identify their candidates for president and vice president, party members increasingly looked toward the caucus of its representatives in Congress, which was the only venue where politicians from around the nation assembled. Though the framers had designed the Electoral College to isolate the presidential election process from partisanship, the parties had virtually commandeered the system. Going into the 1799 Pennsylvania state elections, the Federalists controlled both houses of the Pennsylvania legislature, and though the Republicans hoped to pick up some seats in both, they were not expected to take control of them. The new legislature would decide how the state's electors would be chosen in 1800, and lawmakers from each party would surely try to impose a method that favored their party. The governor would have veto power over whatever they passed. Pennsylvania Federalists were especially intent to stack the system in their party's favor this time because of an ironic turn of events in the state's last election for presidential electors. Hoping to secure all of Pennsylvania's electoral votes for Adams in 1796, they had opted for a statewide general election for electors. The plan backfired, however, when Jefferson's supporters won a narrow majority in the balloting. Hence, all but one of Pennsylvania's electors had voted for Jefferson, the only votes received by the Virginian from any state north of the Mason-Dixon line. Those votes combined with ones from his southern base, would have given him the presidency, except for those two rogue electoral votes for Adams from Virginia and North Carolina. To win in 1800, both Federalists and Republicans calculated that Jefferson would probably need to sweep Pennsylvania's electoral votes again. His doing so would require the state to reenact its statewide general ticket method for selecting electors. And so, of course, Pennsylvania's Federalists now favored either district elections or legislative appointment for the state's electors. Either system would ensure that at least some of the electors were Federalists. If McKean were elected governor as a Republican, however, he could thwart their plans with a veto. For their candidate for governor, Federalists countered with another well-known politician— U.S. Senator James Ross, a leading high Federalist supporter of the Alien and Sedition Acts, who hated France as much as McKean hated England. The race had become a clash of titans, centered on Philadelphia, the nation's capital. As early as July 1799, a prominent Pennsylvania Federalist wrote nervously to Washington, This state is greatly agitated by the approaching election of governor. There is good reason to believe that Mr. Ross will be chosen, but the whole spirit of party will be extended against him. As the campaign played out, the race turned on national issues, not state ones. McKean supporters tied his opponent to the locally unpopular policies of the Adams administration and the high Federalists in Congress. One Republican broadside denounced Ross as a British partisan a monarchist, an advocate of war with France, a litigious attorney, and a patron of the Alien and Sedition Acts. In contrast, it praised McKean as a steady patriot of 1776 who supports peace and freedom of press. Another Republican appeal declared, To the Federalists and their candidate, Mr. Ross, 
we owe the sedition laws. To them we are indebted for the British Treaty, that parent of our present dispute with France. To them we owe the alien law, which has set aside trial by jury. Of this party, James Ross is the favorite candidate. In state and congressional elections held in 1797 and 1798, during the rush toward war with France and amid widespread concerns about domestic security, these same issues had tended to cut in favor of the Federalists. On the eve of the 1799 election, however, the Republican Aurora proclaimed, This national infatuation is broken, and the free American countenance once more wears the softened lineaments of the independent and benevolent Republican. Pennsylvania Federalists countered in kind, but with less effect. Mr. McKean is a friend to France, a Federalist pamphlet charged, and desirous of provoking a war with Great Britain. He favored unlimited Irish immigration, it added, and would countenance domestic discord. Repeating a common Federalist accusation against Republicans, the pamphlet charged, They have made liberty and equality the pretext, whilst plunder and dominion has been their object. Another Federalist broadside presented the choice as between happiness and independence with Ross, or Anarchy and Insurrection, with McKean. The Federalist Gazette of the United States starkly warned that McKean's election would see the whole state turned into a filthy kennel of Jacobinical depravity. Religion also played a major role in Pennsylvania's gubernatorial election, but with the traditional roles reversed. In the 1796 presidential election, Federalists had portrayed Adams as a faithful Christian, and Jefferson as an infidel bent on driving religion from the public square. In the 1799 Pennsylvania contest, however, Ross was the deist, and Republicans showed that they could give as good as they got. Their campaign literature portrayed McKean as a devout Christian, and Ross as a heretic. They frequently repeated the charge that Ross publicly denied the Christian doctrine of original sin, and reminded voters that he once sought to delete a provision from the state constitution requiring that office holders believe in God. Of course, at the national level, Federalists leveled these precise accusations against Jefferson. If the 1799 gubernatorial campaign served as a fair barometer of the nation's political climate, then it forecast heavy weather ahead for the election of 1800. Federalists despaired when McKean beat Ross by about 5,000 votes out of some 70,000 ballots cast. Not only had the Republicans taken the governorship, they had gained control of the lower house of the legislature, the assembly, and almost captured the state senate as well. Nearly 60% of Pennsylvania's eligible voters participated in the election, more than twice the percentage participating in the preceding gubernatorial election. The Republicans won on high turnout, with particular strength among Irish and German immigrants. The Federal Party is so much alarmed at the idea of McKean being chosen governor that they are apprehensive of success next year, the Aurora crowed referring to the 1800 presidential contest. McKean and his Republicans would still have to battle the Federalists controlling the state Senate over the method of selecting electors, but the contest looked tilted in their favor. Demoralized by their drubbing in the polls, Federalists worried openly about its implications for the upcoming presidential election. Such a fire has been lighted up in Pennsylvania as will consume the Federal Union, printer John Fenno opined in the Gazette of the United States, characterizing McKean's partisan victory as an event most disgraceful to our national character. The Federalist Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Thomas Sedgwick, blamed the split between Adams and High Federalists which he saw as potentially fatal for his fledgling party. 
The state of Pennsylvania is a strange medley, Abigail Adams added. Its late election has withered all the laurels it ever had. Perhaps the direst predictions came from High Federalist printer William Cobbett, the Anglophile editor of the caustic, opinion-laced Porcupine's Gazette, who had suffered in libel actions brought in McKean's court. The election of my Democratic judge as governor of Pennsylvania, undeniably the most influential state in the Union, has, in my opinion, decided the fate of what has been called Federalism, Cobbett growled. His success is only a sort of onset in the struggle, which will terminate in the complete triumph of democracy. Cobbett viewed Republican democracy as synonymous with Jacobin tyranny. Acting on his fears, Cobbett promptly moved his publishing business from Philadelphia to New York, and then to London. He refused to live under Republican rule. Republicans celebrated across Pennsylvania as word of their victory and its surprising extent spread. For them it was like Independence Day. Bonfires, bands, fireworks, ox roasts, and plenty to drink. Toast to Jefferson, the faithful guardian of our rights, inevitably raised the loudest and longest cheers, equaling or exceeding those even for McKean. May the spirit which dictated the Declaration of Independence preside in the Union, one toast to Jefferson proclaimed. It elicited nine cheers, compared with only three for a toast to Washington, the late commander-in-chief. Republicans in Pennsylvania now sang a new song. Ye true sons of freedom, ye rude swinish throng, attend for a while and I'll give you a song. It's the triumph of freedom we now celebrate, a Republican governor gained for the state. Friends of freedom, now since we have gained our cause, let's be firm in supporting our country and laws, but not that cursed law of sedition so ill. If I do, then curse me with an alien bill. Commenting on the results from Monticello, Jefferson wrote to South Carolina Senator Charles Pinckney, the younger Republican cousin of Thomas and Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, The success of McKean's election is a subject of real congratulation and hope. Of course, Jefferson had carried Pennsylvania in 1796 and still lost. He would need more electoral votes from northern or middle states and solid support from the south to be sure of victory in 1800. The isolated votes in Virginia and North Carolina that had gone to Adams last time must be secured. No one knew this better than the younger Pinckney. Charles Pinckney lived for politics, and he particularly enjoyed besting his Federalist cousins, who had taken to calling him Blackguard Charlie for his allegiance to the Republican cause. As prominent members of South Carolina's inbred aristocracy, the Pinckneys transformed state politics into a family feud. For months, Charles Pinckney had urged Jefferson and Madison to secure the Republican base by pushing Virginia and North Carolina to adopt a statewide method of choosing presidential electors, because he was convinced that the majority in both states would be solidly Republican. The success of the Republican interest depends on this act, Pinckney wrote in a September 1799 letter to Madison. Under a district method of choosing electors, he explained, pockets of federalism within those two predominantly Republican states could cost Jefferson the presidency in 1800, just as they had in 1796. Using a statewide general ticket would prevent this result. A single vote may be of great consequence, Pickney stressed. This is no time for qualms. The 1798 congressional elections underscored the risk when Federalist candidates won in eight of Virginia's 19 congressional districts. Viewing district elections as the most democratic method of choosing presidential electors, Jefferson had favored them as a means to make the inherently elitist 
electoral college system somewhat more representative. Without effective state media or communications, local voters might know district candidates, whereas they could not know many of those running statewide. To Jefferson, democracy required informed voters. Practical considerations, however, brought him around to Pinckney's point of view. Any large state using district elections effectively disenfranchised itself in a close presidential contest in which most other states used some form of winner-take-all method of choosing electors, either by a statewide vote or legislative appointment. Splitting a state's electoral votes between opposing candidates effectively negated them. Once Republicans gained firm control of the Virginia government with Monroe's selection as governor in December 1799, Jefferson endorsed switching to a general ticket for choosing the state's electors. All agree that an election by districts would be best if it could be general throughout the nation, he wrote to Monroe. But while ten states choose either by their legislatures or by a general ticket, it is folly and worse than folly, for the other six not to use some winner-take-all approach. Madison, then serving in the state legislature, recognized that his party had enough power to push through the change. The present assembly is rather stronger on the Republican side than the last one, he wrote to Jefferson on January 12, 1800. It is proposed to introduce tomorrow a bill for a general ticket in choosing the next electors. In January, majority Republican lawmakers dutifully enacted Madison's bill calling for a statewide election for electors. But only after a bitter partisan debate and by an unexpectedly narrow margin. The new election law all but assured that Jefferson would sweep Virginia's 21 electoral votes this time, the most of any state. Between Virginia's general ticket law and McKean's triumph in Pennsylvania, the pieces seemed to be falling in place for a Republican victory in 1800. The election remained nearly a year away, however, and essential uncertainty over the outcome remained. Even with all their electoral votes, Virginia and Pennsylvania could not quite guarantee the margin of victory for Jefferson. He had received virtually all their votes four years earlier, and still lost. True, if he carried all their votes this time, and every other vote he had won in 1796, he would win by one vote. But he could not necessarily count on doing so well everywhere. Other than Pennsylvania, the middle states, New Jersey, Maryland, and Delaware, remained predominantly Federalist. Pockets of federalism in the Carolinas also threatened to undermine Jefferson's southern base and subtract votes from his 1796 total. In addition, in Virginia and Pennsylvania, federalists immediately began working to salvage some electoral votes. In Virginia, federalists tried to shame Republicans into restoring district elections, and with legislative elections scheduled for April— well before the balloting for electors in November, they even dreamed of gaining control of the legislature and then restoring district elections themselves. A statewide general ticket will effectively exclude one-third, at least, of the citizens of Virginia from a vote for the President of the United States, one partisan complained, the one-third in Federalist-leaning districts. A widely reprinted Federalist broadside denounced the general ticket law as violating the ancient usages of elections and voters' established rights of choosing from among candidates in local races rather than between party ballots in statewide ones. Underscoring this point, critics of the law noted that Virginia had never conducted a statewide election for any office. Should partisan considerations trump democratic traditions? Republicans responded with a pamphlet, a vindication of the general ticket law, which defended the principle of winner-take-all balloting as best calculated to preserve to every state in the Union 
the full extent of that power which the Constitution intended to confer. As the most populous state, Virginia should have the most electoral power, the Republicans argued, and only a winner-take-all approach would secure it. Of course, the same electoral calculus applied in other states and to both parties. As the contests over voting methods heated up in Pennsylvania and Virginia, partisan lawmakers in other states took heed. Fearing that Republican electors might win in one or two of their state's electoral districts, Federalists in control of the Massachusetts government soon responded effectively in kind to Virginia Republicans by switching from district elections to legislative appointment for presidential electors, explaining his desire to guard against one anti-federal vote from Massachusetts. A Bay State lawmaker warned that one vote may turn the election. Cautious Federalists in neighboring New Hampshire also opted for legislative appointment. Ultimately, only three states, Kentucky, Maryland, and North Carolina, stuck with district elections for choosing presidential electors in 1800, four fewer than in 1796. Two others, Rhode Island and Virginia, used a statewide general ticket for electors, which would likely result in one party carrying all the electoral votes, because voters would presumably vote along party lines in such a contest. The rest used some form of legislative appointment. In Pennsylvania, despite McKean's victory and their strong showing in legislative races, Republicans could not yet count on sweeping the state's electoral votes in 1800. They had taken control of the lower house of the state legislature along with the governorship in 1799, but Federalists had clung to power in the upper house. Both houses and the governor would have to agree on the method of choosing electors and Federalists in the upper house firmly opposed any approach that might favor Jefferson. They would demand either district elections or legislative appointment, which would surely secure some Federalist electors, over the statewide ballot favored by McKean and the Republicans. As long as they controlled the state Senate, even by a narrow margin, they would have the power to hold out for their preference, or force a stalemate. If lawmakers failed to resolve the issue of how the state chose its electors, Pennsylvania might have to abstain altogether from voting in the presidential election. Federalists went into the 1800 election never having lost the presidency, and firmly in control of both houses of Congress due to their strong showing in the 1798 midterm elections. With their leaders split over Adams's peace initiative with France, and critical state elections going against them in Pennsylvania and Virginia, however, their prospects for 1800 had dimmed even while Washington lived. As the only person whom all Federalists admired, Washington had held the party together and given it meaning. A few years earlier, Jefferson had predicted that the nation's Republican spirit would revive once Federalists could no longer rally around Washington. For beleaguered Federalists, their leader's passing came at a critical time. The death of the general, one prominent Federalist had exclaimed late in 1799. God help us! His word spoke for an entire party. Throughout the 1790s, Republicans were defined largely by their opposition to Hamilton and the high Federalist agenda. People called them the Antis. With Washington gone and their unity shattered by Adams's overture to France, Federalists were fast becoming the Antis. Defined mainly by their opposition to Jefferson and the Republican Party, the initiative heading into the 1800 election had passed from the Federalists to the Republicans by the end of January. But the outcome was far from certain, and partisanship now reigned supreme. Chapter 3 Electioneering Has Already Begun The news resounded like rolling thunder as it spread across America. 
the French Republic is overthrown, the Federalists' Gazette of the United States reported on February 7, 1800. The name Napoleon Bonaparte hung in the air everywhere. The Republic's greatest general had staged a coup and taken effective control of France. Americans sensed that this new earthquake in European politics would shake their country, too. But no one yet knew exactly how. Federalists and Republicans alike struggled to retain their balance in the wake of the shocking news. If they agreed on nothing else, Federalists and Republicans agreed that events in the old world still influenced those in the new one. The cataclysmic European conflicts gave energy and meaning to the American partisan disputes. Indeed, they had largely given them birth. Bonaparte's coup d'etat cast all in doubt. Although it occurred in November 1799, word of the event did not begin reaching American ports until January 1800, with complete reports arriving only in February. For over a decade, political developments in France had dominated the news in America. That revolution, which has been the admiration, the wonder, and the terror of the civilized world, had from its commencement been viewed in America with the deepest interest, observed John Marshall, whose principled stand against negotiating with France during the XYZ affair effectively launched his legendary career in American public service. Second only to Britain, France had influenced the course of American political, social, and cultural development for two centuries. Always the other world power with designs on eastern North America, France had alternately threatened and enticed Americans since colonial times. After trying to conquer Britain's New World colonies in the 1760s, France helped them to gain their independence in the 1770s. So many Americans still admired Louis XVI for his role in their struggle for independence, that his portrait continued to hang in a position of honor at the U.S. House of Representatives in 1800, more than seven years after his own people had overthrown and beheaded him. The fascination of Americans with the French Revolution crossed party lines, and stemmed in part from the sense that the American Revolution had played an important role in transporting visions of liberty and democracy onto the world stage. At the dawn of the French Revolution, for example, Washington wrote optimistically to Jefferson in France, The rights of mankind, the privileges of the people, and the true principles of liberty seem to have been more thoroughly discussed and better understood throughout Europe since the American Revolution. Jefferson concurred. He wrote back to Washington, The French nation has been awakened by our revolution. This bond between the two nations had survived into the 1790s despite growing doubts among high Federalists. Even when France's short-lived constitutional monarchy fell to Republican rule in 1793, Washington, in words probably written by Jefferson as his Secretary of State, reassured French officials that the union of principles and pursuits between our two countries— is a link which binds still closer their interests and affections. Capturing the spirit of the day, John Marshall wrote, There seems to be something infectious in the example of a powerful and enlightened nation verging toward democracy. Virtually all Americans had initially welcomed the French Revolution as heralding a new birth of freedom in Europe. The absolute authority of the king in pre-revolutionary France and the oppressive power of its nobles and clerics found little support among Americans, who claimed a heritage of representative government, personal liberty, and economic opportunity from their days as British colonists. Their revolution defended and expanded these rights, Americans believed, without directly challenging the established social and religious order. As the French Revolution pushed far beyond its American predecessor, however, in repudiating political, economic, and religious traditions, and opening new horizons for radical social change, many Americans, led by the High Federalists, 
began having second thoughts. Now the French had fallen under military rule, a fate anathema to the basic principles of the United States and the American Revolution. Federalists took one lesson from the French experience. Unfettered democracy under the influence of a leveling faction produces anarchy, atheism, and then tyranny. I much fear that this country is doomed to great convulsions, changes, and calamities, Maryland Senator Charles Carroll of Carrollton, an extreme high Federalist, wrote to Hamilton in 1800. The turbulent and disorganizing spirit of Jacobinism, under the worn-out disguise of equal liberty and rights and division of property held out as a lure to the indolent and needy, but not really intended to be executed, will introduce anarchy, which will terminate here, as in France, in a military despotism. In his arch-federalist newspaper, William Cobbett tried to awaken his readers to the Republican threat at home by raising the guillotine. The friends of order and humanity are dilatory, like the persons of the same description in France, he warned. They seemed to be waiting till the sons of equality came to cut their throats. Alarmists in America saw parallels where none existed. They now equated a series of easily suppressed tax revolts over the past two decades, Shays' rebellion against Massachusetts tax and foreclosure laws in 1786, the Whiskey Rebellion against national excise taxes in 1794, and Fry's Rebellion against national war taxes in 1799, with the massive popular uprisings that plunged revolutionary France into chaos even though the scale and causes of them differed greatly. If our people cannot be brought to bear necessary taxes, Fisher Ames sternly advised Treasury Secretary Oliver Walcott in January 1800, I am afraid they are unfit for an independent government. During the 1800 presidential campaign, Ames became the brooding conscience of federalism by incessantly invoking in published essays and private letters the specter of France to rally opposition to Jefferson's election. Regardless of his personal prudence, Jefferson must act as his party will have him, warned Ames, a recently retired member of Congress, who would later be offered the presidency of Harvard College. Behold France, what is theory here is fact there, he asserted. The men, the means, the end of such a government as Jefferson must prefer will soon ensure war with Great Britain, alliance with France, plunder, and anarchy. In a widely circulated essay, Ames added that if in the presidential election the American Jacobins should prevail, the people would be crushed, as in France, under tyranny more vindictive, unfeeling, and rapacious than that of Tiberius, Nero, or Caligula. In countless Federalist editorials, Bonaparte came to personify the likely consequence of excessive republicanism. Endlessly compared to Caesar and Cromwell, he became the tyrannical usurper of legitimate authority, put forward as a warning for true patriots. Behold France, that open hell! still ringing with agonies and blasphemies, still smoking with sufferings and crimes, in which we see their state of torment, and perhaps our future state, Ames wrote. Friends of virtue, if you will not attend the election and lend to liberty the help of your votes, within two years you will have to defend her cause with your swords. The Federalists, Jefferson now became the great archpriest of Jacobinism and infidelity. No less stark in their rhetoric, Republicans drew a very different moral from Bonaparte's military coup. A standing army threatens popular democracy. At first, America could only guess what Bonaparte intended to do with his political power. Whatever his views may be, 
Jefferson wrote to Samuel Adams early in 1800, he has at least transferred the destinies of the Republic from the civil to the military arm. Some will use this as a lesson against the practicability of Republican government. I read it as a lesson against the danger of standing armies. Madison made similar comments to Jefferson at the time. Whether the lesson from Napoleon's coup will have the proper effect here in turning public attention to the danger of military usurpations, he wrote, is more than I can say. A stronger one was perhaps never given, nor to a country more in a situation to profit by it. Republican printers picked up this theme and published it throughout the land. Nothing more solemnly points out the danger to free governments from a standing army than the recent events of France, the Aurora noted. Every reader knew which standing army these Republicans feared. The additional army, now led by Alexander Hamilton. In private letters and conversations, Republicans began referring to Hamilton as our Bonaparte. The enemies of our Constitution are preparing a fearful operation, Jefferson warned a fellow Virginian in February 1800. Our Bonaparte, surrounded by his comrades in arms, may step in to give us political salvation in his way. Indeed, in February 1799, Hamilton had privately proposed just such a military maneuver against radical Republicans in Virginia. Perhaps getting wind of this threat, Adams worried aloud in March 1799 to his political confidant, Elbridge Gerry, that some extreme Federalists were endeavoring to get an army on foot to give Hamilton the command of it and then proclaim a regal government. For over a decade... Jefferson and the Republicans had stressed the fundamental similarities linking the French and American experiments with democracy, and expressed their hopes that both experiments would ultimately turn out all right. Indeed, they regularly complained that Royalists in England and Federalists in America exaggerated the excesses of Republican France. For some Republicans— Seeing their cause as an integral part of an international movement magnified its significance and their own importance. Upon learning that Bonaparte had imposed military rule in France, however, they began pointing to differences between the two cases, and arguing that contrary to Federalist warnings, greater democracy in America need not lead to a Napoleonic outcome. The people of France, having never been in the habit of self-government, are not yet in the habit of acknowledging that fundamental law of nature by which alone self-government can be exercised in a society, Jefferson wrote upon hearing of Bonaparte's coup. I mean the lex majoris partis, or law of the majority. In contrast, he implied, Americans took that principle to heart. It is very material, Jefferson added, for American citizens to be made sensible that their own character and situation are materially different from the French, and that whatever may be the fate of republicanism there, we are able to preserve it inviolate here. Jefferson especially worried that if Bonaparte declared himself leader for life and brought peace to his troubled land— then Americans might become more receptive to high Federalist notions of a lifetime president or American monarch. The late defection of France has left America the only theater on which true liberty can have a fair trial, Madison lamented to Jefferson. The tightly knit network of Republican papers reported the news from France in Jeffersonian terms. In their striving for liberty and democracy, a long essay in the Aurora explained, the French had to struggle not only against all the evils of the most enormous and corrupt religious hierarchy that ever existed, against the most numerous and useless body of privileged idlers that ever aggrieved a nation, but against the widespread influence of a wicked, debauched, 
and unprincipled court. The legacy of religious, aristocratic, and monarchic domination made stable republican rule much more difficult to sustain in France than in the historically self-governing American states, the essayist suggested. Our vessel is moored at such a distance, Jefferson wrote of the French, that should theirs blow up, ours is still safe, if we will but think so. Republican newspapers widely reprinted rumors that British agents had aided Bonaparte in his coup and suggested that they might support an American military usurper as well. The Republicans had Hamilton and his additional army squarely in their sights in doing so. Adams later viewed such newspaper attacks on the army, a thousand anecdotes, he called them, propagated and believed, as central to the Republican campaign against him. Federalists had the legal means to fight back against such Republican attacks, and they readily used them now. Back in 1798, during the height of political and military tensions with France following the XYZ affair, Federalists in Congress had pushed through the Sedition Act with the purpose of silencing critics of the government in the name of national security. The law made it a crime, punishable by fine and imprisonment, to write, print, utter, or publish any false, scandalous, and malicious writing or writings against the government, the Congress, or the President of the United States with intent to defame. Jefferson had denounced the measure as palpably in the teeth of the Constitution, and even Hamilton viewed it as imprudent. But with strong support from high Federalists in Congress, it passed on what amounted to a party-line vote, and Adams had signed it into law. Outraged by the Act and companion measures raising the bar for citizenship and authorizing the deportation of aliens, Republican-dominated state legislatures in Kentucky and Virginia passed resolutions secretly drafted by Jefferson and Madison challenging the constitutionality of the Alien and Sedition Acts. The Kentucky Resolution went so far as to declare the acts altogether void and of no force. Privately, Jefferson characterized this entire period of high Federalist lawmaking as a reign of witches. Undeterred by the outcry that had followed enactment of the Sedition Act, Federalist prosecutors made partisan use of it from the start, and now brought ever more prosecutions during the run-up to the presidential election. Even before its passage, Federalists had freely admitted that the Sedition Act targeted the Republican press. After all, they passed the law as a wartime security measure, and many of them viewed Republican printers as potentially dangerous and possibly treasonous Francophiles. At the time, most American newspapers were openly partisan, with some going so far as to include party labels in their mastheads. Many received financial support and editorial copy from party sources. As a rule, newspapers did not then practice balanced reporting. Diversity came through the variety of publications within a community, many of them low-budget four-page weeklies, rather than from various voices collected within any one source. Readers expected to receive slanted reports with little distinction between news articles and editorial commentary. The best way to silence a partisan viewpoint was to shut down its newspapers. Aside from pamphlets, no other means of mass communication then existed. Although a majority of newspapers wore a Federalist face, Republican outlets more than made up for their lesser numbers by their intense partisanship. Through Philadelphia's Aurora, Boston's Independent Chronicle, and New York's Argus, all of which supplied original copy for other newspapers, the Republican voice was heard across the land. 
Each of these three papers had become the subject of multiple prosecutions under the Sedition Act or related laws. In all, federal attorneys brought at least 17 indictments against Republican newspapers between 1798 and 1800, with most of these cases intended to shut down presses during the run-up to critical elections. Some succeeded in that objective, but new Republican papers quickly replaced shuttered ones. The most vigorous and undisguised efforts are making to crush the Republican presses and stifle inquiry as it may respect the ensuing election, one Republican senator privately advised Madison in April 1800. With Adams's full knowledge, Secretary of State Timothy Pickering coordinated the legal assault. According to Pickering, the Sedition Act could not possibly violate the Constitution because it punished only pests of society and disturbers of order. Partisan attacks on the additional army particularly incensed Pickering, a Hamilton loyalist. Simply referring to the federal troops as a standing army could serve as grounds for an indictment. To the Revolutionary War generation in the United States, including both Federalists and Republicans, the term carried a sinister meaning. Under popular rule, Americans then commonly believed that citizen soldiers would turn out in sufficient numbers to defend their country in times of foreign invasion or domestic insurrection, and then return home after the danger passed. State militias acted in this manner and provided the bulk of American forces at the time. The citizen-soldier ideal was personified by George Washington. In contrast, Americans saw foreign tyrants using professional standing armies to usurp or maintain power against the popular will. In this respect, among the despotic abuses and usurpations of power, listed to justify the American Revolution, the Declaration of Independence specifically charged George III with having kept among us in times of peace standing armies. Even if not used to subdue popular rule, Americans at the time tended to view soldiers in a peacetime standing army as armed and potentially dangerous idle young men living well at taxpayer expense. This is why, in 1798, when Federalists in Congress authorized a full-time force to counter any potential invasion by France, they pointedly called it an additional army, as in one temporarily added to deal with a particular danger, rather than a permanent or standing army. Always fearful that Hamilton might use the force against them, or even to usurp power for himself, Republicans naturally denounced it as a standing army. The term stung. If believed, it could cost votes for Adams and other Federalists. Responding to criticisms of the army in May 1800, Adams ordered it disbanded, which caused him grief from both high Federalists, who still strongly supported it, and suspicious Republicans, who questioned his motives. By this time, many saw Adams's decision as purely motivated by politics, including some disgruntled members of his own party. By a disbanding of the army, the uncompromising high Federalist printer William Cobbett observed disapprovingly, Adams was now laying in a provision of popularity against the ensuing election for president. It was too late for him to win over many Republican voters, however. Adams moved to disband the army shortly after two high-profile trials focused national attention on Republican denunciations of it as a standing army. These prosecutions, both heard in April before prominent high Federalist justices of the United States Supreme Court, sitting as trial judges for criminal prosecutions, involved printers charged with violating the Sedition Act. Their indictments covered more than simply their depictions of the federal military as a standing army. But that became a key issue in both cases, 
and the only grounds for conviction in one. Occurring as they did during the election season, and clearly timed to shut down Republican presses before the election, these cases became an integral part of the presidential campaign. For Federalists, they showed the government's patriotic commitment to maintaining domestic security and civil order. For Republicans, they demonstrated Adams's despotic disregard of individual liberty. The first trial involved Charles Holt, a fiery iconoclast who, in 1797, opened the first Republican newspaper in the rock-ribbed Federalist state of Connecticut. He called it the Bee because of its sting. Federal prosecutors indicted Holt for publishing a reader's letter suggesting that although Americans would readily give their lives to defend their country, no worthy recruits would devote their valor to promote the views of ambition or to oppose their country and prosperity with a standing army. In his charge to the jury, Justice Bushrod Washington, the former president's nephew, declared the publication to be libelous beyond even the possibility of a doubt, and virtually instructed the jurors to convict Holt, which they did. His three-month incarceration shut down the bee for a significant segment of the election season. Less than a week after Holt's conviction in Connecticut, the Northumberland, Pennsylvania newspaper printer Thomas Cooper a radical English émigré with legal training and a bitter biting wit, went on trial in Philadelphia before Justice Samuel Chase. Although Cooper had attracted the administration's attention with a 1799 article that Adams denounced as a libel against the whole government, and as such ought to be prosecuted. The 1800 indictment involved a political handbill. Among other partisan accusations, it charged Adams with seeking to maintain a standing army. Abigail Adams had already pronounced her judgment in a letter to her sister stating that Cooper, in his former mad democratic style, abused the president and, I presume, subjected himself to the penalty of the Sedition Act. Conducted in Philadelphia, the nation's capital, Cooper's trial became a sensational political event. Pickering attended it daily, along with two other members of the cabinet and several leading members of Congress. A more oppressive and disgusting proceeding I never saw, Republican Senator Stevens Thomas Mason complained in a letter to Madison. Chase in his charge to the jury, in a speech of an hour, showed all the zeal of a well-feed lawyer and the rancor of a vindictive and implacable enemy. In that charge, Chase articulated the Federalist argument for prosecuting sedition, and made it stick against Cooper. If a man attempts to destroy the confidence of the people in their officers, their supreme magistrate, and their legislature, he effectively saps the foundation of the government, Chase told jurors. A Republican government can only be destroyed in two ways, the introduction of luxury or the licentiousness of the press. Upon Cooper's conviction, the court sentenced him to six months in the local prison, which the Aurora dubbed Chase's Repository of Republicans. Both convictions backfired on Federalists by transforming small-town printers into nationally known martyrs to the cause of a free press. Republican newspapers depicted the trials as politically motivated election-year witch-hunts. Far from silencing Holt and Cooper, both men denounced their convictions in articles from jail, and emerged from incarceration more defiant than ever. Holt resumed publishing the Bee in time for the election swinging at every Federalist in sight. Punishment only hardens printers, and pleases the fellows, he wrote, for they come out of jail holding their heads higher than if they had never been persecuted. Cooper emerged from jail in Pennsylvania, hailed by Republicans in public celebrations as the conspicuous victim of the sedition law and the able advocate of universal liberty. 
Federalists hoped that criminal convictions would discredit anti-government printers. And perhaps they did, in some eyes. But they also galvanized the opposition and turned the Sedition Act into a major issue in the presidential campaign. Vermont voters had already rendered their verdict on the act in the fall of 1798. By re-electing to Congress a Republican politician and printer, Matthew Lyon, convicted of violating it. Carried back into office on a wave of sympathy aroused in part by graphic depictions of his confinement in a common cell with hardened criminals, Lyon won by a two-to-one margin over the Federalist printer, who helped to put him in jail. When Federalists in Congress passed the Alien and Sedition Acts within weeks of authorizing a larger army during the summer of 1798, Jefferson had begun dreading their next move. I consider these laws as merely an experiment on the American mind to see how far it will bear an avowed violation of the Constitution, he wrote. If this goes down, we shall immediately see attempted another act of Congress declaring that the President shall continue in office during life reserving to another occasion the transfer of the succession to his heirs and the establishment of the Senate for life. Although the course of events Jefferson feared never materialized, an effort seen by some as being in the same spirit was made later. In February 1800, following his defeat in Pennsylvania's bitter gubernatorial contest, James Ross introduced a bill in the U.S. Senate that could have all but given control over choosing the next president to the Federalist-dominated Congress. As originally drafted, the Ross bill would have created a 13-member Grand Committee to rule on the qualifications of presidential electors. Each House of Congress would appoint six of its members to the committee, and the Chief Justice would chair it. As amended in the Senate, the thirteenth member became a senator chosen by the House of Representatives rather than the Chief Justice. The report of the majority of the said committee shall be final and conclusive determination of the admissibility or inadmissibility of the votes given by the electors for president and vice president, the legislation stated. That provision would have authorized a partisan committee meeting in secret, to nullify any number of electoral votes, and thereby to swing the election as it chose. Publicly, the bill's sponsors claimed that it would simply provide a procedure for weeding out invalid electoral votes, such as those cast either by electors never properly appointed, or for an ineligible presidential candidate. Privately, they acknowledged that it targeted a particular threat posed by Pennsylvania. In fact, Ross may not have intended anything more with his bill than to guard against electoral vote shenanigans by Pennsylvania Governor Thomas McKean, whom he had good reason to distrust. Following McKean's election, Federalists in control of the Pennsylvania Senate refused to accept Republican proposals to reenact the law providing for the election of presidential electors by a statewide general ticket, which both sides thought would once again award the state's electoral votes to Jefferson. They wanted electors chosen by districts, which would surely secure at least some votes for Adams. By February, it became apparent that a stalemate might ensue. Federalists worried what McKean might do if no election law passed in Pennsylvania. There being no law in the state, U.S. House Speaker Theodore Sedgwick noted in a letter to another high Federalist, the governor had declared, and the Jacobins propagated the report, that he would call on the people by proclamation to choose electors, and that he would return their votes. In short, Federalists feared that McKean might order an extra-legal statewide election by executive fiat. Treasury Secretary Oliver Walcott warned darkly, 
If this course should be pursued, and the choice of a president should depend on the votes of Pennsylvania, a civil war will not be improbable. Ross wanted a mechanism in place to exclude any such tainted electoral votes from counting. If this represented the full extent of Ross's intent, however, then his bill overreached its objectives. In fact, since Federalists controlled both houses of Congress, under Ross's proposal, a committee of their choosing would effectively decide which electors could vote from every state. In their growing and also understandable paranoia, Republicans read this sweeping purpose into the overbroad bill. Some intemperate Federalists fed Republican fears. This bill was a sweeper, the incendiary Federalist printer William Cobbett wrote. It would have, in reality, placed the election of the President in the hands of the Senate alone. That it would be much better for the country were the election in the hands of the Senate is certain, but it would have been fairer to pass a law directly to that effect. The debate over this so-called Ross Bill showed the level of distrust that had descended on national politics by early 1800. During the Senate's contentious debate over the bill, Charles Pinckney of South Carolina took the lead in outlining Republican concerns. In every state where the election is strongly contested, there will, of course, be a minority, he explained. If that losing side was Federalist, then its members could easily discover the means of raising objections to the validity of the return of electors, insist that they themselves are elected, proceed to the length of meeting and voting, and transmit to Congress a second return. The Federalist-dominated Grand Committee would then decide which return counted. This led Pinckney to ask rhetorically, Knowing the situation of the Union, how differently some states think from others, and how divided Congress have been for some years on certain great and trying subjects, who can doubt the potential for partisan abuses in vote counting that could throw almost every state into violent scenes which can never arise but from this bill. Both sides could threaten civil war over this issue. Such objections did not deter the Senate from passing the bill over unified Republican opposition, however, and sending it to the House of Representatives, where moderate Federalists held the balance of power between high Federalists and Republicans. The Senate debated the Ross Bill in closed sessions, with the text of the legislation kept secret until the Aurora published a pirated copy of it in late February 1800. Then the public storm burst. Republicans charged that the bill would violate states' rights and undermine popular rule. Virginia Senator Stevens Thomas Mason spoke of its obnoxious principles. Republican organizer John Beckley called it a deadly blow, aimed at us. Madison declared that it violated the Constitution by giving Congress too much control over choosing the president. Protests flowed from Republican presses. The bill brought into the Senate by Mr. Ross, one editorial charged, was as daring an attempt on the Constitution of the United States as that of Bonaparte on that of France. The Aurora led the Republican outcry with almost daily reports critical of the Senate and its alarming attempt upon the freedom of this state. One of its articles compared Ross's Grand Committee to the aristocratic Venetian Council that had long held the power to choose leaders in the Italian Republic of Venice. Another asked, if there was nothing dangerous or hostile to the liberties of the people in this bill, why has its publication given those who support it so much and such extraordinary alarm? Senate Federalists struck back at the Aurora's pugnacious editor, William Duane, by taking the unprecedented step of forming a committee of privilege to investigate his publication of the pirated bill. 
Born in colonial America to Irish parents, reared in Ireland, and deported from British India for publishing an anti-government newspaper in Calcutta, Duane had irritated Federalists ever since he had taken over the Aurora in 1798, following the death of its crusading founding editor, Benjamin Franklin Beach, a grandson of Benjamin Franklin. Is there anything evil in the regions of actuality or possibility that the Aurora has not suggested of me? Adams complained to Pickering in 1799. The matchless effrontery of this Duane merits the execution of the alien law. I am very willing to try its strength upon him. Twice indicted for sedition, but never under the Alien Act, the wily Duane managed to escape conviction and keep publishing his paper. Now the Senate sought to punish him directly. Inevitably, the Aurora's second-hand reports of closed Senate proceedings on the Ross Bill contained inaccuracies, some of them potentially inflammatory. The Committee of Privilege investigated these false statements, as well as Duane's publication of the bill itself. The right of self-preservation is vested in the Senate, High Federalist Senator Uriah Tracy argued in support of pursuing Duane. If it is admitted that we have the right of protecting ourselves within these walls from attacks made in our presence, it follows, of course, that we are not to be slandered and questioned elsewhere. In mid-March, the Senate, in a series of bitterly contested, highly partisan votes, accepted the committee's finding that by his publications about the Ross Bill, Duane had breached Senate privileges. It ordered him to appear before the Senate for sentencing. Instead of presenting himself, Duane went into hiding until Congress adjourned. The Senate responded by ordering Duane's arrest for contempt but could only plead for assistance in catching him. No one helped. Duane continued feeding copy to the Aurora on a daily basis, including scathing attacks on the Ross Bill and the proceedings against him. One Republican senator described the scene to Madison. Although you and all persons in the United States, including no doubt Army and Navy, are called on to assist in apprehending him, he is not yet taken. Taunting his hapless and ham-fisted Senate persecutors, a notice in the Aurora stated that written messages delivered to Duane at the newspaper's office would be sure to reach him in less than forty-eight hours. In so far as public opinion mattered, Marshall thought that the Senate misplayed its hand badly. Questions of privilege are delicate in their nature, he commented on the case, and such as are most apt to interest the public mind against those who exercise the power of punishing for its breach. Even as Republicans publicly bewailed Senate action on the Ross Bill, Jefferson, who watched over the entire affair as vice president, privately took comfort in the measure's uncertain prospects in the House of Representatives. Under the Constitution, the House alone chooses the President in case of a tie or the failure of anyone to receive votes from a majority of electors. Given this institutional consideration, Jefferson doubted that House members would go along with a bill giving power over the electoral process to Senators. He foresaw a deadlock between the Senate and the House on the issue, as did Senator Stevens Thompson Mason of Virginia. Writing to Madison in March, Mason predicted that the House of Representatives will hardly be induced to accede to an arrangement which will place the Senate on an equal footing with themselves. In the House, John Marshall led the effort by moderate Federalists to rewrite the Ross Bill. He did not believe that Congress should delegate power to rule on the qualification of electors to a committee. First, Marshall raised constitutional concerns. On this question, wrote House Speaker Theodore Sedgwick, a high Federalist proponent of the bill, 
I had a long conversation with Marshall, and he finally confessed himself, for there is not a more candid man on earth, to be convinced. He then resorted to another ground of opposition. Although the power was not indelegable, yet he thought in its nature it was too delicate to be delegated. Marshall agreed with Sedgwick and other high Federalists that Congress should have some means to exclude ineligible electoral votes. But he felt the Ross Bill went too far. The first-term congressman from Virginia stood his ground on principle against the House Speaker, who privately complained that Marshall read the Constitution narrowly, like a criminal statute, rather than broadly to serve partisan purposes. He offered alternative legislation which passed the House to create a special joint committee to advise Congress on the admissibility of disputed electoral ballots. But the Senate wanted more. Let me do what I will, Marshall wrote to his brother about the dispute that swirled around him. I am sure the Republicans will abuse me, and therefore I need only try to satisfy myself. Ultimately, Federalists in the House and Senate failed to reach a compromise on the legislation, and it died. The session of Congress that began in December 1799 by marking Washington's death and ended in May 1800 remained mired in partisan discord throughout and accomplished little in the end. Abigail Adams saw it coming. Next week, Congress meet she wrote at the outset. Electioneering has already begun. There will be more things aimed at than will be carried by either Jacobins or Federalists, but the Jacobins are always more subtle and industrious than their opponents. The High Federalist Speaker of the House advised his partisans in December 1799, In all our measures we must never lose sight of the next election of President. Members of Congress on both sides followed this approach, prompting Fisher Ames to comment midway through the session, Our parties in Congress seem to regard that approaching election as the only object of attention. When the session ended, Jefferson expressed relief that it had not gone too badly for his party. Congress will rise today, he wrote to Madison. On the whole, the Federalists have not been able to carry a single strong measure in the lower house the whole session. When they met, it was believed they had a majority of twenty. But public opinion set so strongly against the Federal proceedings that this melted off their majority and dismayed the heroes of the party. The Senate alone remained undismayed to the last. Firm to their purpose, regardless of public opinion, and more disposed to coerce than to court it. Not a man of their majority gave way in the least. At the time, of course, voters elected members to the House, while state legislatures appointed senators. Frustrated by his failure to push through high Federalist measures, House Speaker Sedgwick also attributed what he called a real feebleness of character in the House to the influence of public opinion on moderate members, particularly John Marshall. He is disposed on all popular subjects to feel the public pulse, Sedgwick wrote. Doubts suggested by him create in more feeble minds those which are irremovable. At the time, politicians had to trust their instincts regarding public opinion. No one conducted polls. Jefferson could not count Federalist defeats as Republican victories, however. Failure of the Ross Bill did not assure him of Pennsylvania's crucial electoral votes. A partisan stalemate over adopting a method to choose electors in that state remained possible. In the face of continued intransigence by Federalists in the state Senate, McKean disavowed earlier suggestions that he might order a statewide election by executive fiat. With or without Ross's Grand Committee, he concluded that Federalists in Congress would find some way to disallow the votes. 
McKean decided to wait until the October Pennsylvania legislative elections. If the Republicans took control of the state Senate from the Federalists, then he would call an eleventh-hour special session of the legislature to appoint electors. If the Republicans failed to gain the majority, then Pennsylvania might not vote. Nothing in the National Constitution actually required states to cast electoral votes, and no state could do so without enacting a method for choosing electors. With nine months to go before the Electoral College met on December 3rd, Jefferson viewed the political landscape much as other seasoned observers did. This seems to be the prospect. Keep out Pennsylvania, Jersey, and New York, and the rest of the states are about equally divided, he wrote to Madison on March 8, 1800. States favorable to the Federalists, which included the five New England states, Delaware and Maryland, would have 52 electors. The pro-Republican southern and western states of Virginia, the Carolinas, Georgia, Kentucky, and Tennessee would have exactly the same number of electors. In 1796, all but three of the former group had voted for Adams, while all but two of the latter had voted for Jefferson. These five rogue electors had been selected in district elections, with the three for Jefferson in Maryland and the one each for Adams in Virginia and North Carolina. Most observers, including Jefferson, expected similar returns from these states in 1800. They constituted each candidate's base. Then the event depends on the three middle states before mentioned, Jefferson concluded in his letter. If Pennsylvania votes, then either Jersey or New York giving a Republican vote decides the election. If Pennsylvania does not vote, then New York determines the election. Jefferson naturally assumed that Pennsylvania, with McKean as governor and the Republicans firmly in control of at least one house of the state legislature, would vote for him, if it voted. Under this electoral calculus, Jefferson needed to carry either New York, with twelve electors, or New Jersey, with seven, even if he received votes from all fifteen Pennsylvania electors. He needed at least New York if Pennsylvania did not vote. In both New York and New Jersey, state legislators selected the electors and had chosen all Federalists in 1796. The Federalists still controlled the legislatures of both states going into 1800. But elections that year would decide which party held the most seats in each when it came time to choose electors in the fall. In each state, whichever party held the most seats in its legislature would get all of its electors. New Jersey was virtually a lost cause for the Republicans, but New York had a mixed political tradition. Although Federalist icon John Jay had served as New York's governor since 1795, and Hamilton lived in New York City, Republican stalwart George Clinton served nine terms as governor prior to Jay and had carried New York's electoral votes for vice president against Adams in 1792. During the 1790s, one of the New York's U.S. Senate seats had passed back and forth between Hamilton's Federalist father-in-law, Philip Schuyler, and Republican Aaron Burr, as the state legislature twice changed hands between the parties. In 1800, the Republicans could at least hope to retake the New York legislature but Hamilton and his followers would oppose them. All political eyes now turned toward New York, which held its state elections in April. The legislature chosen in that election would name New York's electors. Considering everything that needed to fall into place for him to gain votes from a majority of the electors, and despite the advances made by Republicans in Pennsylvania and Virginia, Jefferson concluded... Upon the whole, I consider it as rather more doubtful than the last election. Without New York, he would again likely fall just shy of a majority. Although he did not express his views so clearly in a letter, Adams apparently viewed the prospects in much the same way as Jefferson did, and looked to New York with equal anticipation.
Chapter 4 Burr versus Hamilton If the road to the presidency in 1800 lay through New York, then Jefferson would have to ride to victory on Aaron Burr's Republican campaign machinery. At the time, few politicians fully trusted Burr, and many actively disliked him. But no one doubted his influence over local politics in New York City, which then dominated that of its state. In April 1800, New York voters would elect the legislature empowered to select the state's twelve presidential electors, with New York City's large delegation in the lower house holding the balance of power. In 1796, Federalists controlling the state legislature had selected electors loyal to Adams and Thomas Pinckney. If Jefferson could capture those votes this time, he would likely win the election. Only Burr could deliver them by orchestrating a Republican takeover of the state legislature. But he would have to beat Alexander Hamilton to do so. New York boasted a gallery full of high Federalist luminaries. During the spring of 1800, Alexander Hamilton commanded the nation's army from his headquarters in New York City. Governor Morris took office as the state's new senator, and John Jay served as governor in Albany. Federalists controlled both houses of the state legislature going into the April legislative elections, and rejected a Republican proposal to choose presidential electors by district elections which surely would have split the state's electoral vote in 1800. By retaining legislative appointment for presidential electors, New York Federalists hoped to deliver all of them for their party's candidates, just as they had in every previous presidential contest. Burr had other ideas, which required a Republican victory in the April elections. With a singleness of purpose that awed friend and foe alike, he set about to make it happen. Hamilton, already Burr's rival, stood determined to stop him and maintain Federalist rule in New York. The contest became a historic clash within the larger presidential campaign. The 1800 census reported that New York City had finally surpassed Philadelphia as the nation's largest city and principal port. Yet this increasingly cosmopolitan city, founded by the Dutch in 1626, conquered by the British in 1664, and bloated by German and Irish immigrants during the late 1700s, could not comfortably contain two men with such enormous egos and soaring ambitions as Burr and Hamilton. Short in stature, but strikingly handsome and able to charm, they were destined to come into conflict repeatedly, and have their relationship end in a deadly duel. The election of 1800 neither began nor finished their rivalry for power and influence. Rather, it intensified it greatly. The parallels and perpendicularities between the two men were almost eerie. Born during the mid-1750s within a year of each other, Burr and Hamilton came from dramatically different backgrounds. Son of Aaron Burr, Sr., a noted theologian and Princeton College president, and Esther Edwards, the scholarly daughter of the legendary evangelical minister Jonathan Edwards, Burr boasted a matchless American pedigree, dating back to the earliest Puritan settlers of New England. I have never known in any country the prejudice in favor of birth, parentage, and descent more conspicuous than that in the instance of Colonel Burr, John Adams once observed. In contrast, Adams slurred Hamilton as a bastard brat of a Scotch peddler. For his out-of-wedlock birth to a drifting trader and married Frenchwoman on the British West Indies island of Nevis, Adams made the comment about Hamilton in 1806, long after their bitter personal and policy disputes, which Adams never forgot or forgave, became public. Both Burr and Hamilton lost their parents at an early age, and became wards of maternal relatives. Burr gained easy entry into Princeton, 
while Hamilton overcame all odds by securing a place at King's College, later Columbia, in New York. Burr considered following his father and grandfather into the ministry, but soon rejected the idea, and never again showed marked interest in religion. Like Hamilton, Burr enjoyed a self-gratifying life punctuated with extramarital affairs. The Revolutionary War interrupted their academic studies, with both men joining the Patriot Army, serving on Washington's personal staff and rising to the rank of colonel. Whereas Washington grew to rely heavily on Hamilton and trust him implicitly, the general quickly lost faith in Burr and had him transferred to combat positions, where he served with distinction. Years later, Washington insisted that Hamilton become his second in command for the additional army over President Adams's objection but refused Adams's recommendation that Burr become a brigadier general in the same force. Colonel Burr is a brave and able officer, Washington conceded at the time, but the question is whether he has not equal talents at intrigue. The comment infuriated Adams, who, when later recalling it, denounced Washington's pick, Alexander Hamilton, as the most restless, impatient, artful, indefatigable, and unprincipled intriguer in the United States, if not the world. Burr and Hamilton inevitably excited passions. After the Revolutionary War, both men gained eminence as two of the brightest lawyers in the booming city of New York. As attorneys, Burr and Hamilton occasionally collaborated on cases— including as co-counsel for the defense in a sensational murder trial during the weeks leading up to the election of April 1800. They married well and joined the city's social elite, although Burr's extravagant expenses often exceeded his sizable income. Each of them compounded his personal influence by attracting and sustaining a trusted circle of loyal lieutenants. Hamilton tended to draw in men of independent means and social standing, some much older than himself. Burr, in contrast, attracted a small corps of rising young New Yorkers, known as Burrites, who devoted themselves to his causes. It was ever one of his characteristics to secure inviolable the attachment of his friends, one of them later wrote. It was here that Colonel Burr was all-powerful, for he possessed in a preeminent degree the art of fascinating the youthful. Politics consumed both men by the late 1780s, but they chose different sides. Hamilton and his father-in-law, Philip Schuyler, became leading Federalists. Burr gravitated toward the circle of the state's seven-term anti-Federalist and later Republican governor, George Clinton, first when serving in the state legislature, and then as Clinton's attorney general. Within state politics, their relative prominence rose and fell as power passed back and forth between the two parties during the 1790s. Even as Hamilton gained national influence as Washington's principal advisor and treasury secretary, when Clinton's faction took over the state legislature in 1791, for example, Legislators chose Burr to replace Schuyler in the United States Senate. But Schuyler reclaimed the seat from Burr six years later after Federalists took back the legislature. In an effort to reach beyond their southern base, Republicans looked to New York, a critical battleground state in the North, for their vice presidential candidates. The first nod went to Clinton in 1792, and then again to him in 1804 and 1808. In 1796, however, many national Republicans favored Burr, but he secured only 30 electoral votes when some Southern Republican electors gave their second votes to Samuel Adams or Clinton. The experience both fed Burr's national ambitions and drove him to insist on strict party loyalty should he again stand for the vice presidency. In contrast to Hamilton, who remained a principled high Federalist, 
and accumulated political power through ideological purity, Burr saw his path to glory through pragmatic politics. He took ideologically inconsistent stands on various issues, and even courted Federalist support for a possible run against Clinton as governor in 1792, a move that Hamilton blocked within his party. Still smarting from his father-in-law's defeat for the Senate at Burr's hand a year earlier, Hamilton warned a Federalist confidant at the time, As a public man, Burr is one of the worst sorts, a friend to nothing but as suits his interest and ambition, determined to climb to the highest honors of state, and as much higher as circumstances may permit. He cares nothing about the means of affecting his purpose. Drawing on a historical analogy that his own opponents leveled against him, Hamilton concluded, If we have an embryo Caesar in the United States, tis Burr. Losing his U.S. Senate seat in 1797 did not deter Burr. Again elected to the state legislature a year later, he supported legislation benefiting his investments, including a bill chartering the Manhattan Company, a banking institution disguised as a water company that offered borrowers a Republican alternative to the Bank of New York and the local branch of the Bank of the United States, both of which Federalists controlled. Defeated for re-election in 1799 amid accusations of self-dealing, Burr determined to build a Republican political machine that would stabilize his political fortunes. He set his sights on the April 1800 legislative election, with the goal of securing the state for Jefferson and the vice presidency for himself. Hamilton stood in the way. In his brooding historical novel about Burr, Gore Vidal has his anti-hero say at this point in the narrative, I suspect that when Hamilton looks at me, he sees, in some magical way, himself reflected. It would have been a mirror image with many parts reversed. Partisans on both sides and in all parts of the country watched the New York City election closely, analyzing the overall contest for president in a March letter to Madison Jefferson stressed the significance of that one local election for the ultimate outcome. If the city election of New York is in favor of the Republican ticket, the issue will be Republican. If the federal ticket for the city of New York prevails, the probability will be in favor of a federal issue, he wrote. The election of New York being in April, it becomes an early and interesting object. Federalists attached similar importance to the event. We are full of anxiety here about the election of our members to the legislature, Hamilton's close friend and political ally Robert Troop observed in March. We must bring into action all our energies. If we do not, Jefferson will be in. As the election neared, Maryland's Charles Carroll of Carrollton wrote nervously to Hamilton, it is asserted with confidence by the anti-federal party here that all your electors will vote for Mr. Jefferson as president. If such an event shall really happen, it is probable he will be chosen. Of such a choice, the consequences to this country may be dreadful. The precarious balance of both national and New York state politics made the city election pivotal. Assuming, as most then did, that Adams would carry the Northeast and Jefferson would sweep the South and West, New York's twelve electoral votes might well decide the difference. Certainly they were critical for Adams's victory in 1796, and could be again in 1800. Federalists held an eight- or nine-seat majority in the New York Senate prior to the April election, but only a slight edge in the lower house or state assembly. Members of both houses voted as a single body for presidential electors, with each senator and assemblyman having an equal vote. New York City, then a densely packed urban center confined to the southern end of Manhattan Island, chose its thirteen members of the state assembly 
and a single citywide election, with voters from all seven of the city's wards able to vote for each of the seats. If either party swept the city's thirteen assembly contests, which the Federalists had done by a wide margin in the previous election, then that party would likely hold a majority of seats in the next state legislature and gain all of New York's electoral votes. Burr explained this to Jefferson in a private meeting on January 18, 1800, and Jefferson passed the explanation on to Virginia Governor James Monroe. In the new election, which is to come along in April, three or four in the Senate will be changed in our favor, he wrote, based on Burr's analysis. In the Assembly, the county elections will still be better than last, but still all will depend on on the city election. Going into the city election, party leaders on both sides expected to win. Following his meeting with Burr, Jefferson confidently predicted, at present there would be no doubt of our carrying our ticket there. On the eve of the election, High Federalist Christopher Gore, a future Massachusetts governor and United States senator, wrote from New York City to the American ambassador in London, your fellow citizens here are busy electioneering. The parties are desirous of securing their favorites, and each is sanguine. Hamilton is sure of success, and I understand the other side is equally so. By their nature, both Burr and Hamilton exuded confidence, but only one of them could win this contest. Despite its early date, the New York City election became the clearest test of popular opinion on the 1800 presidential race ever conducted in a competitive setting. The local press focused squarely on national issues, not state ones. The looming showdown between Jefferson and Adams subverted the local race to national ends and relegated the assembly candidates to the role of willing surrogates for the presidential aspirants. Observing in late April that the election of a president on either side depends upon the city of New York, the Federalist commercial advertiser urged every friend to the Constitution and peace of his country to make the most vigorous exertions in favor of the federal interest. Those became the Federalist campaign themes, preserving the current constitutional order and domestic security by voting for the entire party ticket. The local press rarely mentioned any of the state issues that normally dominate legislative campaigns. Citizens, choose your sides, another New York Federalist newspaper proclaimed. You who are for French notions of government, for the tempestuous sea of anarchy and misrule, for arming the poor against the rich, for fraternizing with the foes of God and man, Go to the left and support the leaders or the dupes of the anti-federal junto. But you that are sober, industrious, thriving, and happy, give your votes for those men who mean to preserve the union of the states, the purity and vigor of our excellent Constitution, the sacred majesty of the laws, and the holy ordinances of religion. Christianity means nothing to Jefferson and his friends, many articles charged. The devil is in their hearts, one declared. In a flood of editorials, articles, and letters published in local Federalist newspapers during the weeks leading up to the April election, writers argued that Jefferson, Burr, and Clinton had opposed ratifying the Constitution and still hoped to abolish it, and with it domestic peace and prosperity for their own personal gain. Great God, is it possible, one Federalist asked. Even the apostate Madison, who co-authored the Constitution, is now leagued with them. Clinton served as an easy target, because as governor he led the opposition to ratifying the Federal Constitution in New York. Jefferson and Burr initially had qualms about the amount of power concentrated in the national government under the Constitution, 
but they did not oppose its ratification. Federalists warned that with Jefferson at the helm, the United States would become like revolutionary France, where Jacobins overthrew the civil order and Christian religion. Merchants, your ships will be condemned to rot in your harbors, or the navy which is their protection Jefferson will destroy, a typical Federalist editorial charged. The temples of the Most High will be profaned by the impious orgies of the goddess of reason, personated as in France by some common prostitute. After relating a long parade of horribles, another editorial implored voters, It is for you to decide whether these gloomy presages shall be realized, or whether we shall continue to flourish in our present splendor. And a single sentence that summarized the entire campaign, one editorial declared, Those of you who wish to preserve your liberty, religion, and the Constitution of the United States will support the federal ticket, with a long pull, a strong pull, and all pull together. Vote for the entire Federalist slate, it urged New Yorkers. Federalist publications, while explicit in their attacks on Jefferson, spoke in generalities about their own candidates and policies. Beyond their names and party affiliations, little appeared in the press about the thirteen candidates whom Hamilton rounded up to run on the Federalist ticket for the Assembly. Only two incumbents chose to stand for re-election, and the others had virtually no political experience. Most were tradesmen. John Adams later dismissed them as men of little weight, obscure in name, poor in purse, mean in talents, and meritorious only in that they were confidential friends of the great and good Hamilton. Abigail Adams called them men of no note, men wholly unfit for the purpose. Republicans openly speculated that Hamilton picked them solely because of their personal loyalty to him. In 1796, even though Hamilton had tried to swing the final electoral vote tally to Thomas Pinckney over Adams, he had worked vigorously to deliver New York for the Federalist ticket. The relationship between Adams and Hamilton, never good, had soured still further since 1796, and this may have influenced Hamilton's choice of legislative candidates. Adams's impulsive temperament, independent streak, and distrust of Hamilton had fueled the tensions between these two proud men, but his decision to send peace negotiators to France in 1798 and hostility toward the additional army had turned Hamilton into an implacable foe. By the time of the New York elections, Hamilton told friends that he could no longer support the president's re-election. Adams knew of these comments, and thereafter viewed Hamilton's actions with utmost suspicion. Indeed, Hamilton at this time was actively, if still secretly, conspiring with other high Federalists to replace Adams as the party's presidential candidate, with some politically viable member of their own faction, most likely Thomas Pinckney's brother Charles Coatsworth Pinckney. Having New York's twelve electors in his pocket could give to Hamilton as much influence over the Federalist choice for president as those same electors would give to Burr over the Republicans' choice for vice-president. Hamilton, who ruled Washington, Adams bitterly observed at the time, would still rule if he could. Not feeling the sting of Adams's temper and naturally favoring peace over war, the public tended to decide with the president over Hamilton and the high Federalists which incensed them all the more. To keep out the Republicans, Hamilton would not yet risk an open break with Adams even as he schemed to unseat him. To achieve his objectives, Hamilton instead apparently decided to promote individuals loyal to him for the New York legislature, rather than secure the strongest Federalist candidates, some of whom might favor Adams. With the New York legislature under his sway, 
Hamilton could then secure the selection of high Federalist electors more loyal to him than to Adams. At least Adams believed this was the motive for Hamilton's choice of lackluster legislative candidates. If true, it was a high-stakes gambit. Some historians have suggested that Hamilton simply wanted to reach out to common voters with a commoner's ticket. But that hardly fit his elitist style. He typically sought to stand tall rather than stoop low. Perhaps defensive about the Federalist slate, Hamilton's friend Robert Troop observed at the time, It is next to an impossibility to get men of weight and influence to serve in the lowly legislature. Regardless of the reason for their choice, according to reports that later reached Adams, when Burr read the list of Federalist candidates, he said of Hamilton, Now I have him all hollow. Even more striking, the Federalist press rarely mentioned Adams even when it denounced Jefferson by name. If the Federal ticket for the state legislature is carried, a Federal president will be chosen one typical appeal noted. If the Jacobin ticket succeeds, Mr. Jefferson will be president. These few words spoke volumes. If Hamilton held New York for the Federalists, then its electors would do his bidding. And it was clear enough to many that he had little interest in Adams's re-election. Both Hamilton and Burr played a multi-dimensional game of politics but they still needed the right cards to win. New York's Republican press responded to its Federalist counterpart by stressing the commitment of its party to constitutional liberty. Pushing national issues to the fore, it denounced Federalists for the Alien and Sedition Acts, the Standing Army and Useless Navy, high war taxes, the soaring national debt, creeping monarchism, and a ruinous allegiance to pro-British policies and British-style aristocracy. Peace or war, happiness or misery, opulence or ruin, these depend on the results of the approaching election. If the friends of liberty are zealous, the system of equal rights will yet flourish, one Republican writer exclaimed. The political happiness of America hangs suspended upon the fruit of your activity upon the present occasion, another added. Rise then with republican firmness, with energy and patriotic activity, in defense of those invaluable rights for which during the revolution you fought and bled. On the eve of the election, New York's leading Republican newspaper warned its readers that Federalists would charge that whoever disapproves of the administration of our government is an enemy to the Constitution. Stand firm, it urged readers, for if you waver, if you hesitate, if you neglect in this respect your duty, you will wreck upon the shoals of aristocratic design the vessel of state, which includes in it the liberties and happiness of the people. Republicans sensed that the public mood in New York was shifting in their favor. Two years earlier, at the height of the XYZ affair and rumors of a French invasion, Americans had sought security even at the expense of civil liberties. And Federalists in New York and elsewhere had done well. As fears of war passed and the cost of preparedness became apparent, the pendulum of popular opinion had begun swinging back toward the Republicans, as reflected in the Pennsylvania legislative elections six months earlier. A little patience, Jefferson predicted in 1798, and we shall see the people recovering their true sight, restore their government to its true principles. It is true that in the meantime we are suffering deeply in spirit and incurring the horrors of war and long oppression of enormous public debt. In March 1800 he advised Madison, The Republican spirit beginning to predominate in Pennsylvania, Jersey, and New York. There is the strongest expectation that the Republican ticket will prevail in the city election of New York. 
On the second day of voting in that much-anticipated election, Jefferson anxiously wrote to Congressman Edward Livingston, one in an extended family of moderate New York Republicans that included his brother Robert, the state's long-serving chancellor, and his cousin Brockholst, an eminent lawyer and future U.S. Supreme Court justice. By this time, I presume the result of your laborers is known to you, Jefferson observed. Whatever it may be, and my experience of the art, industry, and resources of the other party has not permitted me to be prematurely confident, yet I'm entirely confident that ultimately the great body of the people are passing over from them. The madness and extravagance of their career is what ensures it. Jefferson had good reason to worry about the art, industry, and resources that Hamilton poured into the New York City election. But neither of them could have anticipated Burr's extraordinary effort on behalf of the Republican ticket. Ever since, political historians have marveled at his innovative techniques in urban electioneering. Burr laid the foundation for victory in 1799 when, as a state legislator, he had secured the charter for the Manhattan Company, which broke the Federalist banking monopoly in New York City. By the spring of 1800, artisans and owners of small businesses could openly support Republican candidates without fear of losing access to credit. Indeed, bank records suggest that the Manhattan Company significantly stepped up operations to coincide with the election. The Federalist bank influence is now totally destroyed, where protege Matthew Davis boasted in a pre-election letter to Republican congressional leader Albert Gallatin. The Manhattan Company will in all probability operate much in our favor. Other partisans made similar comments at the time, and some later historians have seen the bank's role in the city election as decisive. One stanza of a Federalist poem deriding the rise of republicanism in New York aptly noted, Here, when all other measures fail to turn the newly balanced scale, Manhattan's bank pours in its stream. The Federal Party kick the beam a bank upon occasion's spur, to discount notes for Colonel Burr. At the very least, as this poem suggests, the Manhattan Company balanced the scales between Republicans and Federalists in New York City. Building on this foundation, Burr recruited a stellar slate of candidates for the State Assembly to stand against Hamilton's lackluster list. As Davis explained to Gallatin, Mr. Burr is arranging matters in such a way as to bring into operation all of the Republican interests. This meant uniting the Clinton, Livingston, and Burr factions of the local party in a common effort. Clinton had stepped down in 1795 after six terms as governor, yet Burr persuaded him to permit his name to head the list of Republican candidates for the state assembly. Brock Holst Livingston represented his clan on the ticket. Washington's first postmaster general, Samuel Osgood, who once led a company of Minutemen at the battles of Lexington and Concord, lent his name. Perhaps most remarkable of all, at Burr's urging, General Horatio Gates, whose fabled victory at the Battle of Saratoga turned the tide in the American Revolution, emerged from retirement at age 74 to stand for election to the Assembly. Few of these candidates actually campaigned for office, and some of them had no intention of actively serving in the Assembly. Indeed, according to Davis, who participated in the meetings at which Burr pleaded with Clinton to join the ticket, the proud former governor reserved to himself the right of stating in conversation that his name was used without his authority. As for Gates, Burr later felt it necessary to remind the infirm general when to vote for presidential electors. Presumably he did not otherwise attend legislative sessions in Albany. Yet the united ticket of Republican luminaries served its purpose. I believe we shall offer to our fellow citizens, Davis wrote to Gallatin, 
the most formidable list ever offered them by any party in point of morality, private and public virtue, local and general influence, etc. If we carry this election, it may be ascribed principally to Colonel Burr's management and perseverance. Hamilton fears his influence. While the Republican press hailed the party ticket as the finest assemblage of senior statesmen ever put forth for such lowly offices, the city's two leading Federalist newspapers could only fume. They have got names to which respectability has been attached, the commercial advertiser noted. But the citizens of New York will see through it. None of these candidates cared about the state's business, it charged. They cared only about electing a president. Citizen Clinton does not go to the assembly for the purpose of mending roads, nor Citizen Burr for that of digging wells, the Daily Advertiser commented, charging that their sole object in standing candidates is to secure the election of Mr. Jefferson. The commercial advertiser dismissed Gates as tottering over the grave with a mind utterly impaired and characterized Clinton as smiling at the thought of having done his best to destroy that constitution which he voted against adopting. An election day squib in the Daily Advertiser reminded voters of Gates's infamous defeat at the Battle of Camden. If the general runs as well at the election, he cannot fail of success. Such jabs had little impact on voters. Commenting on Gates's election, one observer later wrote of the veterans of the Revolution abandoning their party to vote for their old comrade and leader. Once he secured strong candidates through personal negotiations, Burr staged a formal nominating process to engage the party. First, the Republican County Committee met to nominate Burr's hand-picked slate. Then a party caucus, open to all interested voters, accepted the nominations. Long after those events, one participant remembered Burr's instruction for the party meeting. As soon as the room begins to fill up, I will nominate Daniel Smith as chairman and put the question quickly. Daniel being in the chair, you must each nominate one member. We must then have some inspiring speeches, close the meeting, and retire. Republican Party subcommittees met in each ward and worked tirelessly for the entire ticket. Burr had loyal lieutenants spread throughout the city, and his palatial home served as the campaign headquarters, with refreshments served at all hours and mattresses in the rooms for exhausted workers. Our organization was completed by dividing the city into small districts, the observer recalled, with a committee appointed to each whose duty it was to canvass the district and ascertain the political opinion of each voter by going from house to house. These lists guided later efforts to get voters to the polls for the election. If not correct in every detail, this account fits the surviving record of those near-spontaneous events. The parts of America's first urban party machine fell into place that spring by trial and error. Federalists also held caucuses and campaign rallies, but they did not generate as much enthusiasm as did the Republican meetings. Never have I observed such a unity of sentiments, so much zeal, and as general a determination to be active, Matthew Davis wrote to Gallatin following the Republican county meeting. In contrast, he reported that dissension marked the Federalist nominating conclave, so much for the friends of good order and regular government, Davis added dryly. Feverish partisan activity continued throughout the campaign. Each side organized groups of merchants and artisans on behalf of its ticket. Burr apparently put in place a highly organized fundraising scheme that taxed Republicans according to their ability and willingness to contribute. Abigail Adams claimed that the Republicans spent $50,000 on the campaign. 
which, if true, was an unprecedented amount for the time, the equivalent of about $750,000 today. At the outset of the campaign, Burr reportedly pledged himself to come forward and address the people in firm and manly language on the importance of the election and the momentous crisis at which we have arrived. He fulfilled this pledge by vigorously portraying Federalist warmongering and abuses of civil liberties as a crisis of American democracy. Many people wonder that the ex-senator and would-be vice president can stoop so low as to visit every low tavern that may happen to be crowded with his dear fellow citizens, the Daily Advertiser commented accusingly. But the prize of success to him is well worth all the dirty work. Hamilton campaigned as well. Every day he is seen in the street hurrying this way and darting that, glad-handing individuals and speaking to small groups, a critic observed. When the polls finally opened on April 29th for three days of balloting, normal business came to a halt across the city, and electioneering took over. Both parties were very warmly engaged, Elizabeth de Hart Bleeker noted in her diary, and it is very doubtful which ticket will be successful. Events hampered the Federalist effort. On the first day of voting, word reached the city that the British frigate Cleopatra, then moored in New York Harbor, had recently captured two American merchant vessels and sent them as prizes to Canada. This affront reminded voters of the inadequacies of Jay's treaty and hurt the Federalists, who were associated with pro-British policies. Can it be possible that the Federal Party in this country are so blinded by prejudice and actuated by party spirit that they cannot see the danger of close connection with that people? A hastily prepared partisan handbill describing the incident said of Federalist ties to the British, Let us go forward to our polls. Give our suffrage to the men who have once released us from the tyrannical yoke of Britain, and who now come forward once more to secure to you that liberty they have so hardly earned. Running a slate of candidates headed by several aging Revolutionary War heroes, the Republicans had invoked the spirit of 76 against the British Party in American politics. A prominent High Federalist soon wrote to the U.S. Ambassador in London about the timing of the unconciliating conduct of Captain Bellows of the Cleopatra and its probable influence on the New York election. Following common election practices of the era, party leaders, but not candidates, positioned themselves at polling places to encourage their voters and intimidate all others. Hamilton and Burr threw themselves into this practice. They repeatedly addressed the people and did all that men could do, one Burrite observed. They frequently met at the same polls and argued in the presence of large assemblages the debatable questions. Some accounts had Hamilton going from poll to poll on a white horse, jeered in some wards, cheered in others, and Federalist officers from the National Army stationed at some polls in full regalia. I have been night and day employed in the business of the election. Hamilton's friend Troop reported after the final day of voting. Never have I witnessed such exertions on either side before. I have not eaten dinner for three days. Burr matched Hamilton stride for stride, though not on horseback. Indeed, he stood for and won election from a neighboring county so that he could more freely campaign in the city. Defying convention... Brockholst Livingston addressed voters at the polls even though he was a candidate. Republican efforts focused on New York's sprawling 6th and 7th wards, located on the city's expanding northern fringe, crammed with foreign emigrants and home to many native-born African Americans and impoverished European Americans, 
Each of these wards contained over twice as many voters as any of the three wards at Manhattan's southern tip, where most of the city's wealthiest citizens lived. These northern wards promised the most votes for Republicans. The densely populated Sixth Ward contained the least desirable housing in the city, while the geographically larger Seventh Ward included a mix of neighborhoods. Various reports suggest the extent of Republican efforts in these two critical wards. The party dispatched German-speaking poll workers to the heavily German 7th Ward, for example, and in both wards it organized transportation for poor voters, many of whom lived far from their ward's central polling place. One account spoke of carriages, chairs, and wagons appearing on the streets for Republican voters. This morning, Mr. Robert Livingston drove an old Negro to the poll at the Seventh Ward, a distance of five miles in his own elegant chair, the Federalist commercial advertiser reported snidely. Yet the man voted for the Federal ticket, to the utter amazement and confusion of his dear friend Bobby. An April 30th article in the same newspaper noted, The purse-proud landlord of the Seventh Ward Henry Rogers, stood at the poll yesterday in obedience to the orders of Burr to solicit and to overawe and to browbeat the voters. Burr stationed himself in the Sixth Ward on April 30th, and then moved on to the Seventh Ward for May 1st. This day has he remained at the poll of the Seventh Ward ten hours without interruption. His exhausted follower, Matthew Davis, wrote at day's end, Pardon the hasty scrawl. I have not eaten for fifteen hours. Then it ended. By twelve o'clock on the night of May 1st, the outcome was clear. Republicanism triumphant, Davis emblazoned across the top of a midnight letter to Albert Gallatin at the National Congress in Philadelphia with virtually identical numbers for all their assembly candidates. Republicans had won by an average of some 450 votes, or about 8% of the total. The Sixth Ward, the city's poorest, accounted for the entire margin of victory. Without its votes, every Republican candidate would have lost. The huge Seventh Ward voted Republican, too, but more narrowly than the Sixth. As in Pennsylvania earlier, the allegiance of new immigrants to the Republican cause tipped the scale. In this sense, the Naturalization and Alien Acts had hurt the Federalists. Federalist candidates, meanwhile, swept the three southernmost wards, home to the city's wealthiest residents, by nearly a two-to-one margin. Vote totals from the middle two wards split about evenly. Despite a deeply divided electorate, citywide voting gave all thirteen assembly seats to Republicans. When word of the outcome reached Philadelphia by post, the U.S. Senate adjourned for the day. The New York election has engrossed the whole attention of us, meaning by us, Congress, and the whole city, Gallatin wrote from Philadelphia. Exultation on our side is high. The other party are in low spirits. The political ground had shifted seismically under the nation's politicians. Congressman Edward Livingston actually spoke of an earthquake. New York's twelve electoral votes, which had gone to Adams in 1796, would move to Jefferson's column for 1800. Federalists and Republicans alike struggled to digest the news and determine what it meant for themselves and their party. Passing the glad tidings on to Madison, Virginia Congressman John Dawson exclaimed, Dear sir, the Republic is safe. Our ticket has succeeded in the city of New York. First came the crowing and finger-pointing. To Colonel Burr we are indebted to everything, Davis proclaimed in his midnight letter to Gallatin. In a longer letter four days later, he reiterated, The management and industry of Colonel Burr 
has effected all that the friends of civil liberty could possibly desire. Gallatin's father-in-law, retired senior Navy officer James Nicholson of New York, agreed about Burr's contribution. His generalship, perseverance, industry, and execution exceed all description, Nicholson wrote playfully. I recommend him as a general far superior to your Hamilton's, so much so as a man is to a boy. For his part, in a letter to Jefferson, Burr wrote, The victory is complete, and the manner is highly honorable. On the part of the Republicans there has been no indecency, no unfairness, no personal abuse. On the other side, the influence and authority of office have been openly perverted. He surely knew that the Virginian would want to see their victory in such terms. To a local Federalist, Burr reportedly boasted, we have beat you by superior management. Federalists took their defeat particularly hard, because they had not anticipated it. Only a year earlier, their assembly candidates had averaged 60% of the vote in the city. Although they received nearly as many votes in 1800 as in 1799, their percentage of the total dropped to about 46. Just as in Pennsylvania, Republicans had won on high turnout in areas of their strength, especially in the 6th and 7th wards, where the number of voters jumped by 40 percent. The reversal shocked Federalists. But yesterday they were arrogant and certain of our defeat, Edward Livingston wrote about the reaction of Federalists in Congress to news of the election. Today there is a most auspicious gloom on the countenance of every Tory. From New York, John Jay's twenty-four-year-old son, Peter, wrote to his father, The event of the election here is as unexpected as it is mortifying. He gave due credit for the outcome to Burr, who, he said, contrived everything and put everything in motion, but also blamed his own party for inadequate preparation. The Federalists were, as usual, supine till the eve of the election, young Jay wrote. Then they did their duty. I doubt whether more activity and exertion were ever employed on a similar cause. But it came too late. Post-election analysis in the Federalist Commercial Advertiser expressed a similar view. They do not confine themselves to three days' exertion it said of the Republicans. They devote weeks, months, even the year itself to secure their purposes. Abigail Adams put it bluntly soon after hearing the news. These people, at the head of whom was Burr, laid their plan with much more skill than their opponents, she wrote. As Burr claimed and his opponents conceded, the Republicans won in part through superior organization. They presented a united front for Jefferson and against Adams. Theirs was no longer the party of disorder. It was the Federalist Party that had begun to splinter. Hamilton and the New York Federalist, by contrast, while vigorous in their efforts, had not rallied behind Adams. Abigail Adams observed that the defection of New York was produced by the intrigue of two men. Burr, who seized the lucky moment of mounting into power upon the shoulders of Jefferson, and Hamilton, who sowed the seeds of discontent and division among the Federalists. And blaming Hamilton, she reflected the views of her husband. Hamilton has been opposing me in New York the President angrily complained to his High Federalist Secretary of War on May 5th, he has caused the loss of the election. As Adams saw it, by contriving to put forward Assembly candidates loyal to himself, Hamilton had alienated Adams's supporters in New York and depressed the party's vote. Some Republicans saw the result as a vindication of their principled stand against Federalist restrictions on civil liberties. To reign by fear and not by affection was ever bad policy.
a writer for the American Citizen commented following the election. I am confident that the people of America are too fond of freedom to surrender it passively, and that whenever any body of men disclose views inimical to their interests, they will hurl them into insignificance. In a letter to Jefferson, Chancellor Livingston interpreted the election as a lesson to the future place of any party guilty of violating individual rights. Thank God, he wrote, the people are roused from their lethargy. Hamilton could scarcely believe the election results. For two days after the polls closed in New York City, he nurtured the hope that returns from across the state would preserve a Federalist majority in the legislature. Other ardent Federalists held similar hopes. By May 4th, however, Hamilton conceded that the Republicans had won. Some reports described him as a figure of rage and despair, but these inevitably came from Republicans, who wished it so. Hamilton never totally despaired about anything. He instinctively devised solutions for his problems, and he certainly viewed the prospect of Jefferson's elevation to the presidency as one of the most serious problems that he or the country had ever faced. Ever since they had served together in Washington's cabinet, Hamilton had viewed Jefferson as a dreamy idealist, who could neither effectively lead a government nor restrain the radically egalitarian and potentially violent elements within the Republican Party. Further, Hamilton despaired of Jefferson's ideals. Hamilton wanted a strong central government to foster commercial development. Jefferson idealized individual freedom, states' rights, and the family farm. Hamilton also feared that Jefferson's ardent anti-clericalism, if made national policy, could destabilize the social order by dissolving the glue of civil religion that helped to hold the country together. During the first week of May, Hamilton gathered with other New York Federalists to discuss their options. According to an account of their meeting leaked to the Republican press, someone there proposed asking Governor Jay to call a special session of the lame duck legislature and have it invest him with the power of choosing the electors. At least with respect to the choice of New York's presidential electors, this would effectively undo the election results. When someone else objected that this might lead to civil war, a third person in the room observed that a civil war would be preferable to having Jefferson for president. A day's ride away in Philadelphia, the Aurora published a story about the proposal on May 7th, describing it as a new and extraordinary instance of the confirmed depravity of a faction. A Federalist paper in New York promptly dismissed the story as an infamous lie. But in fact, its substance was true. Some local Federalists met in New York City with Hamilton, and some Congressional Federalists met in Philadelphia with Hamilton's father-in-law, Senator Schuyler, to discuss ways to salvage at least a portion of New York's electoral votes. Whatever the initial proposal, it changed by the time it reached the governor. On May 7th, Hamilton and Schuyler sent separate letters to Jay requesting that he recall the state legislature for the purpose of authorizing district elections for choosing New York's presidential electors, the very procedure that Federalist legislators had rejected when the Republicans had proposed it prior to the state legislative elections. This measure will not fail to be approved by all in the Federal Party, Hamilton assured Jay, with district elections inevitably splitting the state's electoral votes, Schuyler expressed confidence that Mr. Jefferson's election will be defeated. In his letter, Schuyler stressed that he wrote on behalf of our federal friends in Congress, including John Marshall, whom he mentioned by name. I am aware that there are weighty objections to the measure, but in times like this in which we live, it will not do to be overscrupulous, Hamilton argued. The scruples of delicacy and propriety 
as relative to a common course of things, ought not to hinder the taking of a legal and constitutional step to prevent an atheist in religion and fanatic in politics from getting possession of the helm of the state. Hamilton may have thought that these charges against Jefferson would resonate with Jay, a devout Christian and former Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. Both Hamilton and Schuyler expressed their grave and undoubtedly sincere concern for the nation's survival under Republican rule. Schuyler denounced Jefferson as pervaded with the mad French philosophy. Hamilton described the Republican Party as a composition indeed of very incongruous materials, but all tending to mischief, some of them to the overthrow of the government by depriving it of its due energies other of them to a revolution after the manner of Bonaparte. Defending the Constitution and preserving the social order justified extreme means, Hamilton maintained. It is impossible to appreciate all the painful results that may ensue from Mr. Jefferson's conduct, should he be president, Schuyler added. It seems to me that these considerations will justify the measure of calling the legislature. Expressing a view shared by virtually all Hamilton biographers, Ron Chernow concluded that Hamilton's appeal may count as the most high-handed and undemocratic act of his career. It sought to overturn the expressed will of the people through a second election conducted under different rules after his opponents had fairly won the first one. Despite his high Federalist leanings and strong party loyalty, Governor Jay did not even dignify these letters with written replies. Even though one of them came from the commander of the army and the other from a United States senator, Jay simply filed the letters for posterity, which has judged them harshly. He jotted his own opinion on Hamilton's letter, proposing a measure for party purposes which I think it would not become me to adopt. From a soft-spoken gentleman like Jay, who had served under Washington, and imbibed late eighteenth-century notions of public service and personal honor, for party purposes, constituted a biting indictment. The New York election stood. Even as New Yorkers voted in their late April elections, news spread regarding the results of Virginia's state legislative contest held on April 23rd. To assure that Jefferson would this time sweep the state's 21 electoral votes, allowing for no rogue Federalist electors, the old Republican-dominated legislature had changed the law to have voters choose electors by a statewide vote in 1800. Federalists tried to make the new law into an issue during the April legislative campaigns. They wanted to restore the old method of choosing electors by district elections. A new legislature could revise the law in time for the fall election. Although most voters probably did not either fully understand or greatly care how they chose electors, rumors persisted in the nation's capital that Virginia Federalists had found a winning issue. Federalist House Speaker Theodore Sedgwick reported hearing it from several of our friends yet confessed he had not the faintest hope of his party's candidates prevailing in the state on that or any other issue. Pray, how is the general ticket relished in Virginia? Republican Congressman John Dawson worriedly asked Madison three months before the election. Federalists report that it is universally abhorred, Dawson noted. Madison thought otherwise. I have no reason to believe this to be the fact he replied. Nevertheless, in March, Virginia Republicans published a 23-page pamphlet justifying the law as a fully constitutional means to maximize the state's influence in the upcoming presidential contest. That the election of Mr. Jefferson was in effect expected or rather hoped for by the friends of the measure is readily admitted, the pamphlet stated. This straightforward explanation apparently satisfied voters. Three days before the election, Madison reported to Jefferson about the state legislative campaign, 
I find that considerable exertion is used to raise prejudices against the measures of the last session of the Assembly, especially the novel mode of appointing electors. I am not possessed, however, of any evidence of their success that deserves attention. By April 26, as returns trickled in from across the state, Monroe assured Jefferson, The elections so far as we have intelligence are almost universally in favor of the Republican cause. The next day, Madison wrote from Virginia regarding the Federalists, The patrons of usurpation and aristocracy will have little encouragement from this quarter. Republican candidates won virtually everywhere in the state, and reportedly did so by large margins. The election results from New York and Virginia, coming as they did six months after McKean's victory in Pennsylvania, panicked Federalists and elated Republicans. All three elections turned on national issues and directly impacted the electoral vote. In six months, the situation had reversed from the Republicans having to sweep virtually every remaining winnable electoral vote to the Federalists bearing that burden. To compensate for the loss of New York's electors, Federalists would need to hold New Jersey, win more electoral votes in Maryland and North Carolina than they had won in 1796, and carry South Carolina. If Pennsylvania voted, they would also need at least some of its votes. Because of the heightened importance of the Carolinas, Pinckney might now have the best chance of any Federalist to cobble together the votes needed for victory. As early as March, Jefferson commented about the mood at the nation's capital. The Feds began to be very seriously alarmed about their election next fall. Their speeches in private, as well as their public and private demeanor to me, indicated strongly. The shift became apparent to everyone by May. Commenting in early May on the latest Republican victory, the Aurora gloated, the results of the New York election must speak to the Federal Administration in a very emphatical manner. How general and decisive the public opinion is against their measures. Abigail Adams could count the votes accumulating against her husband as well as anyone. She saw only darkness ahead. The Republicans had added twelve electors to their already formidable fifty-odd elector base with only seventy needed to win. New York, by an effort to bring into their assembly anti-federal men, will make also an anti-federal ticket for president, at the sacrifice of all that good men hold dear and sacred, she wrote to her sister on May 5th. Much animosity is springing up between South and North and East. A whole year we shall hear nothing else but abuse and scandal enough to ruin and corrupt the minds and morals of the best people in the world. Out of all this will arise something which, though we may be no more, our children may live to rue. John Adams and other Federalists knew that they must act quickly and decisively to right the situation. In order to do so, they needed to present a united front against the Republicans. But the growing rift between Adams and the High Federalist would prove a great challenge for the party that had ruled America since the Constitution was ratified. Chapter 5 Caucuses and Calumny Having orchestrated the Republican victory in the New York City election, Aaron Burr promptly set out to claim his reward, designation as the party's choice for vice president. Burr's chief lieutenant, Matthew Davis, served as his agent. No candidate for national office in America had ever been so brash. Washington had appeared positively reticent about putting himself forward for president. Adams and Jefferson had worn a similar face when seeking national office, as had Clinton in 1792 and Thomas Pinckney in 1796. The product of urban politics and a full generation younger than Washington, Adams, and Jefferson, Burr could not keep himself out of sight or above the fray. He yearned for high office and never hid his ambitions. 
which made some politicians distrust him. Already in 1792, during his first year as a senator from New York, and only age 36, or one year older than the minimum age to serve as president, Burr had pushed himself forward as a candidate for vice president. That year the Republicans had launched an effort to oust Adams from the post. In the election, America's second for president, everyone assumed that all electors would cast one vote for Washington's re-election, which they did. The contest for vice president remained in doubt, though, and some Republican leaders had sought to push Adams aside by encouraging Republican electors to cast their second votes for an agreed alternative, which ended up being eight-term New York Governor George Clinton. Jefferson, then serving as Washington's Secretary of State, would have been their logical choice, but he was effectively excluded from consideration because he came from Virginia, the same state as Washington. And the Constitution bars electors from voting for two people from their own state. At the time, no Republican could hope to win without electoral votes from Virginia. Republicans needed a candidate from another state. Burr had sought the nod by seeking the cooperation of party leaders in New York and Pennsylvania. Following a flurry of letters among leading Republicans, the choice had gone to Clinton over Burr, due to the long-serving governor's greater stature and more reliable anti-federalist credentials. And comparing those two options for the vice presidency, Virginia Senator James Monroe had written to Madison, Some person of more advanced life and longer standing in public trust than Burr should be selected for it, and particularly one who, in consequence of such service, had given unequivocal proofs of what his principles really were. Having voted for the Declaration of Independence as a member of the Continental Congress, but against the Constitution as Speaker of New York's ratifying convention, Clinton had a long history of patriotic service as a principled anti-federalist. The pragmatic Burr, in contrast, had flirted with both factions during his brief political career. Madison concurred with Monroe in favoring Clinton over Burr, and their opinion prevailed. Clinton ultimately received the united electoral votes of four states, New York, Virginia, North Carolina, and Georgia, placing him a strong third behind Washington and Adams. This contest between Adams and Clinton had etched the first outlines of coordinated partisan balloting for national office. Considering Washington's popularity and Adams's stature, the Republican candidate had done surprisingly well, and the choice of Clinton over Burr probably contributed to this outcome. Burr, however, would not be deterred. In 1796, still in his first term as a U.S. Senator, Burr had tried again for the Vice Presidency. The Federalists had quickly settled on South Carolina's Thomas Pinckney as their candidate for Vice President, without ever formally meeting to discuss the matter. Republicans not only considered a wider field, but employed a novel process for doing so. Their congressional members met together in secret to discuss their options. The first time that a party's representatives and senators had ever caucused to discuss candidates. Although a necessary evil to establish and maintain party unity in an age before primary elections and nominating conventions, Closed caucuses carried an odor of conspiratorial factionalism from the Revolutionary Era, when both patriots and loyalists met in private to plot the other's destruction. Factional scheming would give way to open political discourse in the sunshine of American democracy, the patriotic vision proclaimed. Caucusing was reviving with the rise of partisan politics, but it remained unpopular with the public. In their 1796 secret caucus, Republican lawmakers discussed at least four candidates for the vice presidency. Burr, Senator Pierce Butler of South Carolina, Senator John Langdon of New Hampshire, and Chancellor Robert Livingston of New York. 
Although members attending the caucus apparently never voted on these individuals and did not as a group endorse any one of them, Burr seems to have been the favorite, enjoying particularly strong support in the middle states, especially Pennsylvania, where partisan leader John Beckley affirmed that the whole body of Republicans are decidedly in favor of Burr. Republicans, however, made little attempt actually to coordinate their voting for vice president. In the ensuing electoral college balloting, Burr had proved most popular with Republican electors in the middle and western states. In Jefferson's strongholds in the south, however, most Republican electors had cast their second votes for more senior and reliable anti-federalists, particularly Clinton and Samuel Adams of Massachusetts two popular older leaders who had initially opposed ratification of the Constitution and apparently were overlooked at the Congressional Party Caucus. The vote totals in 1796, with Adams and Jefferson coming in first and second, while their party's other candidates trailed far behind, demonstrated that disciplined party voting did not yet dominate the Electoral College. Many electors still voted their consciences or sectional loyalties. Finishing a poor fourth behind Adams, Jefferson, and Pinckney, Burr professed to feel betrayed by Southern Republicans, particularly Jefferson's Virginia electors, who gave fifteen votes to Samuel Adams, three to Clinton, and only one to Burr. Following his Herculean efforts on Jefferson's behalf in the 1800 New York City election, in the 1800 presidential election, Burr demanded more loyalty from Republican electors than he had received in the past. Party discipline, not ideological purity or sectional loyalties, should prevail in the casting of electoral votes, he argued. Hitching himself to Jefferson and the rise of partisan voting, Burr set his sights on being chosen as the sole Republican vice presidential candidate this time. As in 1796, Republican members of the U.S. House of Representatives and Senate again planned to caucus secretly to make their vice presidential nomination. The brilliant Swiss émigré Albert Gallatin served as the Republican leader in Congress. On May 11th, at the boarding house in Philadelphia, where many Republican lawmakers lodged during congressional sessions, he convened the caucus. Its timing would enable Burr to capitalize on his recent efforts for the Republican ticket in New York if he struck fast. Matthew Davis had already laid the groundwork for Burr to do so, undoubtedly with his mentor's full knowledge and encouragement. During the campaign in New York, Davis had sent Gallatin regular reports highlighting Burr's efforts on behalf of the party. The colonel has affected all, and principally caused the victory. The letters gushed in words that as likely came from Burr as from his adoring protégé. After the party ticket prevailed in New York City, Davis sent a final letter to Gallatin expressly raising the issue that had been the topic of open speculation in the city throughout the campaign. It is generally expected that the vice president will be selected from the state of New York, Davis wrote on May 5th. Three characters only can be contemplated, namely George Clinton, Chancellor Livingston, and Colonel Burr. Dismissing the first as too old and the second as too timid, Davis concluded, Colonel Burr is therefore the most eligible character and on him the eyes of our friends in this state are fixed as if by sympathy for that office. In his mind, Gallatin had already narrowed the choice to two of these three New Yorkers. On May 6th, even before receiving Davis's final letter, Gallatin wrote from Philadelphia to his wife, then visiting her family in New York City, Who is to be our vice president, Clinton or Burr? he asked. This is a serious question which I am delegated to make, and to which I must have an answer by Friday next. That was the appointed day for the secret Republican caucus. To discover which person New York Republicans favored as vice president, 
Gallatin asked his wife's illustrious father, retired Navy Captain James Nicholson, to survey local sentiment. Nicholson instead went straight to Clinton and Burr. Here the record becomes fuzzy. Nicholson and Clinton later wrote that in line with conventional practice, Clinton played the reluctant candidate, much as he had when Burr asked him to stand for the state assembly two months earlier. Nicholson pressed him about the vice presidency, Clinton wrote in an 1803 letter. After much conversation on this subject, I finally agreed that in answering Mr. Gallatin's letter, he might mention that I was adverse to engage in public life. Yet, rather than that any danger should occur in the election of president, I would so far consent as that my name might be used without any contradiction on my part, he recalled. Burr also initially expressed his willingness to stand as Jefferson's running mate, Clinton and Nicholson reported, but then became enraged when Nicholson told him that Clinton's name would also go forward to Philadelphia. He would have nothing more to do with the business, Burr reportedly told Nicholson, and would instead run for governor. To placate Burr, Nicholson, with Clinton's consent, altered his response to Gallatin. Nicholson's letter to Gallatin did not mention any of the alleged behind-the-scenes posturing by Clinton and Burr. It simply endorsed Burr as the choice of all the Republicans in this quarter that I have conversed with. According to the letter, Clinton declined to run due to his age and attachment to retired life, and endorsed Burr as the most suitable person for the vice presidency. The wily Burr then played the reluctant candidate, whose conditional no actually meant yes. He seemed to think that no arrangement could be made which would be observed to the southward, Nicholson wrote of Burr's reluctance alluding, as I understand, to the last election, in which he was certainly ill-used by Virginia and North Carolina. I believe he may be induced to stand if assurances can be given that the southern states will act fairly. Without a solemn pledge of solid support by Republican electors in all states, Burr was well aware that he could gain the caucus nomination and still come in third or fourth in an election that Jefferson won. Burr says he has no confidence in the Virginians, Gallatin's wife added in a separate letter. They once deceived him, and they are not to be trusted. By encouraging party-line voting by electors pledged to partisan unity, Burr's expressed goal was to garner one vote from every Republican elector, which could result in his getting as many votes as Jefferson. Indeed, any astute politician could readily recognize that completely straight party-line voting would lead to a tie vote between the party's two candidates. Such an outcome could be catastrophic. The Constitution stipulated that in the event of a tie between two candidates, each with votes from a majority of the electors, the House of Representatives would pick between them by majority vote. In the House balloting, each state would have one vote. At the time, due to an even partisan split in some state congressional delegations, neither party controlled a majority of them. The Federalists could thus use their power in Congress to block Jefferson's election. During the campaign, Republican leaders never seemed to doubt that some Republican electors would, in the end, drop their votes for Burr, either on their own initiative or at the direction of a party leader. After all, it was clear that no Republican elector actually favored Burr over Jefferson for president. But the Constitution prohibited them from officially designating one vote for president and another vote for vice president. Eliminating one or more votes for Burr was the only way Jefferson could win the election without a troublesome House vote. Forty-three Republican members of Congress reportedly attended the secret caucus, which formally tapped Jefferson as the party's nominee for president and Burr as its choice for vice president. At the time, presumably to maintain the appearance of an open party, participants did not publicly acknowledge that the meeting had occurred. 
Ironically, after Federalist held a closed but not secret caucus to choose their candidates for national office within days of the secret Republican one, the Republican Aurora gleefully condemned it as a fractious meeting, unknown to the Constitution or law. Other Republican newspapers also questioned the authority of a self-appointed caucus to dictate nominations without ever suggesting that Republican lawmakers held a similar gathering. Indeed, in an autobiographical writing published four decades later, and after a stellar career of public service that transcended partisanship, Gallatin still defensively maintained that Republican caucuses were infrequent, informal, and non-binding during his tenure in Congress. No record exists of what transpired within the Republican caucus on May 11th, only Gallatin's private report of the results. We had last night a very large meeting of Republicans in which it was unanimously agreed to support Burr for vice president, he wrote privately to his wife in New York on May 12th. Jefferson denied playing any direct role in the choice. It is our mutual duty to leave those arrangements to others and to acquiesce in their assignment, Jefferson wrote to a Southern supporter about himself and Burr. He has certainly greatly merited the support of his country, and the Republicans in particular, to whose efforts his have given a chance of success. Perhaps because of their secret nature, caucuses could not in themselves enforce party discipline. Burr wanted more than a mere expression of support. Only pledges of personal honor would bind participants to their caucus commitments. He sought them following the caucus. Republicans soon spoke openly of their mutual commitment to vote equally for Jefferson and Burr. When rumors spread that to prevent a tie, some Southern electors would not vote for Burr so that Jefferson would be certain to prevail over Burr in the final tally, Burrite David Gelston wrote accusingly to Madison on Burr's behalf, Can we, may we, rely on the integrity of the Southern states? Madison responded by openly urging Governor Monroe to make sure that all Virginia's electors duly voted for Jefferson and Burr. It would be superfluous to suggest to you the mischief resulting from the least grounds of reproach, and particularly to Virginia, on this head, he wrote to the governor. Madison, Monroe, and Jefferson each assumed that others would nonetheless make sure that at least one Republican elector in some state would not vote for Burr. None of them wanted to be personally responsible for the breach of trust, however. Burr now had the nomination and a pledge of support covering all Republican electors. He responded by campaigning conscientiously for the party ticket and never, as far as the record shows, overtly breaking his implicit commitment to support Jefferson. If he did watch out for himself along the way, it was nothing more than he expected from others. The Federalist Caucus, though on its surface less contentious, involved more convoluted subcurrents than the Republican one. For Jefferson's running mate, Republicans had chosen someone already known for his independent ambition and lack of long-term party loyalty, yet able to deliver key electoral votes. Jefferson would later call Burr a crooked gun or other perverted machine whose aim or stroke you could never be sure of while Monroe and other leading Republicans had long viewed him as unreliable. Some observers predicted that Republicans would soon regret choosing Burr. In contrast, for their second candidate, Federalist tapped a reliable subordinate and party loyalist, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, the elder brother of their 1796 vice presidential candidate, Thomas Pinckney. Although seemingly obvious on its face to the public, the choice of Pinckney for the national ticket, in fact, threatened to split Federalists along a critical fault line. Party insiders knew that Pinckney's loyalties ran toward Hamilton rather than Adams, and that Hamilton had backed Pinckney's brother over Adams in 1796. Indeed, after the caucus in 1800, 
Senior Federalist leader Fisher Ames privately commented on the singular and mysterious state of his party's politics. The plot for an old Spanish play is not more complicated with underplot. The choice may have been perverse in some respects, but there was good strategy behind it, especially for high Federalists. Like the Republicans, the Federalists caucused in the wake of the New York City election, which cast a pall over their gathering. To retain the presidency without New York's electoral votes, Federalists needed to peel some votes away from Jefferson and the South. With its established aristocracy, the Pinckney family's power base, and its relative independence from national partisan politics, South Carolina offered the best prospects for them. This is why they turned once again to one of the wealthy and influential Pinckney brothers, who were South Carolina's leading Federalists, to run with Adams. Born into power and privilege in Charleston, both brothers studied law in England, received military training in France, and inherited vast low country plantations with hundreds of slaves. In the afterglow of negotiating a popular 1795 treaty with Spain that peacefully resolved the nation's southwestern border with Louisiana and opened New Orleans to American commercial traffic, Thomas Pinckney had been the Federalist logical choice in 1796 for trying to break the Republicans' grip on the South. Every South Carolina elector voted for him and Jefferson. None voted for Adams. By 1800, Thomas's older brother, Charles Coatsworth, had emerged as the strongest candidate to run with Adams on the party ticket. One of three commissioners named to negotiate outstanding differences with France in 1797, the older Pinckney famously defended America's honor by refusing to pay the bribe allegedly sought by French officials in the XYZ affair. No, no, not one sixpence, he purportedly replied, or millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute. Both versions circulated widely in the United States, and made him a national hero, at least until taxpayers began paying those millions. After the ensuing breakdown of negotiations led to fears of war with France, Pinckney agreed to serve under Washington and Hamilton as commander of southern forces in the additional army, even though as a general during the Revolutionary War he had outranked Hamilton. With his brother Thomas then serving in the U.S. House of Representatives and his cousin Charles in the U.S. Senate, Charles Coatsworth joined Adams on the party's agreed-upon, though unofficial, national ticket. In a controversial twist, rather than endorse Adams as president and Pinckney as vice president, the thirty or so Federalist members of Congress attending the caucus agreed simply to endorse both men and urge all Federalist electors to vote for them equally. Presumably, party moderates and high Federalists were able to reach consensus at the caucus only on these terms. The agreement left Hamilton free to hope that this time a plot like the one he had hatched in 1796 would succeed, and his candidate would outpoll Adams. To work, the effort would require strict party-line voting by Federalist electors in the North, while at the same time a repeat of favorite son balloting by South Carolina's electors. If all Federalist electors duly voted for both candidates, with no one dropping votes from Pinckney, as some had done with his brother in 1796, and if South Carolina's electors again voted for a candidate from their state's most powerful family— then Charles Coatsworth Pinckney would almost surely win the presidency. Hamilton had suggested this approach in a May 4th letter to Federalist House Speaker Theodore Sedgwick, a caucus leader, reminding the Speaker of the 1796 effort to bring Thomas Pinckney in ahead of Adams, Hamilton declared that following the loss in New York, such an effort was now the party's best option for retaining the presidency. To support Adams and Pinckney equally is the only thing that can possibly save us from the fangs of Jefferson, he wrote.
The scheme might succeed in 1800 where it had failed in 1796, Hamilton reasoned, because Adams had lost so much high Federalist support by then due to the resumption of peace negotiations with France. Although moderates within the party welcomed the peace mission, high Federalists hated it. Enough electors from New England might now knowingly go along with his scheme for it to work in contrast to those who had scuttled it last time. It is therefore essential that the Federalists should not separate without coming to a distinct and solemn concert to pursue this course bona fide, he wrote to Sedgwick. The strategy behind the caucus agreement was clear to all astute political observers. Jefferson immediately dubbed it a hocus-pocus maneuver presumably referring to the substitution of the popular candidate Adams by the high Federalist choice, Pinckney. Adams guessed Hamilton's game as soon as he heard what the caucus had done, and he was livid. Following the caucus, Fisher Ames neatly summed up the political situation when he wrote, It is understood by most persons that Pinckney's chance is worse than Jefferson's and better than Adams's. Sedgwick described the caucus in words that echoed Hamilton's instructions for it. We have had a meeting of the whole federal party on the subject of the ensuing election, and have agreed that we will support bona fide Mr. Adams and General Pinckney, he wrote. If this agreement be faithfully executed, we shall succeed. But otherwise we cannot escape the fangs of Jefferson. As a leading member of Congress from Massachusetts who had long supported Adams, Sedgwick had felt personally betrayed when the President reopened peace negotiations with France in 1799. Had the foulest heart and the basest mind in the world been permitted to select the most embarrassing and ruinous measure, Sedgwick commented at the time, Perhaps it would have been precisely the one which has been adopted. In his report of the Federalist Caucus, Sedgwick pointedly added, It is true that the late conduct of the President has endeared him to the great body of the Federalists, but it is equally true that it has created an entire separation between him and those whom he theretofore deemed his best friends. Sedgwick counted himself among the friends estranged by the President's conduct toward France. He was ready to reciprocate in kind. Following the caucus, U.S. Senator Samuel Dexter of Massachusetts, a moderate, complained about the party's treatment of its President. Passing Dexter's objections on to Hamilton, Sedgwick wrote, he says that however those who have had the opportunity of personal observation may esteem the character of Mr. Adams, as he is viewed by the great majority of Federalists, he is the most popular man in the U.S. The public would blame Hamilton and the high Federalists if the agreement led to Pinckney becoming president over Adams, Dexter reportedly warned, and this will crumble the Federal Party to atoms. Revealing the full depth of his hatred for Adams, Hamilton responded angrily to the comments by Dexter. He is, I am persuaded, much mistaken as to the opinion entertained of Mr. Adams by the Federal Party, Hamilton replied to Sedgwick. For my individual part, my mind is made up. I will never more be responsible for Adams by my direct support, even though the consequence should be the election of Jefferson. If we must have an enemy at the head of the government, let it be one whom we can oppose, and for whom we are not responsible. Hamilton promised to honor the caucus agreement as long as it appeared to hold in the East, but if it faltered there he would support only Pinckney. In short, if it seemed that New England electors were breaking ranks to drop votes from Pinckney, as they had done to his brother in 1796, then Hamilton would urge other electors to drop votes from Adams. Tis a notable expedient for keeping the Federal Party together, to have at the head of it a man who hates and is despised by those men of it who in time past have been its most efficient supporters.
Hamilton noted bitterly. A flurry of letters ensued from Massachusetts Federalists, committing their state legislature to appoint electors who, in the words of one, would vote unanimously for Adams and Pinckney. Republicans could scarcely contain their glee over the still private but no longer secret split within Federalist ranks. The caucus decision to support Adams and Pinckney equally was public knowledge, and the split that underlay it was obvious enough to astute observers. Republicans speculated openly about the ulterior motives behind the caucus decision and used it to undermine support for the Federalist ticket among those loyal to the President. The Republicans, Fisher Ames warned fellow Federalists, would join in the cry to make any Federalist opposed to the President unpopular, simply as a means to divide the opposition and discredit high Federalists. Of course, the Republicans did not like Adams, but they could join with moderate Federalists in denouncing high Federalists for opposing him as a means to further split the opposition. Feeding the division within the Federalists, the Aurora's editor circulated and later published an old letter by Adams questioning the patriotism of the Pinckney brothers and suggesting much British influence in Thomas Pinckney's 1792 appointment by Washington as the American ambassador in London. Every move served to deepen the wedge between Adams and the High Federalists and expose their differences. Soon their private dispute erupted in public. John Adams had a temper that could explode into uncontrollable outbursts of verbal abuse. With time and reflection, he typically brought his emotions under control and responded rationally to situations. But for the moment he could appear, as Benjamin Franklin had famously observed, absolutely out of his senses. In May, Hamilton's private campaign to topple Adams touched off an outburst that opened the rift within the Federalist Party for all to see, and reverberated throughout the presidential campaign. In all likelihood, Adams's outburst was prompted by the one-two punch of news about the New York elections and the ensuing Federalist caucus. With the former, Adams learned that Jefferson had gained the advantage in the contest for the presidency. With the latter, he realized that his own party had virtually abandoned him for Pinckney. Adams blamed Hamilton for his plight. Not only did Adams suspect that Hamilton had conspired to undermine his presidency from the outset, due at least in part to jealousy, but he also believed that Hamilton had lost the New York election by picking weak candidates loyal to himself and then masterminding the caucus vote for Pinckney. Hamilton had opposed my election as vice president in 1788, and my election at every subsequent period as vice president and president, Adams later wrote, and divided the Federalists of New York by selecting a list of representatives for the city and their state legislature who would concur with his plan in the choice of electors of president, to bring in General Pinckney. Claiming that informers had told him about Hamilton's plots in advance, Adams attributed the Republican victory in New York to the reluctance of his friends to support Hamilton's candidates. Adams may have exaggerated Hamilton's direct role in his worsening prospects, but he reacted as if he believed it. Immediately after the New York elections and Federalist caucus, Adams moved against the Hamiltonians within his administration. He had retained three of them in his cabinet from the Washington administration, James McHenry, Timothy Pickering, and Oliver Walcott. In Adams's eyes, only Walcott performed his job well. All three men actively conspired with Hamilton while serving in Adams's cabinet and shamelessly sought to undermine Adams's peace initiative with France. McHenry was inept as well as disloyal. Republicans especially despised Pickering for his vigorous enforcement of the Sedition Act against the partisan newspapers. Mr. Pickering would have made a good collector of the customs, 
but he was not so well qualified for a secretary of state, Adams noted about his stern, proud foreign minister. He is a man in a mask, sometimes of silk, sometimes of iron, and sometimes of brass, and he can change them very suddenly and with some dexterity. Adams later joked, Pickering could never be happy in heaven, because he must there find and acknowledge a superior. Four months earlier, Walcott confided to a friend that Adams considers Colonel Pickering, Mr. McHenry, and myself as enemies. His resentments against General Hamilton are excessive. He declares his belief for the existence of a British faction in the United States. Ostensibly to discuss a minor administrative matter, Adams invited McHenry for a private meeting on May 5th that turned into a verbal assault. All of the President's pent-up fury fell on this meek man, who wrote poetry and spoke with an Irish lilt. The President became indecorous and at times outrageous, McHenry wrote to his nephew about the encounter. I had done nothing right. Adams listed McHenry's supposed transgressions, major and minor, from aiding Hamilton's power grab in the army and subverting Adams's peace mission, to buying shoddy clothes for the troops and refusing a military commission for the lone North Carolina elector who voted for Adams in 1796. McHenry denied none of the major charges against him. Indeed, in the letter to his nephew, who served as an American diplomat in Europe, McHenry defended his efforts to subvert the peace mission on classic high Federalist grounds. The kind of war we waged with France gave us little to fear from her, effectively shut out French principles, and was calculated to preserve the friendship of England. Following his meeting with the President, McHenry set down his recollection of the exchange and sent it to both Adams and Hamilton. Adams reportedly declared, Hamilton is an intriguer, the greatest intriguer in the world, a man devoid of every moral principle, a bastard, and as much a foreigner as Gallatin. Mr. Jefferson is an infinitely better man, a wiser one, I am sure, and if President will act wisely. The President then turned on McHenry. You are subservient to Hamilton, who ruled Washington. Washington saddled me with three secretaries who would control me, but I shall take care of that. Walcott could stay, the president suggested, but the other two must go. McHenry submitted his resignation the next day. In the letter to his nephew, McHenry described Adams's degree of agitation on this and other occasions vividly. At times, he would speak in such a manner of certain men and things as to persuade one that he was actually insane, McHenry wrote. When Hamilton learned what happened, he exclaimed in a letter to McHenry, Oh, mad! 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 Next came Pickering. On May 10th, in a terse letter that gave no substantive reasons, Adams asked for the Secretary of State's resignation. Pickering replied in his customary peevish fashion that due to the importance of his work and the financial needs of his family, I do not feel it to be my duty to resign. And what Adams later called one of the most deliberate, virtuous, and disinterested actions of my life, he instantly fired Pickering. As soon as he heard about the sackings, Hamilton sent the outgoing Secretary of State an urgent letter asking him to purloin from department files all such documents as will enable you to explain both Jefferson and Adams. You are aware of a very curious journal of the latter when he was in Europe, a tissue of weakness and vanity. Rumors suggested that Adams had bared his soul a bit too candidly in his official reports from Europe during his diplomatic missions there. Hamilton wanted material to use against Adams in the worst way, even if it meant stealing it, and justified the request by adding that real integrity required exposing charlatans. Pickering received Hamilton's letter too late to act upon it. 
I intended to have done precisely what you suggest respecting Mr. Adams's journal, he wrote back to Hamilton, but he never had a chance. The President discharged Pickering without notice, and the Secretary left office on the same day. Hamilton would have to look elsewhere for damaging material on Adams. Adams's dismissal of McHenry and Pickering represented more than simply retribution against personal foes. It fit into a larger shift by the President toward the political center. Having secured his Federalist base, the best that he could by obtaining at least a co-nomination for the presidency at the party's Congressional Caucus, Adams apparently felt free to moderate his policies in advance of the election. The party was committed to support him at least equally with Pinckney, and so the High Federalist could not now dump him. He was free to reach out in directions that might appeal to voters in Pennsylvania, Maryland, North Carolina, and other places where popularity might still translate into electoral votes. Firing McHenry and Pickering was only the beginning. Before the end of May, Adams took a series of further steps that appealed to moderates. First, he named Massachusetts Senator Samuel Dexter to replace McHenry as Secretary of War, and Virginia Representative John Marshall to replace Pickering as Secretary of State. During the preceding legislative session, Dexter and Marshall had shown a measure of independence from high Federalists in Congress. Then, on May 14th, Adams signed into law a bill authorizing him to discharge the additional army. This bill amounted to a disbanding of the army, the angry high Federalist printer William Cobbett complained, because it was well known that Adams, who was now laying in a provision of popularity against the ensuing election for president, would issue orders for disbanding the moment the Congress adjourned. Adams did so the next day by directing McHenry, who remained in office until the end of May, to transmit an order disbanding the army to Major Generals Hamilton and Pinckney. Finally, on May 21st, Adams issued a bold pardon of a man who had led a popular uprising against federal war taxes, a man whom high Federalists wanted to hang as a grim lesson to all. John Fries was a former Revolutionary War officer. In 1799, he had led up to 400 east-central Pennsylvania farmers and townspeople in armed but largely nonviolent resistance to the collection of federal property taxes imposed in 1798 to pay for military preparedness against France. These taxes represented the least popular part of the Federalist war effort. Even though no one was physically injured by the tax resistors, high Federalists cast them as Jacobin revolutionaries who imperiled public order and national security, proclaiming that the actions of the tax resistors amount to treason. Adams had ordered a force ultimately composed of nearly 3,000 federal and state troops to subdue them. Priest's so-called rebellion died down long before the troops arrived. Federal marshals riding with that army nevertheless arrested over ninety persons involved in it. Following a series of highly politicized trials, Supreme Court Justice Samuel Chase, already hated by Republicans for his treatment of Sedition Act violators, sentenced Fries and two of his closest Confederates to hang for treason. Thirty-two others received jail sentences. All of them acknowledged their guilt promised to obey the law, and petitioned for executive clemency. Upon receipt of the prisoners' petitions in mid-May, Adams asked his cabinet for advice. In a joint response, the cabinet declared the sentences both just and calculated to inspire the well-disposed with confidence in the government and the malevolent and fractious with terror. Every cabinet member affirmed that at least Fries should hang. Walcott added that all three convicted traitors should die. He stressed, The cause of humanity will be most effectually promoted 
by impressing an opinion that those who are brought to trial and convicted of treason will not be pardoned. While still Secretary of State, Pickering had written to the President about Fries's conviction, I feel a calm and solid satisfaction that an opportunity is now presented in executing the justice of the law to crush that spirit which, if not overthrown and destroyed, may proceed in its career and overturn the government. Now, on May 21st, having come to view the underlying criminal activity as a riot rather than an insurrection, Adams rejected his cabinet's advice and issued a blanket pardon. Fries and his followers went home. The presidential pardon incensed high Federalists, but proved popular in Pennsylvania, where Adams still hoped to win electoral votes. Everywhere, it reinforced the generally favorable view of Adams as a political independent. He would take a middle course in the campaign between Jefferson and the High Federalists. So public was the break between Adams and the High Federalists that the Aurora ran an article asserting that there were now three parties represented in the U.S. Senate. Republicans, Adamites, and Picaronians with each having about equal numbers in that body. The latter party consists of those who have leagued with Hamilton and are easily designated by their English connections, the newspaper noted. They were the High Federalists, the elite of the aristocratic party, according to the Aurora. They had no true national candidates. Indeed, Adams and Jefferson were the only two American politicians with national followings. Many high Federalists now recognized the virtues of manipulating the Electoral College so as to slip Pinckney in ahead of Adams without giving a majority to Jefferson. For some high Federalists, however, the overarching aim became to purge their party of Adams, even if it meant losing the presidency. The miserable policy of regarding men, not measures, will defeat the hopes of the most enlightened and truly patriotic citizens. Pickering complained regarding Adams's continued popularity among middle-of-the-road Americans and many rank-and-file Federalists. Once Congress adjourned in mid-May and its members returned home, Letters became virtually the only means of private communication among party leaders. Trying to coordinate the electoral vote and debating whether to honor the caucus agreement or reject Adams for Pinckney became the object of countless letters among high Federalists. Many read like Shakespearean soliloquies. Whether it is nobler to support Adams and retain the presidency or defy him openly, and risk Republican rule, became the overriding question for high Federalists. By the end of May, Pickering and Walcott joined Hamilton in privately urging Federalist electors to break with Adams regardless of the consequences. The cause of Federalism, which we consider to be the cause of our country, will be as little or as less in jeopardy under Mr. Jefferson than under Mr. Adams, Pickering observed. From within Adams' own cabinet, Walcott wrote, It is with grief and humiliation, but at the same time with perfect confidence, that I declare that no administration of the government by President Adams can be successful. He added, I am no advocate for rash measures, and know that public opinion cannot be suddenly changed, but it is clear to my mind that we can never find ourselves in the straight road of federalism while Mr. Adams is president. For these men who had worked under Adams, principle prevailed over the presidency. Walcott now characterized Adams's re-election, not Jefferson's election, as the greatest possible curse, a presidential administration which no party can trust. Most high Federalists, however, still disagreed with the extreme measure of publicly repudiating the President. An open attack, if made soon on Adams, would, I fear, divide our force and perhaps give some electoral votes to Jefferson, 
Fisher Ames wrote in June. Instead of analyzing the measures of the man who has thus brought the cause into jeopardy, he admonished Walcott about his attacks on Adams, you must sound the toxin against Jefferson. Believing that a Jacobin president represented a greater threat to ordered liberty than another term for Adams, Ames warned, A thousand ways of attacking property are plausible, popular, and fatal. Writing on behalf of High Federalist in the Northeast, New Jersey Senator Richard Stockton also cautioned Walcott that, although they shared his utter alienation from Adams, Nothing further was practicable than the plan proposed in Philadelphia of running two candidates. He added, None of us think that affairs are so desperate as to believe that Mr. Adams, with all his weaknesses, can be a worse man than Jefferson. In a like manner, South Carolina Congressman Robert G. Harper wrote to Hamilton that while Southern Federalists favored Pinckney over Adams, they are, however, convinced that no direct attack can safely be made to drop or supersede Mr. Adams. It would create uncertainty, division, and defeat. Pinckney also urged his Southern supporters not to break publicly with the President. If any alteration should take place in the agreement entered into in Philadelphia, he wrote in mid-June, it should originate in the eastern states. Otherwise, we shall be inevitably divided, and the Anti-Federalists obtain the success which I am sure they will not if the Federalists are united, active, and energetic. The call to repudiate Adams should come first from Federalists in New England, Pinckney reasoned, because if it came from Federalists in any other region, New Englanders would likely rally around their native son. Although highly critical of the President in private, Pinckney still viewed the caucus agreement as the best means for the Federalists to retain the Presidency. In his doleful letters lamenting Adams's conduct and his own mistreatment, McHenry captured the high Federalist angst. Have our party shown that they possess the necessary skill and courage to deserve to be continued to govern? he wrote to Walcott about the continuing party support for Adams. They did not, with few exceptions, knowing the disease, the man, and his nature, meet it, when it first appeared, like wise and resolute politicians. Nay, they write private letters. To whom? To each other. But they do nothing to give a proper direction to the public mind. Someone should speak out against Adams, McHenry believed but he left the task to others. Plotting against the President themselves, high Federalists now could see only the worst in his every move. In 1800, for example, Jefferson had remained in the nation's capital later than his customary return to Monticello in April. This unexplained act, coupled with Adams's firing of McHenry and Pickering in early May, touched off rumors within Federalist circles that Adams and Jefferson had entered into a secret pact to run on a united ticket. I have good reason for believing that Pinckney and McHenry have been sacrificed as peace offerings, House Speaker Theodore Sedgwick wrote to Hamilton in mid-May, suggesting that the dismissals of these two partisan cabinet officers sealed a deal between the President and the Vice President. Jefferson had remained in the nation's capital until Adams consummated the bargain by his actions. The speculation ran. One version of the rumor had the men agreeing to exchange their current positions, with Adams becoming Jefferson's vice president. Another version had Adams serving a second term as president and then supporting Jefferson for the post. Adams hotly denied the rumors and his wife found them disgusting. The fact that some high Federalists believed them showed the level of distrust that divided the party. Even Pinckney conceded in June that, if true, a deal by Adams to form a party with Jefferson would justify Federalists in abandoning the caucus agreement to support Adams. The cumulative effect of the New York election and all the ensuing intra-party intrigue 
fundamentally destabilized the Federalist Party. All our friends here are in sad anarchy, Governor Morris observed from New York in early June. Even as the Federalists went to battle among themselves, the Republicans took every opportunity to assail them, and they had substantial material to use against them. High or low, Federalists had held power for twelve years and could not escape blame for unpopular taxes, excessive spending, and perceived abuses of power tending toward authoritarianism, or, as their critics like to call it, monarchism. The Republicans continuously hammered them on these issues, but never more abusively than in the campaign tract, The Prospect Before Us, by scandal-monger James Thompson Callender. In late May, with Adams's full support, the government tried to silence Callender by invoking the Sedition Act one last time. To many, however, the high-handed use of a wartime measure to suppress political criticism during the campaign served only to reinforce the Republican case against continued Federalist rule. After moving to the United States in 1793 to escape an indictment for sedition in Britain, Callender made a career of exposing the public and private misdeeds of Federalists. His sensational History of the United States for 1796 accused Hamilton of speculating in government securities while he was Treasury Secretary to pay off the husband of his mistress, Maria Reynolds. In a stunningly selfish and self-destructive defense of his public honor, Hamilton, a married man with eight children and a wealthy, socially respected wife who adored him, issued a written statement admitting the extramarital affair, but denying any corrupt dealings in securities. This admission haunted Hamilton for the rest of his life by providing fodder for his critics, especially in light of his own out-of-wedlock birth. Following a stint working for the Aurora in Philadelphia during 1798, and a brief hiatus fleeing from prosecution for sedition there, Callender surfaced in Virginia as a writer for the Richmond Examiner. His vitriolic assaults on Adams boosted the examiner's circulation and were reprinted in other Republican newspapers. Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe took an interest in Callender's work and supported it. With funds secretly provided by Jefferson, Callender revised and expanded his articles on Adams into The Prospect Before Us which appeared early in 1800. When Jefferson saw an advance copy, he congratulated Callender. Such papers cannot fail to have the best effect. Although it exposed no private scandals, the 183-page pamphlet restated the standard Republican charges against Adams's intemperate behavior and imprudent policies in the most caustic terms to date. The reign of Mr. Adams has hitherto been one continued tempest of malignant passions, Callender wrote, resulting in a costly war with France solely for the sake of yoking us into an alliance with the British tyrant. Onerous direct taxes, a soaring national debt, and profligate expenditure of public money have resulted, he claimed. Take your choice, Callender advised readers, between Adams, war and beggary, and Jefferson, peace and competency. Abigail Adams soon denounced all the host of Callender's lies. On May 21st, Samuel Chase descended on Richmond in pursuit of Callender. Judge Chase, the Aurora taunted, the pious and religious Judge Chase, is going to Virginia, where he says, if a virtuous jury can only be collected, he'll punish Calendar with a vengeance. At the time, federal courts did collect jurors rather than choose them at random, with the local federal marshal able to hand-pick individuals for the jury pool. The marshals themselves were political appointees of the president 
and invariably party loyalists. Republicans charged with sedition never had a chance with a jury composed of local Federalists, especially with Chase on the bench. Washington had appointed Chase to the Supreme Court in 1796, but he was loyal to John Adams and partisan in the extreme. Even after being named to the high court, Chase continued to campaign for Federalist candidates in his home state of Maryland, and publicly endorsed Adams over Jefferson in 1800. Chase acted virtually as judge, jury, and prosecutor in Callender's highly publicized trial. The indictment accused Callender of maliciously defaming the president. As Chase interpreted the Sedition Act, Callender could escape conviction only by proving the truth of his malicious, defamatory assertions about Adams, many of which were simply matters of opinion. Can any man of you say that the president is a detestable and criminal man, and excuse yourself by saying it is but mere opinion? Chase rhetorically asked defense counsel, which featured three of Virginia's leading Republican lawyers including the state's attorney general and assembly clerk, all serving without pay. Yet when Republican Senator John Taylor tried to testify that Adams avowed aristocratic principles, much like Callender claimed, Chase barred Taylor's testimony because it did not precisely track Callender's assertions. The appearance of Taylor and Virginia's top Republican lawyers at the trial underscored its partisan nature. In a public and probably planned protest, Callender's lawyers withdrew from the case after Chase refused to allow them to challenge the constitutionality of the Sedition Act before the jury. Chase called their argument irregular and inadmissible, insofar as it was directed to a jury rather than the judge. The defense maneuver left Callender visibly at the mercy of Chase, who was predisposed to show no mercy. After the jurors duly convicted Callender pursuant to the judge's instructions, Chase congratulated them on showing that the laws of the United States could be enforced in Virginia. The principal object of this prosecution. He sentenced Callender to nine months in the Richmond jail, which would keep him behind bars until after the election. The conviction backfired. The national government had no prisons at the time, and Virginia jails did not harshly confine Sedition Act violators. Portraying himself as a victim of Federalist tyranny, Callender published various attack articles and a second volume of The Prospect Before Us from Jail. Defiantly titling one chapter of the new book, More Sedition, Callender depicted the president as insolent, inconsistent, and quarrelsome to an extreme. Every inch which is not fool is rogue. In addition, the Republicans turned Chase's bullying tactics at Callender's trial into an effective campaign issue. The judge spoke of Mr. Callender in the most contemptuous manner, one partisan newspaper reported and made many remarks which proved that he was much better qualified to act as prosecutor than to act as an impartial judge. Government officials never brought another indictment under the Sedition Act. Apparently they learned not to make writers into martyrs. Ironically, Jefferson later felt Callender's sting. When two years after the election, the acerbic writer broke the story that Jefferson kept his slave, Sally Hemings, as a mistress. Human nature in a hideous form, Jefferson wrote to Monroe in 1802 about Callender, whose body was found floating in Virginia's James River a year later. An inquest ruled that Callender had drowned accidentally while bathing drunk. Unlike Hamilton in the Reynolds affair, Jefferson never publicly admitted to the relationship with Hemings, which remained simply a persistent rumor until the advent of DNA testing two hundred years later. 
By the end of May, roughly the midpoint between the effective beginning of the presidential campaign and the December date fixed for voting by electors, the Federalists were unnerved. Virtually nothing had gone their way. Their most respected leader, Washington, had died. Republicans had won critical state elections in Pennsylvania, Virginia, and New York. Without yet producing any diplomatic results, Adams's peace mission to France had dissipated the war fever that once had drawn voters to the Federalist banner. The additional army was disbanding. The Sedition Act was discredited. Americans everywhere complained about high taxes and the rising national debt. Worst of all for the Federalists, their party unity was shattered by the caucus decision.